It's a privilege to welcome you to our University of Illinois College of Law Symposium on Navigating the Intersection of Advocacy and Professionalism. Um, a word of uh, caution, I, I just picked up one of these. These are not mouth sprays, they are not EpiPens. I think they are hand sanitizers, so I use them carefully, but they have the University of Illinois logo on them. Um, um, Co-founder of the Anderson Center, Karen Gatzis Anderson is here today and she joins me in welcoming all of you and apologizing for the lousy weather today. So um, we have a good crowd here in person um, and we have an even larger crowd online. I think the registration at last count was well over 150 people. And uh, I think uh, what we have, um, a lot of great content today. When we started planning this symposium about a year ago, we, we were wondering whether the topic would still be relevant in, in the fall of 2022, because of course we saw the many lawsuits challenging the presidential election and then in, in my world of commercial litigation and personal injury litigation, we, we saw lawyers sanctioned for lack of candor with the court and discovery abuses uh, in the criminal uh, arena. We saw uh, litigants challenging the validity of their prosecutions or their convictions because prosecutors withheld exculpatory evidence. Uh, we even saw law professors who we thought lived in ivory towers uh, counseling their clients about how to interfere with the peaceful transfer of power. Uh, and we saw judges in trouble for sexual harassment and and making false statements to, to, to lenders, at least that was the case here in Cook County and, and other misconduct. Um, and uh, of course, we saw a prominent uh, former US attorney um, facing suspension of his license to practice law. And then in the always contentious area of uh, family law, at least here in the, in the Chicago area, we saw new incivility and discord uh, among uh, with lawyers representing the, the rich and famous. And so anyway, we wondered last year whether this was the new norm and or whether this would be largely new, moot by now. And I, I think we can all agree it's not, it's hardly moot. Uh, we have a national election coming up. Um, and um, there, there's a lot going on. We have um, much greater scrutiny on wrongful convictions and on civ civility. Uh, interestingly, we have um, uh, a um, Yale law grad who's uh, on trial right now for sedition. Um, and we have greater insight into the uh, legislative and constitutional reforms uh, necessary to make clear that the Vice President of the United States has a ministerial role in counting ballots. Um, so we have renewed attention on the, on the national and state level about the need for civility and professionalism. And so um, um, I, I'm glad this is, I think the program is very timely today. And although, you know, I just briefly highlighted some of the problems that uh, we hope to address today along with the possible solutions. I, you know, I also want to celebrate our profession. Um, both lawyers and judges continue to vigorously enforce the rule of law, and um, they provided the, the guardrails uh, to protect our democracy. And some of those lawyers and judges who have um, vigorously enforced the rule of law and protected the, and provided those guardrails uh, are here today. And so I'm anxious to hear from them. And so to, to make sense of this uh, seeming chaos at the intersection of uh, advocacy and professionalism, we have a terrific lineup of speakers today. We have some of the top academics, some top practitioners and, and, um, and, and judges. Um, and I know you have the people here in the room have the bios in front of you, and I encourage you to study those more. Depth. Those of you online, I don't know that you have the bios, but I'd like to hit, I'd like to just uh, call out briefly uh, some of the, some of the terrific speakers we have today. 
uh, starting with Vic Amar, who is the Dean of the University of Illinois College of Law and one of the foremost constitutional law scholars in the country. Uh, we have Eric Swalwell here. Uh, he's a congressman from California. He was a House impeachment manager, and but before his election to Congress in 2012, um, he was a prosecutor, a state court prosecutor, and he now serves, um, I, I'm, I think I have this right, but he'll correct me if I'm wrong, on the House, Sele the House Permanent Select uh, Committee on Intelligence, uh, the Committee on the Judiciary, and the Committee on Homeland Security. And uh, I, know, I know from speaking with him over the last year or two that uh, he has a lot of great insights. Uh, Judge Tom Kirsch, Jr., Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals will be here. Tom was the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Indiana. And before that, he had the privilege, or some say the handicap, of working with me at Winston and Strawn. But uh, despite that handicap, he is uh, now on the Seventh Circuit and, and, and I think one of our finest appellate court jurists. Speaking of outstanding jurists, we have Judge Deborah Walker, who currently sits in the Circuit Court of Cook County. And in November, she'll be sworn in to the first appellate, uh, Illinois Appellate Court First District. Um, and that's because she won the Democratic primary this spring. And she won because um, she was uh, by far the best qualified candidate. Um, there were a whole pile of candidates, but uh, Judge Walker was the only one who was rated highly qualified by all of our associations. And, and, uh, um, and this just underscores the importance of well-educated voters because we got that fact out and, uh, and she won despite uh, a, a lot of challenges. Um, BJ Pack is here. BJ is currently a partner at the Alston and Bird Firm in Atlanta. He's a University of Illinois College of Law grad. Um, at the time of the last presidential election, he was the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. Uh, he testified recently uh, before the House Committee in investigating the January 6th insurrection. And um, he's another um, hero in, in, in my opinion. And Perhaps he can add a little color to uh, his experience as the as the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia during that highly contentious time. Uh, also here to help sort out this chaos uh, and give us a path forward are Professor Catherine Ross, George Washington University School of Law, another nationally known constitutional scholar. Uh, we have. Um, a couple of litigators right up here who were involved in the in the in in the presidential litigation, including Matt Morgan out of Barnes and Thornburg, a veteran trial lawyer, uh, and Ryan Germany, who was general counsel to Georgia Secretary of State Brad Rathersberger. And um, uh, Ryan, in in my opinion, um, is another one of those heroes. Um, Erica Harold is here today. Um, she um, is going to moderate our panel on professionalism, and she was appointed recently by the Illinois Supreme Court um, as the executive director of the Illinois Commission on Professionalism. And um, she's a, a Harvard grad. Um, I suspect that was her second choice after Illinois, but she <laughs> she overcame that handicap by by practicing by having a stellar career at um, at least two prominent law firms in Chicago. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mention them because they compete with us, but she, <laughs> she, she's had quite a career and um, you can read about more about her in her resume, but um, I just wanted to pat ourselves on the back here at the University of Illinois College of Law, because I think this is probably the first academic uh, symposium where one of our featured speakers is a former Miss Illinois and uh, former Miss America. So, um, but, it, it, and that, that is absolutely true, uh, but she used that, uh, okay, those occasions to um, adopt a, a a platform of preventing youth violence and bullying. And that has been, remained one of her core commitments over the years. She's been a leader in Illinois in the prevention of uh, youth violence and, 
and bullying. So I hope I didn't embarrass you too much, but thank you for joining us. Uh, also on her panel today are Professor Stephanie Tang of Baylor University School of Law. Uh, she's quite a distinguished um, scholar, um, and but unfortunately she's from Baylor, which is always a nemesis for the University of Illinois College <laughs> basketball team. So, but we invited her anyway, because she's, um, one of the lead, leading scholars. And Professor Tang is here, um, uh, also uh, a, a leading scholar, and Brad Trowridge. Uh, Brad is with the Circuit Court of Cook County Domestic Relations, guardian ad litem. He's working in the trenches every day in, contentious, in the contentious domestic uh, violence division. And um, um, I, I, I I don't want to miss anybody, but apologies. I know we have Professor Andrew Leopold here today from the University of Illinois College of Law. He's moderating our criminal law panel. Uh, and Professor Irene Joe. You will notice from the, the materials that uh, Professor Joe has um, a long and uh, in, in, my, in my opinion, unpronounceable middle name. I try to practice it, but she's excused me from not uh, repeating it. And she says we can just call her Professor Joe, but thank you for being here today. Uh, Stacy Ludwig is also here today uh, from the, I think she's the Director of Professional Responsibility, the Advisory Office of the United States Department of Justice. So she's, she's, um, um, a leader in the DOJ and managing the professional responsibility of all the employees today. So um, enough, enough for me, I just want to say we're truly privileged to have these terrific speakers today. So please uh, stick around, uh, learn and, uh, and listen. I think we'll have time for questions, but uh, thank you for joining us today. And now let me turn it over to Dean Vicamar. Uh, thank you, Kimball, for those um, helpful framing uh, remarks. And um, thank you also uh, uh, to you and, and Karen for uh, helping uh, create this center that is uh, holding uh, important um, and interesting events like this. Uh, so the theme of today's get together, as Kimball mentioned, is kind of the intersection of zealous, robust advocacy on the one hand and um, uh, staying within professional boundaries um, uh, on the other hand. Um, you're gonna hear a lot about various statutes and statutory proposals and regulations and rules and norms and personal experience and history and, and stories um, uh, that bear on what it means to be a professional in our, um, uh, our profession. But as I was, um, thinking last night about what it means for me to be part of the legal profession, um, a few things kind of jumped to the top of my mind, and this is certainly not a, an exhaustive list by any means, but when I think about what, you know, Professor Leopold and Professor Mazzoni, um, Jason Mazzoni is also here from the College of Law, and, and I try to do when we teach our students in law school, the following kind of core principles are, are uh, I think, implicit in a lot of what I try to teach. First is that if you're a legal professional, you can't just say stuff. You can't just allege stuff. You can't just assert stuff. Um, you have to have a basis for um, uh, what you're advocating. And second and important, that basis has to be external to the advocate. It has to, can't be, can't be just be, this is what I want. This is what would serve my interests. It's got to be something grounded in the factual world or the legal world that's out there. None of that means, of course, that you can't argue for looking at facts in different ways. History changes all the time. We're, we're reexamining um, uh, what facts that we took for granted and looking at them in different ways. We re-examine the law all the time. 
you know, you hear a lot of people on the Supreme Court today say, oh, stare decisis, you can't change. Of course, you've got to be able to change the law. You couldn't have Brown versus the Board of Education. You couldn't have Loving versus Virginia. You couldn't have Lawrence versus Texas if stare decisis were, were uh, kind of resolute. Um, we're, we're much better off as a country because um, uh, cases can be overruled. The question isn't whether the Supreme Court should overrule cases, it's which cases it should overrule. And that's where the debate should be. And I think some of the justices on the, on the court should kind of get on board and understand that, that, that they need to be talking in merits instead of seemingly neutral principles about stare decisis that aren't so neutral at all, because if there were five votes, Heller versus DC would be overruled. And, and Citizens United would be revisited, et cetera. And, and Shelby County, which should be revisited, um, uh, would be revisited. Um, so you, you, it's not that there's no room for change or, or for arguing about what the law and the facts are, but there's gotta be a tether. There's gotta be something beyond the law is or the facts are X because I would like that or that would help me. Third, lawyers do their own work. It's a distinctive quality about our profession that we actually, um, when we advocate, we have to kind of do the homework before we do advocate. L judges have clerks, partners have associates, but when you're the lawyer and you put your name on something, you're, you're purporting to stand behind it. Um, I'm working on an amicus brief in the Supreme Court right now, and um, uh, I'm working with a pain in the butt co-author, my brother. Um, uh, um, <laughs> And so, uh, uh, you know, there was a, we cited a, a law review article for something. And he said, well, did you look to see if that citation was exactly? I said, yeah, I looked very carefully. And he, said, and he said, no, did you look at what the law review article itself cited as a primary source to make sure that the primary source supported what the law review article's author said it, it said? And I, I said, oh, I haven't looked at that yet, but I will. And when we looked at it, didn't really support what the law review article said. So even our citation of the article was fair. It wasn't a really good cite because the, the article itself didn't do the work. So lawyers need to do their work and they need to stand behind uh, that work when they advocate. And then fourth and finally, lawyers have to not just do things that are justifiable, but they have to justify. The reason why judges write opinions and other branches don't, no disrespect to Congress or to the executive branch, but it's a distinctive feature of the third branch that there are written explanations, written justifications. It's not just you do things that could be justified, you justify them. And that's so the outside world can hold us responsible and accountable. Um, it's, you know, I, 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 you know, I, people all the time in my family and friend work, they'll tell me, oh, I don't like that Supreme court case. And I said, Oh, really? You know, what did you, uh, I thought, I thought that opinion made sense. What did you not find persuasive about it? What did you, which part of this uh, passage? And they, Oh, well, I haven't read it. It's like, okay. Um, uh, uh, we write so people can actually assess us. Um, and I wish there was more of the actual reading to go along with the writing. Um, but but I think that's a distinctive feature of, of almost all advocacy. Even, even advocacy in trial, um, uh, as Kimball will tell you, involves a lot of, of formal explanation, much of which is uh, uh, reduced to writing that can be assessed by appellate courts, by the media, by um, uh, other litigants and other matters uh, down the road. So with that, let me um, uh, just say a few words about our first panel, and then I'll turn it over to um, the speakers. I don't think there's any area where the, um, the intersection and sometimes clash between zealous advocacy and professionalism, uh, however defined, um, has been more prominent or more painful. Um, uh, uh, although as Kimball mentioned, also sometimes more proud. I mean, uh, we, 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 um, we forget how, how, how unusual it was for lawyers and judges around the country um, uh, in November, December of 2020, January 2021, um, Republicans, Democrats, elected judges, appointed judges, trial judges, appellate judges, so uniformly hewed to some of these professional um, uh, qualities or features that I described. Um, and if they didn't, if they weren't as kind of a monolithic in their commitment to professionalism, the world may look different today um, uh, than it did. But um, 
election law is clearly an area that is kind of ripe for this kind of inquiry that we're undertaking today. And we have a great panel. I'm not going to um, uh, introduce them there. You know, you can read about them. Uh, even those of you who are on Zoom, uh, you can uh, just Google each of their names. You'll find out a lot about them. Um, each of them is going to talk for 15 minutes. I'll try to keep them to that. Um, uh, maybe some of them won't even use the whole 15 minutes, uh, which will leave us enough time for uh, interaction between the panelists uh, and then some uh, question uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, we have a hard stop at 11, so I want to turn it over first uh, to, to Representative uh, uh, Eric Swalwell, who is a, a, a con congressional uh, representative for about a decade now. He actually uh, represents the district that's about five miles uh, south of where I grew up. Um, and uh, we're delighted to have him here. He's a busy guy. Um, and uh, you can either speak from there, Congressman, or you can come up here, it's whatever you prefer. And I'll Great. try to catch your attention at about 13 minutes, okay? okay? Great, thank you. There are bombs that they found in the building. I love you, kiss the babies for me. That's a text message that I sent to my wife standing on the floor of the House of Representatives on January 6th. I actually gaveled in the session to begin the count that day. I thought the speaker was just punishing me because typically no one really wants to preside and stand over the house for such a long period of time where you're on C-SPAN and everyone's looking at you. So most of us will go out of our way to avoid having to do that and act as the speaker designate. Uh, but I gaveled in the session. I asked the chaplain of the house, it was her first day, to lead us in a prayer. I turned around and led us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And then I appointed the tellers. And then Speaker Pelosi and Mike Pence as vice president uh, would later come down and begin the process. And as that afternoon unfolded, and we heard through alerts on our cell phone and the chanting outside the building and the pounding and the shattering of glass, the Sergeant of Arms suspended the debate. Pretty soon we had a gas mask in our hands. And I remember looking at one of my friends who had served in Iraq and I said, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? I, I didn't serve uh, in theater. Uh, I don't remember the day that we were told how we use our gas masks. And that same chaplain who had led us in prayer around noontime, unsolicited, went back up to the podium and started leading another prayer. And that's what prompted me figuring that when the chaplain starts praying, unexpectedly, that's when you contact your loved ones. So how do we find ourselves in a place where America's representatives didn't know if they were gonna get out of the floor of democracy? A chaplain is giving the people inside the chamber and the democracy its last rites of sort, and police officers, hundreds of them, are standing outside the building in hand-to-hand -hand combat to defend life inside and what everything that building stood for. How did we arrive at that moment? That's what this seminar really is all about. I would argue it was unchecked lies. Lies that were told over and over after the election that just went unchecked. Lies that were told from the very top, the person who had lost the election and projected and aimed in courtrooms throughout America by people who were licensed to practice law on behalf of their client. And lies that inspired thousands of people from all over the United States to get in cars, buses, board airplanes, and fly to the Capitol, listen to a speech, and then as the speech concluded, many of them armed with either firearms, bear spray, flagpoles, some flags carrying the Confederate flag, they went to the Capitol, pissed off, mad, firmly believing that the election had been stolen from them because they were told the election was stolen from them. 
and they were willing to do anything they could to get inside the building, stop the count, and reverse the outcome. As the dean mentioned, I and Kimball mentioned, I practiced law before going to Congress. And for seven years, just like many of you, I'd go to a courtroom passionately as a prosecutor believing in my case. And if I had a defense attorney who in front of a jury was being fast and loose with the facts, I always knew that the guardrails or the backstop was that I could make an objection and we had an honest judge who would say that that's not relevant or that misstates the evidence or that question has been asked and answered. And I found pretty quickly when I was elected to Congress that no such judge exists, that you're in the court of public opinion and truth doesn't have an arbiter. And as you can imagine, as a practitioner, that can be quite frustrating. There's no one there to rule on your objection. And if you don't like that ruling, there's no place to go to have it appealed. I also realized as we were beginning the impeachment trial, the second impeachment trial of the former president, what many of my colleagues had believed about the environment that they were practicing in, so to speak. I went to the bathroom in between one of the arguments on the first day, and I bumped into Senator Ted Cruz. We were both washing our hands. I'd never met him before, but I'd seen him attack me on Fox News, and I read some of the tweets he'd sent at me. And if I'm being honest, I'd give it right back to him. And as we were drying our hands, he leaned over and fist bumped me and said, hey, I don't think we've ever met. I'm Ted. I introduced myself. As we were walking out of this small bathroom, he said to me, I want you to know you're doing a hell of a job out there. I just finished my first presentation. He said, no, I, I mean it. I thought you did a hell of a job. And in my mind, I'm thinking, what is he talking about? I've seen everything that he said about me. I've seen everything he has said about the case that we're presenting. And it occurred to me as somebody who grew up watching the World Wrestling Federation, that that's exactly what politics in America had become. For so many people, he could hit me over the head in the arena with a steel chair, and then backstage, we could bro out because in his mind, he's just doing what the fans want, the fans being his constituents, and it's not real anyway. And I've come to find that for so many of my colleagues engaged in what they think is entertainment and not politics, that's exactly what is happening. And when you have an environment like that and the people watching what's playing out don't believe it's fake, they believe everything that happens inside that ring is real. And you have lawyers willing to go to court on behalf of the people inside that ring, you could have the very combustible environment that we had on January 6th. Now, as Kimball and the Dean mentioned, our democracy held. It held because of the bravery of the police officers that day. It held because of the bravery of people like Ryan's client, the Secretary of State. It held because of judges around America who threw out so many of these frivolous lawsuits that were brought. And now in Congress, in a bipartisan way, we're trying to pass an electoral count act in both houses that would take away in future presidential elections, the idea that any vice president would have the ability to overturn the will of state electors. And just if you haven't been tracking, this electoral count act would essentially make the vice president's role ministerial. It would leave it up to the governors to certify what their state electors have done. And it would raise the bar for what a member of Congress would need to even challenge a count in any state. On January 6th, 
All it took was one member of the House and one member of the Senate. The new law would require a fifth of the Congress would have to agree that there's even an issue to elevate it to being debated on the House floor. Now that's progress. I hope that passes. I hope the president signs it into law. But the risk of course, is many state legislatures and many people running for governor may not even certify the will of their people. By many independent counts, 60% of the people on the ballot and just one month from tomorrow on the Republican side, deny the outcome of the 2020 election. So I think we can harden our own system and protect against what happened on January 6th, but now it's gonna disperse and, and scramble where the risk is to the state legislatures. And that's why we all in every state in the country have to be guardians of our democracy. So Kimball, thank you for what you're doing with the center. Thank you for assembling some of the best and brightest in this area. I look forward to a conversation about what we can do to redeem and renew our democracy. And I'll just leave you with what I hope never happens again, which is as we were setting up for the second impeachment trial, you recall it was in the thick of COVID, January, February, 2021. And only two managers were allowed on the Senate floor at any given time because of COVID restrictions. So the other seven had to be in a tech break room that was just off the Senate floor. And the day before the trial, a tech team of IC contractors who are not affiliated with any political party, they're just outside contractors, were setting up the workspace we'd be using. And they showed us where the printer was. They showed us where the laptops were. They told us what the Wi-Fi code was. They said it was under the name managers. And I thank this 23, 24 year old kid who had so capably laid out how to use the room for us. And I said, I'm pretty impressed. You know, we just impeached the guy and you guys already have stood up all of this infrastructure for us. This Gen Zer looks at me and he says, well, to be honest, we were the same team that did the first impeachment. And we figured you all would be back. So we just left everything up. <laughs> so my hope for our country is that this next generation going into your law school is more inspired by and optimistic about the future and leaders of our country than what we are all living through right now. So thank you again, Kimball. <laughs> Next, we're going to hear from Professor Catherine Ross from the George Washington University School of Law. Let's see, that may be too high, but I think I'm just going to, just going to let this cut me off. Um, thanks so much. Uh, that is really a hard act to follow, and my talk will be somewhat different in tone. Uh, first, I just want to, it's a real honor to be on this panel and at this really important conversation. Um, I'm going to echo a few things that have already been said in the short time we've been meeting, because I think they're emerging as themes. Um, it's really important to draw some red lines um, around attorney dishonesty with respect to elections in a time when norms have been fractured and are clearly not working. There was a time when we relied on the fact that, um, as Vic said, you know, we have to sign our court papers, we have our reputations, and we have integrity, and we used to count on that as being one of the things that kept attorneys being candid, and it is clearly no longer enough. I also want to note that although I'm going to say some things very critical of some attorneys uh, who have been involved with election denial and bringing baseless lawsuits, there are some lawyers who have quietly done the right thing. And I had dinner with several of them last night and I was struck by their modesty in saying, I just did what my job required. And in normal times, that would be fair, but they were under enormous pressure 
and these are not normal times. So I wanna echo the importance of the lawyers who are quietly and often unobtrusively doing the right thing. And that includes judges who were appointed by presidents of both parties. Uh, proclaiming the election was stolen is a litmus test for Republicans. The Washington Post article yesterday revealing that well over half of all Republican candidates for office are election deniers. And from the statistics about who holds offices in the United States, a significant portion of those people are likely lawyers. That list came out too late for me to look at the, all the individuals, but I had done a survey of some candidates and about 40% of them, like the 40% of um, the members of Congress are lawyers. So they are subject to forms of discipline that other politicians are not. Um, I wanna just briefly say a couple of things about the status of lies generally under the First Amendment before I explain why the First Amendment does not apply to lawyers speaking in their professional capacity. The definition of a lie under law is a statement that the speaker knows to be untrue, but the speaker intends the listener to believe it. So there is an important intent element. And we're generally talking about, when the, when the courts are talking about it, they're talking about verifiable factual falsehoods or what I call bald-faced lies, which are the kinds of lies that the Supreme Court talked about in US versus Alvarez, where they for the first time made clear that lies are not outside First Amendment protections, but neither are they as protected as most other forms of speech, especially political speech. And the court indicated that the state can regulate lies if they cause harm to others or unjustly benefit the speaker. And I think there is no clearer harm to others than the undermining of our entire system of government and our constitution and our rule of law that is caused by election lies. That is the harm to the society, the harm to the candidates who actually won, and the harm to individuals who suffer violence because of these lies. Um, now, at the state level, a great many states have tried to regulate many, many kinds of election lies, often in statutes that are very broadly and clearly unconstitutionally drafted. And 16 states still have those uh, regulations on their books. But since Alvarez, and in many instances, even before Alvarez, every single regulation on election lies has been overturned by the courts when challenged. And one of the main reasons for that is that to do otherwise would make the courts, in other words, the state, the arbiter of truth. And a number of judges have actually cited Orwell's 1984 as what we would be looking at. So that is very problematic and we can't assume that this can be solved by simply saying you can't lie during a campaign. Uh, but after a campaign looks somewhat different. And despite the general principle that um, lies about elections have First Amendment protection, the First Amendment does not protect attorneys. Lawyers should and do have less constitutional protection than everyone else. And you might say, how can this be? Well, it's part of a bargain because it's a constraint that is placed on lawyer speech as a condition of bar admission, which allows us to earn a living and to practice our profession. And there are a number of other kinds of speech that are abridged for lawyers. Like you have to stick to the page limit when you submit a brief. You have to follow the rules of evidence. You can't just say whatever crosses your mind. Um, and the most compelling justification for this is that lawyers are officers of the court. And in exchange, they have special obligations. So lawyers may speak in a number of postures. And I think the three most important ones where lawyers speak falsely or uh, honestly even, uh, are 
uh, when a lawyer represents a client in a tribunal, when they represent a client in a different setting, or where they have no client at all, but they're speaking as a public citizen who is an attorney. And lawyers in each of those roles can be held to account for lying about election results and election legitimacy. So to clarify, I'm not talking about lawyers who bring merit, uh, uh, evidentiary-based challenges to election results as provided by state law. Those lawsuits should be brought when the numbers are such that it could change the outcome, but they need to be based on more than speculation and conjecture and conspiracy theories. And I'm not talking about lawyers whose conduct goes beyond falsehoods so that they engage in illegal conduct or are active co-conspirators. So I'm gonna to try to compress some fairly con complex basic principles into their broadest um, form. Attorneys who mislead and lie can be held accountable in several ways. Some of those apply to everyone, not just attorneys, and I'm just going to briefly mention them. The first is private civil actions uh, in defamation or in other suits seeking damages, such as the lawsuits that are currently pending uh, by members of Congress who were adversely affected on January 6th, including plaintiffs such as Eric Swalwell, um, and by members of the Capitol Police Force and the defamation suit. Uh, being brought by Dominion Voting Systems against uh, a large cast of lying characters. Uh, the second is prosecution for perjury. This is unfortunately not a very promising uh, road because perjury cases are very seldom brought and they're very seldom brought because they're really hard to prove and they require proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, but that again, that's for everyone, lawyer and non-lawyer. Focusing on the existing potential remedies that only apply to attorneys, there are two main ones. The first is uh, discipline applied by judges, primarily Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Uh, and the second is bar discipline, including the risk of losing one's license. Now, judges can refer and do refer lawyers who violated Rule 11 to the bar for disciplinary proceedings. And the bar discipline in most, if not all states, is subject to judicial review. So these systems are actually intertwined. I'm gonna start with rule 11, um, at which among other things, um, for the, if there are any non-lawyers, rule 11 uh, requires a certain uh, standard of care um, when appearing in court. And among other things, it obliges attorneys to engage in reasonable inquiry, the exact so sort of work that Vic was talking about. We are responsible for everything we say, whether in writing or verbally to the court. You have a duty to investigate and you have an accompanying duty of candor to the court. These are really important. Judges don't like to enforce rule 11. They find it problematic. In many instances, they apparently prefer to simply say to the bar, there may be something here, look into it. And the rule requires that judges apply sanctions when they find a Rule 11 violation. And the sanctions can be very stiff. They include being responsible for the other party's fees, which as a, attorneys meeting in a very eminent law firm realize, can run into a very significant sum and it comes out of the offending lawyer's pocket. Um, so I wanna focus uh, in more detail on bar discipline, whether pursuant to a reference from a judge or uh, undertaken independently, often in response to complaints from other members of the bar. Um, the, Bar discipline rests on the ABA model rules of professional conduct. And the purpose of those rules is to protect the public in its reliance upon the integrity and responsibility of the legal profession. Because a lawyer is an officer of the legal system 
and a public citizen having a special responsibility for the quality of justice. Rule 3.3 provides that a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of law or fact to a tribunal. That is covered by Rule 11. Rule 4.A states that while representing a client, a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a third person. I would need to unravel various terms in Rule 4.A. The commentary makes clear that the false statements here are not limited to what they call affirmative false statements or bald-faced lies about facts um, or footnotes, um, but they include misrepresentation, misleading, partially true statements, and every variety of effort to mislead. And the third person doesn't mean I'm sitting across the table for you, from you and I lie to you. It includes statements made to the general public, including in press conferences and media. Rule 8.4 is a sort of a catch-all. And that says, a lawyer shall not engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation, or engage in any other conduct that adversely reflects on the lawyer's fitness as a lawyer. And courts have ruled that violation of the first two rules I referred to always uh, adds up to a violation of 8.4, because violations of those rules reflect on a lawyer's fitness. And one important thing to note about 8.4 is it does not require knowledge. You can fall into 8.4 by failing to do your research. So now we're in a position to better understand a few examples where lawyers have clearly crossed a line uh, in telling election lies in the last few years. And I'm gonna briefly examine because we don't have time if I took all day to um, look at Rudy Giuliani's offenses. Um, so I'd originally planned to talk about Sidney Powell and there are some CLE materials about Powell, but um, after the Mar-a-Lago search, I decided to set her to the side. I think she's pretty well known. So uh, Giuliani's license was suspended in New York State. Suspended, not revoked. Um, prior to a full inquiry that is still pending. And he appealed to our intermediate appellate court, which excoriated him in a very detailed opinion outlining his lies and his insistence on repeating those lies. Um, and the suspension was based on one minor uh, misleading statement in a courtroom, but really, on the, the overwhelming evidence was from press conferences, state legislative hearings, radio broadcasts as both a guest and a host, uh, cable TV, um, and um, his appearance in Philadelphia at the Four Seasons Landscaping Company. Um, the court found, and I'm quoting, uncontroverted evidence that Giuliani violated all three of the rules that I've set out. And it held very clearly, there is no First Amendment defense to restrictions on attorney speech where there is knowing misconduct. And knowledge may be inferred. In, in that court proceeding, Giuliani failed to provide any evidence or even affidavits reputing the inference that he knew that what he was saying was not true. And at best that he had failed to check. So for example, he gave wildly different numbers on the number of dead people who voted in Philadelphia and no support for any of them. So this does not suggest that he had a basis for thinking that what he was saying was true. He said that boxer Joe Frazier had continued to vote for years in Philadelphia after he had died, where in fact, the Bar Association submitted evidence that he had been, that Frazier had been stricken from the rolls within three months of his death. Um, and on and on and on for many, many pages. Um, 
He also, Giuliani, asserted in a, uh, a phone call attended by thousands of reporters and citizens that there was a pending fraud claim in one of the cases challenging election results, where in fact he had withdrawn that claim in the courtroom. Um, so the court held that he had violated all three rules, but it put a lot of emphasis on rule 4.3 that he had violated the model rules by lying to members of the public. And later we learned in the January 6th select committee hearings from Rusty Bowers um, that Giuliani said, we have lots of theories, we just don't have the evidence. So uh, the bottom line here is violation of the model rules, the court said, always harms the public. Persistent and pervasive misrepresentations to the public are continuing violation. The misconduct was continuing even after the bar inquiry started. The underlying offense, the court said, is incredibly serious, and the final sanction is likely to be serious. And it bears on, the falsehoods bear on ongoing legal disputes in many, many states based on the narrative of a stolen election, that's a quote, uh, including changes that are being made to laws and being challenged in courts as this case is proceeding. So the takeaways are, as Vic said, lawyers can't just make stuff up. They cannot proceed from conspiracy theories, speculation, and conjecture. And that public statements are at least as harmful and possibly more harmful than the statements made in a courtroom, which most people are never going to read or hear about. Giuliani's risk is not limited to his New York license. He faces disciplinary proceedings in the District of Columbia. Um, he's a defendant in the Dominion defamation case and in numerous civil suits based on his role in the events leading up to the January 6th um, violence. And he was recently informed and made public that he is a target of the Fulton County grand jury investigation into election tampering. So does this help us understand the lies surrounding the search pursuant to a federal warrant of Mar-a-Lago on August 8th and the way that the attorneys for Donald Trump handled the aftermath and continue to handle the aftermath of that search. A lot of people have noted that they've been meticulous in not including their lies uh, in court filings, but they don't seem to have gotten the message that that isn't enough. Um, so they, for example, have accused the FBI of making stuff up and coming up with whatever they want. They falsely affirmed that there had been a diligent search and that all the material in Mar-a-Lago had been returned to the US government or beyond that, all of the documents that were purloined by the former president had been returned. A lawyer signed a statement based on what another attorney told her about the return of those documents with no independent due diligence Unlike Alex Cannon, who we learned earlier this week, said, I can't sign that because I don't think it's true. Um, uh, the attorney who was at Mar-a-Lago during the search said she didn't get a copy of the warrant or receive a list of what was taken. When it was established that was not true, she did not retract, never corrected the record. And these attorney lies, as a detailed report from the City Bar Association of New York, uh, indicated a few weeks ago, also have the potential to incite violence, just as lies by attorneys leading up to January 6th. Um, but which is uh, added to that, uh, looking at the uh, credible threats to the magistrate judge who um, signed the warrant, his synagogue, and FBI agents who participated in the search, and the attack on the Cincinnati FBI office later that week. So I have a couple of ideas for things that we can do that would reach beyond attorneys. Uh, one involves uh, a, a statute that I helped to draft that was considered in Washington state uh, that would require 
candidates for office as a condition of being placed on the ballot to take the same oath of office to under uh, to uphold the law that they would take if they were elected and um, sworn in. Um, and it would add um, a, a new provision of the laws saying that after the litigation is, uh, any litigation challenging election results is completed, um, candidates for office and office holders cannot continue to dispute the legitimacy of the election. So in conclusion, the rules that apply to client matters have to be uh, pursued more vigorously. We should understand that the same dangers exist when lawyers are not representing a client and lie to the public about the legitimacy of our elections. Uh, in reality, I know that has not been the practice, but we should be demanding more as a profession and as citizens. Wonderful, thank you. So next we're gonna hear from uh, Matt Morgan, a partner at Barnes Thornwood. Well, thank you all uh, for having me here today. I uh, I want to I would be remiss though if I didn't start at the beginning by saying thank you to the Anderson Center, the University of Illinois College of Law for their hospitality through this whole program and process, and uh, Kimball Anderson and uh, Carrie Gatsas Anderson. Thank you so much for your generosity to the College of Law to bring this type of discussion uh, to the fore. I have a a different place in this presentation, insofar as that um, why am I here? I from 2017 to 2020, I worked in the office of the vice president for Vice President Mike Pence. I was the chief counsel to the vice president until March of 2020, at which point um, uh, uh, sometimes career paths are circuitous. Sometimes you don't always get on the right path. I uh, joined the presidential campaign as the director of pre-election litigation. In June of 2020, I was named the general counsel to the presidential campaign. But in the days lead after the election in November, I was all of the responsibilities for recounts, contests, or litigation were reassigned to others based on my lack of desire to proceed with the claims that you have just heard. Now, because we are in an advocacy and professional responsibility discussion, I would also be remiss if I didn't flag my own limitation here today to discuss Rule 1.9 of the Rules of Professional Responsibility discussions about former clients. So... <laughs> I, I'm going to be very careful of this as I proceed with you, but what I'm hoping to bring to the discussion today is a practitioner's point of view. What happens on the, on the ground that leads to issues that are not necessarily as dire as has been previously discussed, but there's a lot of pressures for lawyers inside of the political law space that I want to bring to the fore today and discuss, because I think my assertion is that the rules of professional responsibility need a little bit of help from some other sources of law to help attorneys who practice in this space. And I'm going to try and get to that in my kind of 10 to 15 minutes here um, with you today. And one of the questions that was posed by the dean leading into this was, where are the red, where are the red lines? And I think we've discussed this, baseless, meritless, vexatious lawsuits, frivolous lawsuits. This is this should be a red line for all lawyers. And so I, I completely stip, stipulate to that. And I want to be very careful here because there's a decided asymmetry. And I admit that I stipulate to that between what happened after Election Day and what happened before Election Day. But one thing I did want to cite, because I do want to bring it to your attention, because it is happening in the field of political and election law. Uh, Rick Hassan, who's a well-noted election law professor at UCLA, um, considered one of the foremost election law experts in the United States, posted a, a blog post on February 4th, 2020. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, I say a blog post. I don't mean to diminish it at all. Uh, Professor Hassan regularly is posting things about election laws, election changes, and he uses his blog format to do that. But he said something that stuck out to me um, that I do want to flag for all of you. In 2020, pre-election litigation, and this is his words, before Trump tried to overturn the election, he said Democrats and voting rights organizations ultimately lost election law cases by a ratio of more than seven to one. So th this in Rick is decidedly not a conservative. I say that only to say this is not someone who's like parroting a kind of conservative side of the aisle line. 
And he, and he, I think he posted this because he was very frustrated. He thought some of these losses uh, created bad precedent and bad law from kind of the, um, from that side. And I, and I also want to flag this for all of you. Um, he said that it, it wasn't as well documented, but he said, um, suits challenging state election laws and regulations or practices, um, he said the experience should inform the approach of those who care deeply about voting rights issues in 2022 and beyond. Legal challenges to voting rules are an indispensable response to voter activity, but the 2020 record suggests the importance of strategic approach to the choice of suits and the realistic assessment of the cost of failure. I flag that to say this. My position is that lawyers who practice in this field should both practice with competence and should practice with the court in mind. Uh, my, um, the professor, as, as she just spoke, cited a rule that I had written down, um, here as well in the preamble to the ABA model rules. It says a lawyer as a member of the legal profession is a representative of clients, an officer of the legal system and a public citizen having special responsibility. And I think lawyers who represent political clients often forget the second two components. Zealous advocacy on behalf of the client is the driving force. But I think lawyers have to ask themselves, what am I trying to win? What am I trying to be successful on? Because what I saw regularly in 2020 on both my left and my right was individuals who are seeking to win for their candidate or for their cause and not necessarily bringing cases into court for the sake of winning in court. Typically in other contexts, not all, but you bring a case in court because you have a harm that you want remedied and you can remedy that harm either right in damages and in, in, in the law or in equity. The unique thing about the practice of election law is that most cases that come to court are in the form of equity or seeking either specific performance or uh, equitable relief in the form of injunctions. So what happens is the calculus of these cases coming into court are often hard to um, figure out when you should abandon the case or when the case is no longer meritorious to proceed. But what really starts to happen, this is where my practitioner point is coming in, the campaign leadership, political party leadership, and this one is on both sides, have communicative goals and fundraising goals. They're independent of that courtroom activity that is occurring. And the challenge sometimes is that the lawyers aren't in a position to say, this case is now a lo loser for whatever facts have been presented through the discovery process or through the courtroom process. And a lot of times when lawyers want to pull those cases back, campaign and party leadership says, no, 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 this is a messaging tool. And this messaging tool achieves things for us independent of the courtroom. And I say this to all of you and all of our listeners out there to say, Lawyers in this field should enter this field. This is, it's hard to figure out how to regulate this, but I do want to bring it to the discussion is that lawyers should ask themselves, am I trying to achieve a goal that the court can give me? And do I have a reasonable probability of succeeding to remedy my harm? Proceed by all accounts, proceed. Even if you're seeking new precedent or you're trying to push the boundaries of the law in ways that lawyers normally do, great. If your case returns to the point of this is a communicative or fundraising goal for the campaign or political party for which I am seeking, that is not a place to be for lawyers. Lawyers should say to their clients to the best of their ability, I'm out of here. Now, that, though, is not always the case because there are always pressures in the profession to stick with a client who may seek goals. I think one of our next... Um, uh, it's similar in some ways to our next panel on family law. Sometimes the emotion of the suit drives the suit more than the actual outcome being sought. And I would commend to any lawyer who wants to enter the political law or election law arena to be aware of these pressures in advance. There is a duty in the rules of professional responsibility to have competence and diligence. And my argument is, Competent and diligence is understanding what you're getting into in advance. The other thing I draw for all lawyers is a lot of times you hear calls for, you'll hear uh, whether it was lawyers for Trump or lawyers for Biden. We heard this in 2020. There's a recruiting mechanism to achieve lawyers to assist 
um, in and around election day and after election day with things that may be lawyer activities. What I, what I would commend to the lawyers who volunteer for those exercises is if you want to do that, you are probably best to do that in a capacity documented that says, I'm serving as someone who can act as a helper or a prudential advisor and not necessarily legal counsel of record. Even if you're going to volunteer on a campaign, you should document for that campaign whether you are in lawyer mode or not in lawyer mode. I found this to be very interesting in and around the election on both sides. You couldn't always tell who are the lawyers of record for the various entities and who are not. What I'm trying to advocate to this group and from a practitioner standpoint is political campaigns, political parties have a way of kind of distorting whether you're arguing in court or arguing in the court of public opinion. Are you a counsel of record or are you just an advisor? Are you just volunteering or are you truly operating under that ABA preamble where you're an officer of the court or have a duty to the court, I should say, and have a duty to your fellow citizens? Or are you in just the cause-based effort of trying to get a candidate to win for office? And that's okay. I have, I have no issues with that. I'm trying to advocate to lawyers who practice in this space or who potentially volunteer in this space to make clear even in the form of, you can't call an engagement letter if you're not actually you know, being engaged by that client, but I would document in writing in advance because it helps keep you accountable to your own task at hand. And this is some of the practitioner point I want to bring into the mix because what I also found, um, again, it was asymmetric, but there was a lot of lacking of competence in the election law space. And I do want to flag this. Our most prestigious law firms in the United States are abandoning this practice. They do not want to be in this practice. This practice causes them headaches with their other high paying clients. This is not a good practice to be in. And what happens is it's no aspersion on solo practitioners or small law firms, but oftentimes they're not resourced enough to have kind of the diligence and competence. And what I'm trying to advocate here for is if you as a lawyer decide this is an area of practice you want to enter into, then you need to gain that competence. And what I'm trying to add here today is I've written a list of things I think you should be competent on. Now, this is just the, the Matt Morgan list, right? This is not, this is not like, uh, it's hard to bring these things into the, into the written um, record, but I do want to flag them. You should bring a deep knowledge of election law to the argument. You should know the election laws at issue for your state um, that impact what's going on. Two, you should know the style and judicial philosophy of the judges or justices you're going before. You should know how to practice in the court you're in. And I saw that a lot. You'd have lawyers in courts they had never seen before practicing. And you just thought, wow, that's interesting. Like, because they don't know the style of the judge or the decorum and, and the rest. You need to understand, this is one thing just more on a success point. If you're going to practice an election law and you're going to sign your name to be counsel of record to an election law challenge, you need to have thought out the appellate strategy in advance. One of the questions that Dean posed coming into today was, has this always been the way it is? Has this always been the way of election law? And what I would say to you is, no, I think the 2000 election, and I won't, I don't need to yammer on about it, but I think the 2000 election changed a lot about the way we view lawyers and their roles in the courts because of how contentious the 2000 election was and that it got all the way to the United States Supreme Court. But a lesson when I was on the presidential campaign that I was trying to learn and pay attention to was Ted Olson, who became Solicitor General of the United States, who made the primary argument in Bush v. Gore, he knew his appellate strategy when they were filing Bush versus Palm Beach County canvassing board, he knew where he wanted to be through the process. And so that's another one of, uh, I think what uh, our professor has said, there's just throw spaghetti at the wall, right? Let's, let's actually think this through because it is not competent to just throw any claim you think you can write down at the wall. Um, know the history of contested elections as well. There's a legal component, but there's a historical component. And um, when it came to um, when it comes to Bush v. Gore, there's a huge it's either I'm going to get this wrong. It's either Texas or Texas A&M. Um, one of the professors at one of those institutions published this huge uh, recap of the legal back and forth of Bush versus Gore. And that was 
super insightful to me pre-election. Now, it didn't come to the fore for me post-election, but I'm saying that I made sure I was understanding the history of challenge elections, not just the law that goes into it. And the last thing, the last thing I have, and this is just another one of these Matt Morgan points, I don't believe, and I only mean this in the election context, I don't want to spill over outside my lane. I don't believe in the election contest. The lawyers of record who are bringing the claims should be the ones going on TV. You can have separate lawyers for the campaign who are designated to speak about what the campaign is doing because they're knowledgeable about the law and they can speak the law. But I don't believe the council of record should go on TV because they're often forced to make statements that go necessarily beyond what they're filing in court. And I believe there should be some sort of screen between the two. Now, that's more... Can you actually get a campaign or a political party to adhere to what I just said? Highly unlikely. But I want to say to anyone who's practicing in this field to think about that. I think the of councils or the the councils of record, excuse me, should be the ones working on the papers and let others be the ones who are working on the um, court of public opinion. Now, with all this being said, I do have some other things this that I wanted to add to what the professor said about the roles of professional responsibility. So these are my takes as a practitioner. This was the experience I had. And one thing though, is that I'm not sure the model rules get us there. So for example, in one case, it's the most egregious uh, legal thing I heard. Not what, what I mean is an in court, not prepared statement. There was a case where one of the judges asked one of the litigants, what is the standard what is the scrutiny I should apply to this matter? Any first year law student at the University of Illinois College of Law is taking constitutional law will know this. If it's a government regulation I want to put down, it's strict scrutiny. If I want it to survive, it's not strict scrutiny. I mean, it's rational basis, or even if you want to say it's heightened and you have some sort of distinguishing pick. This is pretty easy. Strict scrutiny. I want this law dead. The answer was the normal or regular scrutiny. And I about fell out of my chair. And I thought, wow, we're just not there in terms of the confidence. And what I'm seeing is I'm not sure, though, that the rules of professional responsibility completely pick all this up, right? That's this is a clear statement of not competence, and you can roll through that. But when it comes to elections themselves, my sense of the matter is if we want to provide for elections where we don't have just these visceral disputes afterwards, there are some, what I would define as non-lawyer policy things that could be done, and I'm going to list those here, but I'm trying to flag for all of you, this is outside of the practice of law, right? What I've talked today is the pressures inside of the practice of law, but there are components outside of the practice of law that do impact uh, what we're trying to do. And I'm being given the sign that I need to get through this quickly, so I am going to get through this quickly. Um, for lawyers, as I stated, um, you should help your clients win in court and then let them fight in the court of public opinion for their own electoral or political purposes. One thing in the courts for judges, for anyone listening in, I actually believe the Purcell principle, which says that we shouldn't be changing election laws through the courts in close proximity to the election. I would love to see judges. There's a four part test to this. And oftentimes part four is kind of pushed to the side. I would like to see part four reinvigorated a little bit to actually bring that uh, principle further away from um, the time of the election, meaning less changes by the courts is uh, even further away from the time of election. For state legislatures, there need to be simplified uh, recount contests and litigation processes that go in order that the public can understand with defined form and venue that makes it so everyone understands what's going to happen, not just the lawyers. And for federal legislators, since I have one here, um, more resources to the vote counters through uh, the Electoral Assistance Commission, I think, would be helpful to the states. It's odd for a conservative Republican to say that. But I do think that um, the states, because this is something they only engage in every two years, often underinvest in their election equipment. And if it is of national significance, as we're discussing, that would be something that would be helpful. So I'm happy to discuss uh, when we get to panel forum any of my particular experiences. But thank you for letting me share these uh, practitioner thoughts with you. And last but not least, we're going to hear uh, from uh, the, the view from Georgia from Ryan. Thank you, Dina Marr, and thank you. Uh, um, it's, a, it's an honor to be part of this distinguished panel. 
My name is Ryan Germany. I'm the general counsel for the Georgia Secretary of State. Um, and I've been in that position since 2014. I think Matt asked a good question, kind of wh why am I up here? So why, why am I up here? It's probably because of a phone call. Um, and um, I didn't say much on that phone call. Um, but um, one of the things that I did say, and I tried to say it very respectfully, um, and it kind of came up in previous or in subsequent uh, media stories, was at some point I said, well, that, that's not accurate, Mr. President. Um, that has since been thrown in my face by my 10 year old daughter, who sometimes will say to me, that's not accurate, Mr. Dad, when I, when I, <laughs> when, uh, I tell her something that she doesn't agree with. Um, and I want to say uh, thank you to Kimball Anderson and to the Anderson family um, for, for this uh, event. Um, it really means a great deal to me to hear uh, Kimball refer to me as kind of an unsung hero, um, especially after last night we put together that some of the people that he's practiced with in his career are some of my mentors uh, who, who taught me to practice law. So that was a, a nice connection to make. Um, but, but I do want to distinguish between, um, and so I, I really appreciate that. I don't want to sound like I, like I don't. Um, but my role was a little bit different. You know, all that I was doing on that phone call was basically pushing back on an opposing party in litigation, which is, you know, pretty, pretty par for the course. Um, of course, trying to do so respectfully and, uh, and professionally, which I know we all try to do in our cases. Um, and I have never been put uh, in a position by any of my bosses, Secretary Raffensperger, uh, previously I worked for Secretary Crittenton um, or Secretary Kemp, where, where, the, where there was kind of pressure to go beyond, I think, what the law allowed. And so I, I want to give all three of them a lot of credit for that. Um, one thing that Secretary Raffensperger said quite a bit in the time following the 2020 election was um, adversity doesn't create character, it reveals it. And uh, I, I think he, uh, as a Secretary of State and, and as a man, just really embodies that. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think he faced a lot of adversity, not uh, necessarily from the president, but, um, you know, in the state legislature and the state government, when our state legislators are coming after you with questions and all that, that can be a lot more challenging because, you know, they then control kind of your, your purse strings and the laws that kind of relate to you. But, but he stood up to all of that in a way that I think was just respectful and professional and, um, and truthful. So I want to give him a lot of credit. I also want to give a lot of credit to, uh, there are some people and some of them are here today who, when you do have to make that call between what your client wants you to do and what you feel that you can do professionally and to and to say i'm not i i, I can't do that i'm not going to do that um and i i have not been put in that position i think that position that's one that, that really i just admire that quite a bit and i hope that i can uh, show that same type of fortitude if i ever am put in it and, and it probably will come up um in a lot of different practices of law, uh, probably maybe not as publicly, <laughs> but but it probably will. And so I think that's something we can all sort of think about as lawyers. What are we going to do when we're put in that situation? Um, Matt made Matt made some great points about the challenges of representing candidates and political groups. Um, I, I endorse the, the Morgan principles of <laughs> of um, election law practice. Um, our office is on the other side of that journey. Generally, we're getting sued by those types of groups um, from across the political spectrum. So I don't really like getting sued. So I'll admit at the beginning that my experience is kind of colored by that fact. Uh, so what, what I want to do, I, I appreciate Professor Ross um, kind of leaving Cindy Powell out of it because that that kind of allows me to bring her up here. Because I think her case that she brought in Georgia is kind of a good case study and starting point to walk us through some of the cases that we've had in Georgia in the election law arena, um, really over the past several years. Um, so the case I'm referring to was referred to in the media as the Kraken. 
people, or I, I should say, Sidney Powell referred to it as the Kraken. Um, and so on December 7th, 2020, about a month after the 2020 election, that's when Sidney Powell came to Atlanta and quote unquote released the Kraken. Um, and so I'm going to read a few of the allegations from the complaint that was filed. And of course, that complaint is subject to all the rules Professor Ross and Matt talked about. Um, and I just, I want us to think about that kind of, okay, here's what, and then I'm going to talk about what, what uh, Ms. Powell stood up and said in court. So here was the basis of the complaint, and I, and I want to make clear for everyone watching at home, this is I'm quoting from the, from the actual complaint. Um, the scheme and artifice to defraud was for the purpose of illegally and fraudulently manipulating the vote count to make certain the election of Joe Biden as president of the United States. The fraud was executed by many means, but the most fundamentally troubling, insidious, and egregious is the systematic adaption of old-fashioned ballot stuffing. It has since it has now been amplified and rendered virtually invisible by computer software created and run by domestic and foreign actors for that very purpose. The scheme and artifice to defraud affected tens of thousands of votes in Georgia alone and rigged the election in Georgia for Joe Biden. The massive fraud, I'm still quoting, begins with the election software and hardware from Dominion Voting, only recently purchased. Dominion and Smartmatic were founded by foreign oligarchs and dictators to ensure computerized ballot stuffing and vote manipulation to whatever level was needed to make certain Venezuelan dictator Hugo Chavez never lost an election. And that's only from the first couple of pages. I didn't really even go through most of it. Um, but one of the questions Dina Marr asked as we were preparing for this panel was, where's the red line? I think everyone can agree that's past. Wherever the red line is, that's past it, right? But that can be helpful. I think, okay, we're in a place where we can all agree this is past it. So let's back up from there. Um, here's what Sydney Powell says when she stands up uh, in court on December 7th, 2020. I just want to reiterate that I'm about to read from the transcript of that proceeding. Um, this is not what I think. It's what Ms. Powell said in court. Um, forget that this machine and its systems originated in Venezuela to ensure the election of Hugo Chavez and that it was designed for that purpose. Let's just look at what happened in Georgia. And she quotes, the stealth vote alteration or operational interference risk posed by malware that can be effectively invisible to detection, whether intentionally seated or not, are high once implanted. The modality of the system's capacity to deprive voters of their cast votes without insecurity regarding how their votes are actually cast and recorded in the unverified QR code makes the potential constitutional deprivation less transparently visible as well, at least until any portions of the system implode because of system breach, breakdown, or crashes. National cybersecurity experts convincingly present evidence that it's not a question of when this might happen, but it's not a question of might this actually ever happen, but when will it happen, especially if further protective measures are not taken. Given the masking nature of malware in the current system described here, if the state and dominion sim simply stand by and say we have never seen it. The future does not bode well. The judge in the Kraken case uh, then tells Ms. Powell, you don't need to get into your, your expert stuff right now. We're on a motion to dismiss. We're talking about jurisdictional issues. And then she clarifies to the judge, judge, that, that's not my evidence. I was reading from an opinion entered by Judge Totenberg in October 2020 in a case that was brought um, by activists who filed an election contest filing, uh, following um, a congressional special election in 2017 in Georgia. These are, of course, were activists um, who are supporting uh, the, the Democrat candidate in that case. Um, the, um, there was a draft executive order that I think was not signed, or it was not signed, but it was drafted, I think I was in, I read in the media by um, Professor Eastman. In that order, which the point of it was, I'm gonna, you should, the president should declare martial law and go seize all the Dominion voting machines. Um, 
in that order, and you can look at it online, it quotes this same language from Judge Totenberg that was developed you know, in, in this case. And so here's the point that I'm trying to make kind of right now um, for election law practitioners, for judges with election law cases. Be careful <laughs> because what you're arguing in court can and will be used by probably the other party when they have an election that they don't want to trust the result of. Um, and, I, and, I, and I bring that up because, and I'll get back to this a little bit at the end of my, of my talk, but when we talk about the future of our democracy and kind of the strings holding it, um, I really think we've got to recognize, uh, okay, this is not necessarily, Dina Marr said, is this the new normal? Unfortunately, I think he's right that it has become the new normal, but it's not all that new. Um, I think what Congressman Swalwell so eloquently and powerfully described from a firsthand perspective at the beginning, I think it's opened our eyes to where it can go. And we have events like this, um, and thank you to the Anderson Center, I think that y'all's center about professionalism and advocacy is even more kind of important now, not just to our profession, but really to our democracy. Um, but we, we really have to realize um, the extent of, of these types of arguments. And I think as lawyers, we really have a responsibility to our clients, of course. Um, but I think we have a responsibility as lawyers to the community. I think a lot of people are going to look to each of you and the people uh, watching online as someone that they come to in their community, not, a, not as a professional, but just someone who they kind of know is generally aware of what's going on and follow stuff. And I think we have that responsibility where we can provide a little bit more. Well, hang on. It's kind of like what Dina Marr talked about with the law review article. Um, I'm probably not reading as many law review articles, no offense to the academics in the room, but I've, I've found that same phenomenon in a news article. You, know, you click on the, the link and it's like, well, that doesn't say <laughs> what they say it says. And, and that's something I think lawyers can do and then share with their community, especially around elections. Um, one point I do want to make, I, I took some notes here that are a bit scrolled while other people were talking. Um, okay, so I think one thing that we can all kind of agree on, hopefully, is these voting machine type claims where it's like, well, we really can't be sure what might have happened. It's like, okay, well, yeah, that's true. Um, even though there's no evidence it has happened, we really can't be sure what maybe has happened somewhere. I think those need to be seen with like a lot of caution by practitioners, by judges. Um, but then there are, and, 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 some, and I think Matt and Professor Ross both talked about this, there should be a way to go challenge election laws you disagree with uh, not disagree with that you believe basically violate a constitution or some other law uh, in court, and that's an important thing to be able to do. And the same for elections. If there is a problem um, with evidence that goes to the result of the election, and that happens occasionally, usually it's in elections where they're decided by. Um, we, you know, I, I told you at the beginning I was up here because of a phone call. It's not that unusual for us to get phone calls from candidates who lost by a small amount of votes, um, and they're pretty upset. Uh, for instance, the, the Long County probate judge lost by six votes, and he called, and he was really upset, and went to an election contest and, and all of that. You know, it's not as, it's not as public. Um, it's very unusual for that person to be the president of the United States, but, um, but, there, but in, in, a, in a case like that, I, I don't, I, I think in the Long County probate judge's case, his contest was not successful, but he brought it, he had his evidence and he said, here's the number of votes. Here's how I put this number of votes at issue. I think that's a perfectly, that should be something to be done. And, and you have to be, election law practitioners have to do it carefully um, with evidence that everyone has talked about, but that's, that's not what we're trying to stop here. Um, But I, 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 back to the sort of the first type of challenging state election laws like Matt was talking about, very much should there should be, there's an avenue to do that and there should be. But in the practice of those claims too, 
I think those practitioners uh, have to be careful um, in what they're saying, because a practice, and I think Matt nailed, really nailed it, where a lot of times it seems like, oh, they're not really after judicial relief. They're after a headline. Um, they're after fundraising. And that can be effective. It can be really effective. Um, is it sort of a proper use of federal court? I, I don't know enough. I'm going to have to leave that to Professor Ross and others to um, to figure that out. Uh, I know um, to me it feels like it's it's very difficult to defend those claims. I'll say that um, because you know when the when when the point is not arguing when the whole point is not judicial relief. So for instance, so one one last case I'll talk about and then I'll and then I'll, okay. Um, is the fair fight case. The fair fight case was was brought uh, following the 2018 election in Georgia when Stacey Abrams famously did not concede the race uh, to Governor Brian Kemp, refused to call him legitimately elected, um, and then formed fair fight to file this lawsuit. Just last week, almost four years after filing the complaint, Judge Jones, an Obama-appointed judge, uh, ruled for the state on every count. Um, it was a gratifying result for me. Uh, it took a long time, but I think that lawsuit probably did serve a lot of fair fights, kind of non-judicial um, goals like Matt was talking about. Here are some of the allegations from the initial fair fight complaint. Um, and I'm, I'm reading these to make the point, and after, right after this, I'll say something different about that. Um, well, you know what? I'll skip the allegations because we're running out of time. But I will say this. In the fair fight case, um, I think that case proceeded in such a way with the lawyers on the other side where it, it got much narrower as the case went on because I do think they were um, reactive to the evidence that they had. Um, and I would surmise that they were probably getting some pressure too to, hey, we, we need more than this. <laughs> And they had to say to their client, of course, I'm surmising, hey, it's not there. Um, and that, the, that's a tough relationship. And I give those lawyers a lot of credit uh, for, for doing the same thing that I gave kind of Matt and BJ credit for earlier. Um, I'm going to wrap it up right there, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you to Ken Bull. Thank you to Miss Anderson for, um, for inviting me here, for having this center. I think it's very important, and I look forward to uh, the discussion. So we've got uh, about 25 minutes. Um, and I'm sure um, people in the room might have questions and, and the panelists may have questions of each other. But let me just throw out a big question that any or all of you can comment on. As I listened carefully to what each of you said, I believed from all of you that there's a big problem with the way advocacy is operating in um, uh, our election system. Uh, whether it's entirely new or it's just kind of worse uh, in, a, in an incremental way, we're at a very bad point. What I didn't hear as much was exactly what we can do about it. So um, a lot of tools that are mentioned, Rule 11, um, pre-election lawsuits, which you talked about, Catherine. It's not clear to me why post-election and pre-election, it's not a bright line rule. I mean, a falsity is a falsity. Um, I, what I heard was they're tools, but people just don't want to use them. And the reason they don't want to use them may go back to the congressman's point about how all of this is a joke and, um, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's kabuki. Um, uh, so what do we do? Um, you know, uh, Matt mentioned, you know, a couple of practical things. One of them, the things he mentioned, I thought was 180 degrees wrong, the idea that Purcell should be pushed far, farther back. Um, you can't challenge an election when it's coming up and you can't challenge it when it's kind of on the horizon. And um, uh, you got ripeness problems in federal court if you challenge it too far away. And the legislature's changing things all over the time. And on top of which, 
you need time to get up the appellate ladder because trial court judge rulings are just placeholders. They're not going to do anything. So, um, you know, Purcell is, is a really complicated topic, but it's not uh, an unalloyed good as, as uh, Jason and I have, have written about. But so what I want something hopeful. What, do you, what can you give me? I mean, you, you know, Congressman, you mentioned the uh, the draft, uh, the proposal electoral count act. Okay, so we take the the, the uh, vice president and we make the vote counting ministerial. As you point out, though, kind of the bubble in the rug pushes it back to the states. Um, you know, this this case, Moore versus Harper, um, uh, uh, going to be argued in, in uh, December or January or so. Um, that if embraced by the Supreme Court, embodies a theory that would give state legislatures carte blanche to decide for themselves, as long as they do so prior to a presidential election, that they're not even bound by the will of the voters. They, they can pick the electors themselves. They might, they might use the, uh, uh, the election results as advisory, but not binding. Or they can make themselves, rather than the state courts, the dispute resolution uh, fora after an election, um, notwithstanding anything that a state constitution may say to the contrary. So what can we do about any of this? There's no perfect solution because uh, it's almost whack-a-mole. We're gonna get rid of the idea that the vice president can overturn the election, but a lot of democratic activists, and, and I think this was brought up by Ryan and Matt with the be careful what you wish for, a lot of democratic activists are saying, well, wait, the vice president right now is Kamala Harris. And all of the state legislatures that we're worried about are going to get redder this coming election cycle. And they're throwing out the people who are more aligned with like a Raffensperger type who did the right thing, followed the election law, certified uh, the election. And you're going to have people who are not going to be willing to certify. So why would you want to take ri get rid of a vice president's ability to do that? I, I, I think we have to get rid of it, not just for this election, but for the future. But I, I do worry that um, the, the issue is now going to be, uh, as I said, uh, much more decentralized and it's going to become a decentralized state by state problem. And um, so that's why in the public realm, if, if I can't address it in Congress, I would just say in the public realm, raising the issue so that citizens recognize that who they vote for mid or farther down the ballot actually is going to affect who could be president of the United States, who could be on the Supreme Court, et cetera. And then I would just say, so, so, just yeah, so, the, yeah. so the, the solution is to um, you know, get the word out there so the voters do the right thing. And, and, and we're seeing in the public opinion that never has it been higher, uh, where uh, the, the top concerns among Americans are economy, abortion rights and democracy. Democracy has never landed at, at number three before. It's always been way, way down at one or two percent. Yeah. Thinks we have a problem with democracy right. precisely because of all the mistruth. They, right. they embrace the mistruth. That's right. So, um, uh, so elevating, I think, is important. But finally, just as someone, I'm still a member of the California Bar. I, I do believe that state by state bar associations, putting the fear of God into its members, that you know the Giuliani treatment could be applied to you would also go a long way. As far as I know, John Eastman is still a member of the California Bar. Yeah, that they're, they're not putting the fear of God in their members. <laughs> can I can I add one thing from a oops, I don't know if this thing's on. Yeah. One thing I want to add just from a tactical standpoint, this is just totally a tactic and it requires state legislatures and the administrators and elections to, to do what I'm about to say. But one policy prescription I have that really has frustrated me over time is the speed with which um, counters count. Florida was ground zero for disaster in 2000, and they were slow to count. They were fast to count in 2020. They were at like 90% within hours after the election. And what I submit to all of you here in the room and listening in is that in the gap from polls close to, to count, that is where a lot of mischief occurs. And the faster you can squeeze the two together, we voted, here is the count. And I'll, I'll give, I want to give three examples. One in Georgia, both in, Georgia is a slower counting state. Yeah. And, and well, so I'm going to pick I'll, on my I'll, good friend. I'll address that. <laughs> The issue I had in Georgia, I'm just trying to say where mischief can occur. 
in Georgia, where I thought mischief occurred is the day after the election, we asked our folks on the ground, we knew the vote totals that were on the board, and we said, how many votes are outstanding and where are they? So meaning, and I'm just going to use simple numbers here, I don't remember the exact numbers of Georgia, but if they said 10,000 votes outstanding in counties A, B, and C, great, I got it. 12 hours later, it was 15,000 outstanding votes in county C, D, and E. I don't say that's mischief or fraud. I'm saying that was disorganization because that's what was being reported and back and out. A hundred percent. That's what I'm saying. It breeds mistrust. Second, in Pennsylvania, they were just slow. Pennsylvania was just slow. If you had actually seen where the real gap was in close proximity, I mean, they were counting a week after and it kept growing. But if you had seen the gap pretty close to election day, I'm not sure as many, I shouldn't say none, but I'm not sure as many of these um, baseless lawsuits would have been as uh, for or to the front in, in Pennsylvania. And the last thing I would say is Arizona. I'm going to pick on the three states that are at issue here. Arizona got to like 85% quick, but there was something about their counting where they were releasing certain batches or tranches every day. And the challenge of when you do that, it feeds the court of public opinion narratives that say to the public, hey, are they looking for votes? And I don't subscribe to that. I don't think that's the case, but it allows the mischief to creep in. It's just one thing from a policy Matt, perspective. Can I just say, I, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I see this also with instant runoff voting. There's nothing instant about it. It takes forever and it undermines the goals behind it. But we did actively months before recognizing that these arguments were going to be made in the court of public opinion, like any opening, like effective opening statement, we tried to seed for the voters what we called the red mirage, that the president would be up. And then as the votes came in over the next you know, few hours, uh, that it would tighten or we'd go ahead. So we did try and address that, but that's not an excuse for any state, regardless of who runs it, for getting this done faster. And if memory serves on Pennsylvania, I did Pennsylvania, uh, the Republican legislature there passed laws that prohibited the starting of the counting. So it's not just how quickly you count after the polls close. It's whether you can start counting any of the ballots that came in that were certified well before the polls closed, even if you can't release those. So, so again, it's you know there are partisan implications that that, that explain why the counting is is uh, is the way it is in some places. Yeah, but I would say Florida got embarrassed and they fixed their law, and some of these other states are still sitting on the same laws. And I get there may be a partisan interest in there, but they're sitting on them. And I would advocate we should try to change those laws. I, I think Matt makes a great point. I'm going to disagree with him on one, agree with him on the other. Georgia actually finished its counting faster than Florida. The difference was we had a difference of 11,000 votes. So every you had to actually finish before. Um, but he's correct that when people were asking certain counties, how many votes do you have left? They weren't getting a good answer. And that and that is not good from a confidence inducing perspective. In Georgia, we, we passed a law following that, um, we had actually passed an emergency rule at the state election board in the lead up to 2020, allowing counties to start uh, early processing of absentee ballots, which is not basically, you don't, you can't count them, you can't tabulate them, but you can, you know, after you verify them, you open them up and scan them. And so they're basically, you know, they're scanned and then you, they, but then no one knows the result until after, but you, right, after, right after the polls close, you can hit basically close election and get the results. Um, and the the, the legislature and the, the law was, um, it's Georgia Election Integrity Act, it was much maligned by the media, but it did things like that. It it codified early processing. So starting two weeks before the election, you can, counties can start processing absentee ballots because Matt's exactly right. Post voting pre-results is a vacuum that's filled by stuff that's not good. Um, so the faster we can get results, the better. The other law, the other part of that law that's relevant is um, I, I call the, den the, the denominator rule, where counties have to publish by 10 p.m. that night how many votes do you have still remaining. Um, and so, um, and, and I'll say one final thing to go back to your initial question. I do think kind of the a silver lining or a um, what, what gives me hope is county election officials. Um, the scrutiny, the massive amount of scrutiny on county election officials right now has been really tough for them. Um, 
but it's also, I think it's also going to be good. Um, you know, I can't say enough good things about uh, the vast majority of election officials in, in Georgia, and they're dealing with a lot of these things on the ground. Um, they're kind of, oh, maybe hardening is the wrong word, but you know, they're dealing with these people and they're trying and they're explaining, hey, here's, come in and see, here's how all this works. And, I, and so rats really, I think, kind of, um, that's what gives me hope is they're, they're getting scrutiny. They're actually getting better attention now from their county commissioners from a funding perspective um, because county commissioners are hearing about it now from their constituents. And um, so, I, so I do think there's, some, there's kind of a silver lining in all this attention that the administration of elections is um, more scrutiny and not necessarily bad. Uh, it, it, and and, and I, cause I think what it will show is our counties are doing a good job. So on that uh, note, uh, Matt, you mentioned uh, you know, increased federal funding uh, would be good. Is it the case, and you guys are on the ground, so you know, is it the case that states will accept that readily? For example, I remember Help America Vote Act, a lot of states didn't take everything they were entitled to because, again, they had reasons for wanting the, the systems to operate the way they did. Is it your sense now, for example, in Georgia, Ryan, that you know, county commissioners are wanting to fund more um, if, if the federal government, if, if, uh, if Eric uh, does, you know, waves his magic wand, that, that, that uh, every state will, will accept that kind of stuff and, and make good use of it? Yes. <laughs> and and, and, and you know, the, the, there's been grants through the EAC, through HAVA, and they, they've been, they've, they're utilized by states um, for sure. And, and I think they've been fairly non-controversial. You know, there's a lot of sort of third-party grants that became controversial following 2020, but the, the HAVA money has really not been controversial. Okay, so, uh, uh, Scott. To the Congressman, as well as uh, Professor uh, Ross, uh, to the First Amendment issue. In the case, the Congressman, the case that Ted Cruz story, I know that both the House and the Senate have certain rules and that's what they criticize colleagues. Could you stand up and say, I'm speaking as a public citizen, I'm not speaking as a Congressman, Ted Cruz is a pile of, or this person is that, or the Supreme Court is that. Do the congressional rules apply that? Professor Ross, the same thing. If an attorney stands up and says something outrageous, but says, I'm not speaking as an attorney, okay, does the First Amendment then kick in to protect you from that stand? Well, so can you kind of repeat the gist of the question as you answer it? Um, sure. Uh, sure. Sure. Uh, your question, I think, is uh, if, if I was to, you know, demean the character of one of my colleagues, so those rules apply uh, when you're within the institution. So if you're on the floor of the house or within committee, and if you were to do that, uh, the other side could ask to what we call take your words down. Uh, and that means that the words would be stricken from the record. And also if your words are taken down, you would not be able to speak for the rest of that uh, session day. So that, that's the, the punishment. Happens rarely like once or twice a session. Typically uh, you know, the parties will resolve it uh, in a way that they'll, someone will apologize and you won't see like a formal, uh, you know, taking down of the words. Um, but that's only within, you know, under the dome. Anything outside uh, our rules don't allow us right now as constructed, you know, to have any sort of penalty. And indeed, the speech and debate clause allows each right. chamber to punish right. its members, but doesn't allow any outside sanctions to, to attach to that. Uh, 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 uh. So the question about... The, the question about um, lawyers who say, I'm not speaking as a lawyer is a bit more complicated. I think when we're talking about public statements, um, that it depends a lot kind of what hat people appear to be wearing. Um, you know, if you don't have a client and you are a contributing opinion person on a cable program or you have a podcast, uh, and you make it clear, I'm speaking for myself and I am a citizen, even though I am a citizen with special responsibilities because I'm an attorney. You can't really escape that. Um, that's one thing. It's another thing if you also are the president of the local bar association or you chair the judiciary committee of the state legislature, then I think you don't have a lot of wriggle room, wiggle room because you will always appear to be speaking in some quasi-official capacity. But that's one of those great things that would have to be sort of parsed on a case-by-case -case basis. It's a great question. Thank you. Jason. Um, great, thanks so much. Um, as I was listening, uh, I kept wondering about over-deterrence in this area. And 
So whether we're talking about uh, uh, your proposal, uh, Congressman, with respect to uh, the, the tightening uh, constraints on the vice president uh, or raising the, the, the number of members of Congress who can object, or Professor Ross kind of tough application of the uh, uh, rules that apply to attorneys in every other context, in this context as well. That all makes sense if your model uh, is Trump telling lies and Giuliani repeating the lies in the same direction. Um, but do those kinds of same rules um, uh, uh, produce the risk uh, that in other sorts of contexts where there might not be lies, but maybe some suspicion that something's gone wrong, uh, either on the technology side or with respect to how people are running uh, in elections, where we actually want those kinds of claims aired and aired fully, and hopefully by the best lawyer in the country, because they can present the best case. Um, and it uh, sounds like they might run into trouble uh, under your broad understanding, uh, or uh, a congressman, uh, maybe that doesn't get uh, aired sufficiently in Congress. Um, is that a risk? I mean, a democracy, you should want all of that to uh, be out on, on the table. So the, the Trump model might not be the right model for thinking about reform. I, th I think you're right that the Trump model presents us with the easiest cases. That's and, the wrong mm -hmm. case. No, no, I'm saying they're the easiest because they're the red lines. And the title of our panel was, you know, where are the red lines? So I, I agree with Ryan that we, if we start with the red lines, maybe we do end up in the wrong place. And I, I just want to say, you know, I, I'm struck by finding myself in this position because I don't think there are a lot of people who are more strident uh, defenders of rights of free expression than me. I am very startled to find myself in this current situation trying to figure out how we prevent the Constitution from being a suicide pact with respect to things like election laws. So I'm very sensitive to that proposition. Um, but I think, um, you know, it, it's, it shouldn't be designed as a gotcha kind of situation. You know, one thing I like about the Giuliani and the Powell examples is that they repeated, they refused to retract when confronted, they doubled down. And um, to borrow a phrase from uh, Senator McConnell, they persisted. Um, so, you know, I, uh, my intention is not that if somebody misspeaks once, uh, misleads with it and then learns more and says, no, actually there isn't enough basis. Or as Ryan gave the example in the, the fairness case, uh, lawyers who amend their complaints, whittle it down to what they think they have the evidence to prove. You know, I, I very much have in mind a sensible model and perhaps uh, being provoked by the extremes that we're seeing. Uh, I, I should make that clearer. You're right, I, you're right. I'll just oh, quickly say I, I I appreciate that because I, I think a lot of the rules that we have to follow just within our institution of Congress are kind of one-off responses to extreme outliers that will never happen again, but kind of limit our ability, I think, to do our job effectively. I would just say, though, that the former president did exploit this idea that the vice president would be able to do this. And if you actually played out what he wanted the vice president to do, it would have descended the country into absolute chaos because the founders did not intend for the vice president to play that role. And, and, and just to go to, you know, Ryan's optimistic that local county officials showed integrity and will continue to get it right. I hope that's the case. I hope we have more Gabe Sterlings, who was a county official in Georgia and, and fewer of the types of people who are running for office who are election deniers. But right now, it, it, the trend is that we continue to go in the direction of election deniers and so I actually, I think at least on this one discrete issue, what can the vice president do or not do? I would rather take that off the table uh, because I, I still think there are other legal avenues uh, to pursue meritorious claims. Right. Two more and got two part of responses really uh, sure. Yes. And then I I'll take this. If it works, it does. Okay. Um, first off, full disclosure. I am a professor, but not of law, but of auditing and fraud examination. I am also commissioner of elections for the city of Chicago. Um, the, the dean asked, you know, where, where are the proposals? Where are the solutions to this? Earlier this year, the, uh, there was an academic survey of American over 18 eligible to vote. And 
plus or minus 2% and 95% confidence level, uh, and asked, how would your confidence in elections be affected if elections were routinely audited by independent CPAs who were further certified as election auditors? Over 67% of Americans said that they would have increased confidence in our election. Over 40% said they vote more frequently. Do you think this is something that should be out there that would give Americans better confidence? Yes, um, I think election audit is really important. We started that in 2020 in Georgia, um, and I think it was invaluable. It didn't. It certainly didn't convince everybody. But this was done by government officials, That's right? Well, you're proposing slightly different. I think it's, I think it's a good idea. Um, I think more audits by government officials are good as well. Um, and we're looking to expand that. And Georgia will have an audit after the 2022 election. But I, I, I think audits are a good, a, a good. Uh, Solution. Okay, I'll send you a copy of the article once I get pu once I get it published because I did the survey. <laughs> okay, Last question for my range. Uh, thank you so much. I will try to be quick, and just in case we're able to fit another one. Let me just um, start by thanking all of you for doing this uh, panel. It's been really great to to, to hear. Um, my question is more about one of Matt Morgan's principles. I'd like you to talk a little bit more, provide a bit more detail, or sort of your own sort of line, um, but I'd also love to hear from the other panelists to see their own perspectives on it. And when you talked about how, you know, these suits being filed in court are more about communicative and fundraising goals. Um, I, I hear that, I understand that, I respect that. But I wonder if, because even when I, you know, as a, as a black female immigrant that grew up in the South, right, I sometimes think of these things as more um, important in terms of feeling heard and represented and respected, right? And, and so that's kind of valuable, right? And so I don't know if, um, to, to, to sort of go off of what Mr. Germany said in terms of Stacey Abrams and, the, uh, uh, and all of that, um, uh, if, if my interest and in, in understanding and respect for that is sort of opening the door to something we don't wanna see happen in the future, or if that alone is significant, important enough that we do want we want to allow for some of that. I'd like to hear more what you have to say. Sure. Yeah. My my point was that I think there are places you can be heard other than court when the goal is not to achieve some sort of remedy that the court can give you. And my analysis when we were in the pre-election mode was as, as you bring a case in, what is, and I, I made this little note, what is our expected probability of prevailing what is the expected judgment we could get and what were what would be the cost of that litigation? And in some ways, this creates like a model for which you can weigh, like, is this worth it? Because there is also judicial economy. You have to be respectful of the court to say, if I'm bringing something to you for which I have low probability of prevailing, low probability of achieving any judgment that actually remedies any perceived harm I may have and high costs of litigation, you're going to use a lot of that court time that could be used for other litigants who really do need their... Um, cases heard because what really happens in election time too is election cases crowd out other cases. I mean, Judge Conley in Wisconsin, we probably drove him insane. I mean, I don't know if in federal, and he's in United States federal court, I mean, extremely competent judge. I'm just trying to say every case, every day that was rolling through there, he was not doing anything else. And my view is as um, having a duty to the courts, we should be respectful that there are other litigants who are trying to advocate for their rights in those courts. So that, that was my take on it. I, I think candidates should you know, raise their issues, including issues with election laws, uh, including any post-election stuff. I do think, um, based on what we've seen in Georgia in 2018 and 2020, candidates, I think, have a, do have a special duty to conceive when all that, you know, after that is played out. I, I, I think that is kind of a norm that I hope we can get back to. Well, we're going to have to call it there. Thank you so much for your wonderful By the way, it takes a couple minutes, I think, for people to get up here. So um, uh, if you need to stretch your legs just for two or three minutes, you'll be able to do that. But thanks again uh, to our wonderful uh, presenters. Right, so hey, Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Ryan.
Hi, everybody. I'm Tony Gatto. I'm the director. We're going to try to have a quick turnaround with the board, so if we can get seated. Um, just as a heads up, lunch will be available after this presentation. And so what we'll do is lunch will be available outside to pick up and then come back for the lunchtime talk by Judge Kirsch. But if we can everybody get seated so we can get started and stay on schedule, um, that'd be greatly appreciated. I'm going to turn it over to Erica Harrell. Thank you. Well, good morning. I know I certainly enjoyed the first panel. It was informative, engaging, lively, everything that you want a good panel to be. And so I just also want to offer my gratitude to people who came and shared with such competence and candor, and were so engaging as well. My name is Erica Harold, and I'm the Executive Director of the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism. We would like to begin by thanking the Anderson Center for Advocacy and Professionalism for sponsoring this symposium. We'd like to thank the Andersons and the University of Illinois College of Law. We'd also like to thank Winston and Strawn for being such gracious hosts. They were very helpful to us as we were working through different IT issues. And we just want to commend you on your professionalism and let you know how greatly appreciated that was. This symposium is particularly timely because a significant number of lawyers routinely and sometimes strategically cross that boundary between zealous advocacy and incivility. Whether it's sending incendiary emails, using degrading language, or weaponizing the legal process. During the past several months, many lawyers and judges have told me that they've witnessed an increase in and a worsening of incivility. Now, while incivility occurs in all aspects of the legal profession, family law is an area where this type of conduct disproportionately occurs. This is not surprising. Given the magnitude of the issues involved and the life-changing nature of the legal decisions rendered, the stakes are high, and as our prior panel noted, the emotions run even higher. What happens in family law courtrooms decide the fate of relationships, of families, of assets, and ultimately legacies. But there are strategies for navigating this incivility, and we have a diverse panel of very accomplished individuals to provide perspective, advice, 
and Dean and Mar will be happy to hear, they will also be providing hope. We have some solutions for how this can be better. And so it's my honor to introduce my panelists to you right now. This is someone that actually needs no introduction, but I want to give her her due. This is Judge Deborah Walker. Judge Deborah Walker is a Cook County Circuit Court judge in the Domestic Relations Division. She obtained accounting and law degrees from the University of Illinois. At the time of her election to the bench in 2008, Judge Walker was a partner at Klaus and Miller PC, where she specialized in professional liability defense work. She has served as president of the Women's Bar Association of Illinois, the Illinois Bar Foundation, and the Illinois Judges Foundation. I've decided she does not sleep and probably runs on sugar and caffeine. That's the only way that she can accomplish this. Additionally, Judge Walker served for nearly 20 years on the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism, including six years as our chair, and she was influential and impactful. She also serves on the University of Illinois College of Law's Dean's Advisory Board and the Anderson Center for Advocacy and Professionalism Board. Judge Walker will soon be sworn in as a justice of the Illinois Appellate Court. Judge Walker, could you briefly share what you have found most rewarding in adjudicating family law cases? Well, you know, I learned rapidly because I never practiced family law before I became a judge, but I, I rapidly learned that there's never a dull day in divorce court. It's sort of like, you know, what you think of as judge duty. Um, you know, on certain days, it can sort of seem to be like judge duty. Thank you very much. I have one of those voices that carries as well. But um, anyway, in, with a more serious uh, light to this, it's, it's been an assignment for me where I've been constantly learning. Again, I told you I, I never practiced family law before I became a judge, and I didn't even know this as a 21-year trial lawyer, but family law touches on every area of law. Because as you can imagine, when an individual's in the throes of a divorce, they bring everything, anything that the law is touching them, they bring it into their divorce. So as a result, you know, we have to learn about bankruptcy, tax for sure, corporate securities law, um, international law under the Hague Convention when uh, one parent grabs the kids and runs to another country, um, immigration law. Now they're asking us family law judges to make findings with regard to special immigrant juvenile status. So you can imagine that that constant learning is really, um, it's intriguing, it's stimulating. And thank goodness for me, because I'm about to, um, they say ascend, that sounds sort of like pompous, but I'm about <laughs> to become an appellate court justice and where I'll be ruling on, uh, you know, writing opinions on every area of the law. So that's prepared me well. You can see why she was elected. I'd like to now introduce our second panelist, attorney Brad Trowbridge. Prior to practicing law, attorney Trowbridge earned a master's degree in human development counseling from McMurray College, and he worked for 10 years with at-risk populations, including teen mothers, the LGBTQ plus community, and the elderly. After graduating from the University of Illinois College of Law in 2000, attorney Trowbridge has represented hundreds of clients in family law matters. He's also served as a child representative and guardian ad litem, and he's conducted custody evaluations. He has also taught in the John Marshall Law School Family Law and Domestic Violence Clinic, and he served as co-chair of the board of directors of the Chicago Metropolitan Battered Women's Network. Attorney Trowbridge will soon be Judge Trowbridge, as he will soon be sworn in as a judge of the Cook County Circuit Court in the 8th Subcircuit. Attorney Tr Trowbridge, could you briefly share what you found most gratifying in serving as a guardian ad litem in cases? Uh, I think being a guardian ad litem is the most preferable role to play because you get to uh, advocate what, for what I would call the innocent people, the children, um, and you get to take a position that you feel is in their best interest and not advocating for a client whose positions you don't necessarily agree with. And I'm about to join the uh, Judge Judy show. <laughs> <laughs> you get to see them all before they take their next level. So you'll be able to say we knew them when. Our final panelist is Professor, Professor Stephanie Tang. Professor Tang joined the Baylor Law School faculty in spring of 2022 
and she teaches family law and advanced family law. Before joining Baylor, Professor Tang was a partner at a family law firm in Chicago, and she obtained certifications as a mediator and a fellow with Collaborative Divorce Illinois. She was selected as a rising star attorney in Illinois by the Illinois Super Lawyers, and she was named the Illinois State Bar Association's 2019 Young Lawyer of the Year. Professor Tang also was selected to receive the Distinguished Service Award for Outstanding Pro Bono Services by the Chicago Volunteer Legal Services. And from 2022 to 2023, Professor Tang is serving as chair of the Illinois State Bar Association's Family Law Section Council. This is notable because she is the youngest and the first Asian American to serve in this capacity. Professor Tang received a bachelor's degree in psychology and legal studies with honors from Northwestern University, and she graduated magna cum laude from the University of Illinois College of Law. Professor Tang, from a professor's perspective, can you share something particularly interesting that you're studying right now in family law? Sure. So I will say I have a little bit of imposter syndrome since I just joined the academy earlier this year. And a lot of what I'll be talking about today is as an attorney's perspective. So I feel like I'm still transitioning between the two. But um, earlier this week, actually, I published an article on cryptocurrency, NFTs and divorce. Uh, and that's going back to Judge Walker's point about intersectionality between family law and other areas of law. And I think also in terms of this discussion breeds a lot of the discussion between other lawyers and the interplay of all lawyers in other fields of law and family lawyers going into other areas of law, bankruptcy court, collections court, uh, and even in federal court with Hague Convention claims, where you see this kind of incivility of people who aren't familiar, who don't practice in these areas every day. Um, otherwise, I'm working on an article looking at how different states approach the best interest of the child standard with extended family members and how there is a wide discrepancy of approaches to extended family across states. And again, that comes a little bit from my practice as a family law attorney and informs uh, is, is informed based on the instability I saw from judges across the board in terms of how they're looking at extended family members and multi-generational households and applying the best interest of the child standard. Thank you for sharing that. And I know we all look forward to reading those articles. As a panel, we have three main learning objectives that we hope to achieve as a panel today. First, to describe how incivility manifests itself in and has an impact on the legal profession. Second, to identify the reasons why incivility occurs relatively frequently in family law cases. And third, to develop strategies that lawyers and judges can use to address and prevent incivility in family law cases. But I wanna make sure to note that while our panel is focused on family law, incivility is something that I'm sure every practitioner here knows is prevalent throughout the legal profession as a whole. And so the strategies that we'll be sharing are strategies that you can apply in dealing with incivility in your own practices. Family law though tends to be ground zero because of the emotional stakes and the ways in which sometimes clients are the ones motivating their attorneys to be the ones who are engaging in this in incivility. Now, in order to allow for some audience engagement today, because I know we have lawyers and people here that have a lot of strong opinions, we wanna make sure to give you an opportunity to engage. And so we're going to be using a polling tool called Slido, which will display poll questions and allow you to respond in real time using your cell phone or tablet. So please make sure that you have your tablet and cell phone available because I'm going to give you instructions of how to be ready to poll. Slido is simple to use and set up. All you need is to have your cell phone or your tablet and access to the internet. What you need to first do is either use the QR code or go to www.slido.com. On the Slido website, enter in the following. 1684994. And you enter that in in the participant box at the top. And that's displayed as well. Then you tap the green arrow. Is everybody moving along with us? And we do have the number up on our PowerPoint. So the number you need to insert. You should see the home screen 
Is everyone seeing a home screen? Excellent. And polls will appear here. And you'll simply be able to answer those poll questions with your phone. And we ask that you answer them as we display them because it will give us a good sense in the room of the different perspectives that people have. We're ready for the first poll question and Judge Walker will present it. All right, everybody on Slido? Okay. I think there's one question. It was www.slido.com and Slido spelled S-L-I-D-O. And then the QR code is there as well. All right, our first uh, polling question is, to what extent do you believe incivility is a problem in the legal profession? And you can see there, um, we've got people who think not a problem or it's a minor problem or it's a significant problem or our final option is an insurmountable problem. And how are our numbers looking? Okay. 37 have a weighed in. And it looks like the bar graph is really significant problem, right? The green. So the majority of the folks who have uh, voted here uh, think that it's a significant problem. And I was kind of thinking most would fall uh, in those middle ranges between two and three, uh, between being in a minor problem and a significant problem. Um, and so I think that uh, kind of what I expected to occur has occurred here. So now that we've conducted our own sort of civility survey here today, Let's take a look at a national survey. In 2018, uh, the Civility in America survey was conducted by Weber Shandwick, a public relations firm, and Powell Tate, a public affairs specialty group. And from that survey, the Civility in America survey, 92% of Americans said, civility is important to our democracy. Moreover, 93% of our respondents said that um, so incivility is a problem in our society. And 75% said that incivility had reached crisis levels. This survey also demonstrated that incivility disproportionately affects women and minorities. And we can see that on our next slide as well. We've got a uh, bar graph from that same Civility in America 2018 uh, survey. Here's the top portion and the bottom portion of that bar graph. Um, you can see the emphasis on women and minorities on this graph, including the impact on LGBTQ folks and those with disabilities, as opposed to sort of the bottom of the bar graph for men, white collar workers and upper income people who are much less impacted by incivility, according to this nationwide survey. Growing incivility is what led the Illinois Supreme Court to establish the Commission on Professionalism in 2005. And they did this through Illinois Supreme Court Rule 799. And since I'm talking a little bit about our commission, I wanna make sure to recognize and introduce to you the staff members my teammates who are here today. We have our deputy director, Stephanie Valinsky. If you could give her a round of applause. And then we have our education manager, Dan Davies. People don't like to be introduced, but I do believe that you ought to, you ought to give recognition to people who do good work and who enable you to be able to present information like this, because this was a team effort to be able to put this presentation together and to put the PowerPoint together. And I wanna make sure that everyone on my team gets good recognition. The Supreme Court put this commission together after several years of study by a commi committee on civility. It found that a growing attitude, particularly in litigation, equated zealous advocacy with aggression and a scorched earth mentality. So the commission was created with a very aspirational mission. The goal is to promote civility, professionalism, and inclusion among Illinois lawyers and judges. We do this through a variety of methods. We develop and deliver courses and presentations like this. We cultivate thought leadership through writing articles, creating digital and social media content, 
And we also do a lot of interviews with various media outlets. We use a lawyer to lawyer mentoring program to try to pair more experienced lawyers with new lawyers, because I'm sure everyone in this room knows you may start out with a mindset of wanting to be ethical and wanting to do the right thing. But if you're new and you don't know exactly what the rules are and how they might apply to a given situation, you might need someone to tell you, okay, this is what you need to do. This is the kind of way you communicate with your client. And so the lawyer to lawyer mentoring program is something that's been very impactful. We also do a lot of collaborations with bar associations, law schools, and legal organizations. The Commission on Professionalism performed. The Commission on Professionalism performed surveys of Illinois lawyers regarding the low level of incivility they experience. Of 54% of lawyers who said they had experienced unprofessional behavior from another attorney in the last six months, the type of incivility generally fell into three categories. One, prejudice, two, rudeness, and three, st three strategic incivility. And strategic incivility uh, led the pack with 51% of uh, those complaints or, or responses. Um, the, in, the behaviors in that category included the act of misrepresenting facts, uh, of negotiating in bad faith was one of those. 38% of the respondents reported behavior that fell into the rudeness category, which included sarcastic and condescending uh, attitudes from a fellow attorney and behaviors categorized as prejudice was the lowest with uh, lowest incidence with the level of 9%. That included ageism, sexism, and racism, and unsurprisingly, women and people of color reported being victim of this kind of conduct most commonly. Excellent. So there are some serious consequences to this incivility and this commission study results also showed an extremely high percentage of responses demonstrating that incivility makes it more difficult to resolve matters, costs clients more and harms the public confidence in the judicial system as a whole. Not only did almost all Illinois lawyers agree that incivility makes the practice of law less satisfying, but almost two thirds of those respondents agreed that incivility discourages diversity in the legal profession. The commission's civility survey also detected a key issue that's particularly important for today's panel. And that's that incivility is not experienced uniformly across all legal professions and legal practices. Rather, there are certain types of law, certain types of practices that have a higher incidence of incivility and unprofessional behavior. And those include civil rights law, criminal law, personal injury law, and the subject of today's panel, family law. Okay, this brings us to our next poll question. Does everybody have their uh, tablet or, or phone out? And the, people, and the people who are joining us virtually, you are able to participate in this. I wanna make sure you know that. You're able to participate and have your vote counted and have your voice heard. So we'd like you to name some popular movies or TV shows featuring divorce or custody issues. So go ahead and start inserting some movies and TV shows. I see some people are thinking. I see some answers are populating. All right. And, and it's so light, I can't even read it. A lot of Steph, Kramer versus reading? Kramer. Kramer, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Marriage Story. Marriage Story. <laughs> What was the last one? Intolerable cruelty. Wow, what a title. Parent trap. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Anybody have War of the Roses? Yeah, Is that up there? Fun. War of the Roses up there? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, again, we're happy to sort of have this as a fun thing, but uh, Professor Tang's going to tell us uh, why we decided to first head with the fun okay yeah so we pose this question not just for comic relief and amusement but rather to highlight <laughs> how these issues actually play out in pop culture and the media and also underscore back to what our first panelist was saying the pressures that attorneys sometimes experience from their clients and the duty of attorneys to manage those client expectations and balance those with the incivility concerns here so we pulled the case from 2021 that was issued in illinois um, in Ray, the marriage of Hong Zhang and Ying Jun Tang, where the wife in the case, 
felt like she was wrong by the divorce judgment that was entered. So she filed a motion to vacate under Section 214.01 of the Code of Civil Procedure, which uh, for those of you who aren't practicing in Illinois, which I guess includes me now too, uh, <laughs> if you file a motion to vacate beyond the 30 days after the entry of a judgment, and there are limited grounds under which a court can vacate, including unconscionability, uh, duress, fraud, uh, rather than kind of within the 30 day period. And here, one of the grounds or reasons that the wife gave for not exercising the requisite due diligence in filing this motion was that she only found out about this after the British royal wedding. So she was sitting there watching the British <laughs> royal wedding. After the British royal wedding was done, suits came on. And she learned from watching Suits that it was an option to reopen a case. And it was only after that that she found out from watching this TV show that she was able to do this. Now, this is a very overt example of the influences that media and TV shows and can have on a perception of what is feasible in family law. But for those of us who are attorneys in the room, I think all of us have had that experience where a client has Googled something or has watched a movie, has watched a TV show and said, I want you to file this motion because I Googled it and I found out that it was a thing that I could do. <laughs> and then we have the conversation as attorneys as we cannot do this for you because this is not real life. You watched uh, divorce court, you watched whatever it is on TV. This is a kind of unusual example. And I do know the appellate attorney who did this and I respect her uh, and she's very well known within the community. But I, I think this is an example of where you are looking at how you manage the client's expectations and then how and giving some grace in terms of the discussions that you're having with opposing counsel. Sometimes, you know, you have to give the other side a call and say, you know, I know that this motion is maybe a 1%, 5%, very small chance of succeeding in court. But my client is really putting a lot of pressure on me to file it. And I, uh, and there is some success. Or you have to have the tough conversation on the other side where you're saying, you know, I, there is no chance that we are going to prevail in court because this is not relief. I've appeared in front of the judge that you are in front of. I have on this exact same issue, your case is not unique. And being able to have the confidence from talking to your peers, talking to your colleagues, even from your experience in court that informs that knowledge in terms of what you're able to file in court, what is not sanctionable, more importantly, uh, that won't put your law license on the line and won't put you as a subject to a malpractice action, which we'll get into in a little bit here. Well, as we talk broadly about family law, I think that it'd be very helpful probably for everyone to know what actually constitutes family law. Because those of us who are not practitioners in that area, I think we have a much more limited scope or limited idea of what actually falls within that rubric. So Judge Walker, if you could share a little bit from your perspective, what are some of the key issues in family law that you address? So I want to talk briefly about property and maintenance formerly known as alimony, for those of you who don't practice in the area. So you want to know why it gets so heated in divorce court? Because it's all about money, right? Who gets the house? That's pretty a pretty emotional um, question to ask. Uh, how will the retirement funds be divvied up? A lot of people think, well, I earned those retirement funds. I get to keep them. Well, that's not the law. Uh, was there a valid prenup? Those are lots of fun fights. Uh, I've, tried, I've tried a case on whether or not there was a valid prenup. Uh, one of the richest men in Illinois uh, had a valid prenup, Ken Griffin. Um, so um, very interesting cases along the money line and, and uh, equally with maintenance or what we used to call alimony. A lot of people think it's based on needs. You know, you've got this really wealthy man, an attorney from a big law law firm in Chicago, and he thinks, well, his wife, I mean, come on, she doesn't need that, your honor, but that's not the, the law. The law is based upon what was that marital standard of living? How did they live before they separated? Uh, and it's also, of course, based on income. So some those are some of the issues that I'm confronting a lot. Because of my accounting background, I try the financially complex divorces for Cook County. 
Professor Tang, could you talk a little bit about some of the custody and decision-making cases that are part of the family law rubric? Sure, yeah. So I think the areas where incivility comes up probably the most are twofold. First, where uh, attorneys are parents themselves and they are not able to kind of draw the line between their own children and the children who they're representing or the children that are the children of their clients. And I've seen a lot of, we have very similar ideas. We see, we have a seven-year-old, they have a seven-year-old. We think that the best way to parent that seven-year-old is to enroll them in a bunch of activities, is to enroll them in a private school, is to have them be raised in a certain religion or have a certain doctor. And if you as the attorney ascribe to those principles and then are unable to see any other potential kind of best way to raise a child, a lot of the instability comes with this disagreement and willing unwillingness to kind of open your mind to a alternative way of parenting, alternative methodology of raising a child. Um, another area is that's coming up a lot more frequently now is where parents are of different cultural racial backgrounds. And similarly, they have very different uh, thoughts on what is the appropriate behaviors to raise a child? What is the right way to do it. And there's no answer to that. But where that comes into dispute is that our legal standard, as I was talking about before, is very fluffy. It's universal, but it is the best interest of the child. And it's a widely discretionary standard for the judiciary. And it's just up to the judge to determine what is the best way and what is in the best interest of the child for how to raise this child. And from that becomes a lot of emotional disputes, but both between the parties, but also as attorneys who aren't able to separate their emotions from their clients' emotions. And Attorney Trowbridge, if you can touch on domestic violence issues, I know it, in the course of preparing for this panel, I had not recognized or realized that domestic violence actually is part of family law. I thought maybe it was criminal or some other part of the law, but it is in fact part of family law. So can you describe that a bit? Illinois, uh, people seek what are called orders of protection. Other states call them restraining orders, but it's orders of protection in Illinois. And there are two um, divisions in which you can seek an order of protection. The, the common one in family law, or for those of us who are practitioners, is in domestic relations. So that's part of the divorce or parentage case. And the other one is through the domestic violence courthouse. Um, where you can seek an order of protection and you have to have a certain relationship with the, what's called a respondent, dating relationship, married, uh, lived in the same dwelling space at, at one point, um, related by blood to a child. And then what I call the most uh, bizarre cases are the stalking, no contact orders that someone can seek because you don't have to have much of a relationship at all. There are neighbors who seek uh, stalking no contact orders against each other. There are people who, who have never, um, like for example, a, a, a woman may have some man following her who she's never had a relationship with, she's never met and doesn't even know the name of. And she has to try to find out the name of this person in order to get this stalking no contact order. Um, but what, what I've seen sort of evolve is that the stalking no contact orders have become sort of a catch all for citizens who have complaints with each other that has nothing to do with uh, domestic relations, or I would say sometimes even domestic violence. Well, given the kind of the complexity and the broad spectrum of those issues, I'd like each of you to share some of the more egregious examples of incivility that you've experienced or witnessed in family law, because I know that's actually what you wanna hear in this panel. We've given you the educational stuff. You came here to hear specific examples of lawyers behaving badly. So that's what we're gonna give you now. Uh, we will start with Professor Tang. Can you talk from a lawyer's perspective, some of the more egregious examples that you've seen of incivility? <laughs> Sure. So the most egregious example is probably my first year out of practice. I was appearing just on a status conference, very routine. All we were there doing is to update the judge on what we were doing on discovery and to get a settlement conference date. Uh, the opposing attorney on the other side was an older male attorney, 
And I tried to kind of get his attention. I had seen his picture. I looked him up. I did my due diligence. I tried to say, hey, can we talk about this case? And he wouldn't give me the time of day. Finally, we, we get in line to see the judge. And I say, I, I, really, I really need you to acknowledge my existence. And um, he said, a, a woman's place is not in the courtroom. It's in the kitchen. And we're talking about, we're, we're in 2016. So we're not talking about decades ago. We're not talking about this is something where we, you know, have been, we've come a long way since then. This is six years ago now, uh, seven, I can do math. Uh, and so almost seven. And so we're looking at like, we're uh, in a situation where as a female attorney, I was very, uh, obviously very discouraged. I had worked really hard to build my confidence. I was one of the first times I had ever appeared in court and being judged just on the my gender was very disconcerting to me and in, uh, in terms of the inc and that was probably the most blatant time uh, that I've experienced incivility based on my gender. Um, in the collar counties here, I've experienced incivility based on my race. I've been told by a county clerk in one of the collar counties, we don't see many of your type here. And I think all of that again, in the last six years, um, I have not been practicing that long. These are not, you know, old examples. And I think it, even just acknowledging as a fundamental baseline that these are still things that are being said to young female attorneys of color is extremely important for us as a legal profession to recognize that we have not, as a society, have not come as far as kind of all of these greater trends. And I, I'm not saying that we haven't come far, but have not come as far as we might want to hope. I want to thank you for sharing that because I think it's very difficult for people to share personal experiences. And in the practice of law, our profession sometimes views vulnerability as weakness. And I'm very much a believer that if people are willing to share their stories, first of all, it's an act of courage and it's what's required to have change occur within our profession. But it is always that moment of when you share something like this, how are people going to react? Are they going to be receptive? So I just wanted to recognize that and thank you for sharing that. Attorney Trowbridge, from a GAL perspective, guardian ad litem's perspective, what are some of the more egregious examples of incivility you've witnessed? I actually don't uh, encounter that much incivility because in the beginning of a case, everyone wants to impress you they, because they know that what you have to say to the judge is going to carry a lot of weight. The problem comes in when you start offering opinions or make, making recommendations because at least one of the parents is going to be unhappy, if not both. Um, there are extreme examples where one parent thinks that the other parent should never have any parenting time. Um, sometimes that rationale is, is grounded in reasoning and other times it's just sheer hatred of the other parent. And a lot of times what happens is that children end up being in a tug of war between uh, the parents. Uh, what I will say is that it's not necessarily incivility, uh, but what happens is that when you start to make recommendations and one parent doesn't like what you're saying, you stop being paid. So that becomes an issue. It's like, well, you're not, you're not on my side. You're not doing anything to help me. So why should I pay you? We also have a GAL in the audience. Well, curious leader, if he, <laughs> if he has anything to add to that. So I think whoever that is, I think it's probably at that table has been, just know that a comment will be expected from you at some point. So you, you're, you have, you have your time to prepare. Judge Walker, from a judge's perspective, what are some of the more egregious examples you've seen? So um, certainly bullying. And uh, most often um, I see that it's based upon either age, gender, or race. Um, I'm thinking of a pretty egregious example. When I was on trial, I noticed right away. So I had, a, I had two uh, lead attorneys, um, obviously one for each side older white male on one side and younger multiracial female on the other side. And I sort of noted right away when the trial began, like um, some condescending comments made by the older white male, sort of, you know, I thought he had an attitude problem, um, insulting tone of voice. Um, and, you know, 
in that instance, admonishment is like my first go-to. So I admonish. Then later I come back from a recess and the female attorney is crying in my courtroom. So I knew that uh, he'd uh, upped his ante uh, with, with his bullying. And then I also, um, oh, and by the way, uh, I put him in time out. That's sort of my, my next route for in civil lawyers. Um, because if they're going to act like children, I'm going to treat them like children. So I put them out in the hall and I say, you calm down now. And when you've got yourself together, you can come back in my courtroom, but not until then. So I put him in timeout. And, and just anecdotally, I have to tell you, for about a year after that case, he took a change from me. Lawyers never take a change from me. <laughs> he took a change from me because I had to treat him in accord with his behavior. But I also want to comment real briefly on... Um, not necessarily something I was an eyewitness to, but I experienced in that um, when I got on the bench, a lot of the female attorneys in the division noted that I was sort of the civility queen, the civility judge, being on the Commission on Professionalism, being chair of that commission for six years. And they would come to me with some of their concerns. And overwhelmingly, it was with sexual harassment concerns and not just from lawyers, also from judges. Well, let's talk about the impact of this incivility, and this impact can be dispersed broadly across the different actors in the legal system. So Judge Walker, I'm going to go back to you. From a judge's perspective, what's the impact of this incivility? So one of the biggest concerns I have is in family law in particular, we have so many self-represented litigants, so many. And if you think that lawyers have a civility issues, you ought to have to deal with these um, self-represented litigants. About a month ago, I was uh, serving my day, my duty day as emergency judge. So I'd never met this litigant. She was only before me because I was emergency judge that day. She was 15 minutes late uh, joining the Zoom court appearance. I had already heard from the other side. It was a motion to suspend her parenting time for severe mental health concerns. I'd already heard the entire case from the GAL and from the other attorney uh, and be, before she even zoomed in. And I was in the middle of ruling. But I thought the kind thing was to do was to start over with my ruling. She kept interrupting me, interrupting me. I tried to get her under control. It's really hard when they're on Zoom, really difficult to get them under control. And then she called me a mother effing bitch. Um, and, you know, when those things happen, we need to just shrug it off, obviously. And, of course, what was my remedy? All I could do was remove her from Zoom. It's not like this probably would not have occurred if she'd been in the courtroom. Because the first thing, as soon as I started seeing her with real aggressive and getting out of control, my deputy would have gone and stood beside her. And then if it escalated, I would have put her out in the hall. We probably wouldn't have got to this point where she's really like in, in basically direct criminal contempt by calling me that name. But, you know, we're human. <laughs> Judges have feelings. And it, you know, it can start um, sort of piling on. We have to be hyper vigilant, especially on Zoom, to try to control these behaviors. And this hyper vigilance takes its toll. Um, we get to the point where, you know, burnout can be an issue for some judges. That can lead to judges having some mental health challenges, maybe abusing alcohol and drugs, because our role is always to protect the lawyers and the litigants from this incivility. Um, and it can be an, a, a pretty intense role. Well, Attorney Trowbridge, can you talk a little bit about the impact of this incivility on the litigants? Well, I, I will. I want to add something to what uh, Judge Walker was referencing. I haven't been physically in a courtroom since March of 2020. Mm. All of my cases have been over Zoom. And I think one of the few downsides of Zoom, uh, I think it's efficient generally, but it allows people to be more uh, uncivilized. And because as Judge Walker pointed out, you're not going to be taken in by the sheriff. You know, there's no, you don't even get the sense that you're in a courtroom. You know, it's, it's you're, you're, you're seeing a face on a screen. And so I think that's contributed to uh, incivility. In terms of the impact on the litigants, the obvious one is cost. Um, I once uh, withdrew from a case my client didn't want me to, but I did because I've stepped back and thought, this litigation is fueled by the hatred of the other attorney and, and 
me. It's like, I'm part of the problem here. It's hmm. like, I, I'm spending way too much time trying to figure out how to get at her, you know? And I thought, this is not how it's supposed to work. Professor Tang, can you comment on the impact of the incivility on the lawyers then? Yeah, so I think that when I was thinking about how to answer this question, it came back to the younger generation and the burnout of judges, but the burnout of attorneys is so real. It's so hard to find young family law attorneys and keep them in our practice now. Um, and I guess I left the practice too. So, um, I, uh, speaking, uh, hypocrisy aside, um, I do think that it's very difficult when we have one of those examples where you have a younger attorney and an older attorney says, oh, I thought you were their secretary. Oh, you can't be the lead counsel on this case. Um, or even just a partner who keeps continuously interrupting their younger associate as they're trying to explain something to a client and then re-explaining it to the client in the exact same words that their younger associate was, but just in a way that they, uh, so that the younger associate feels kind of lesser than and they feel like their voice is being usurped by like the older attorney, even if they have a very valid point. And frankly, most of the time they know the case better than their partner does. Um, That's I, certainly what I have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I have to tell the older guy, um, you know, she's been coming to the to the courtroom now on statuses and everything. I know she knows the case. So let her finish, please. Yeah, and I think uh, there's one th there's one thing to say, and I, I think that a lot of the family law partners take that first step to say, associates are able to appear in court and they can talk to the client. It's another thing to completely kind of come in after, because the caseloads are so high. So I wouldn't even ascribe necessarily an intentional bad behavior on the partner here, but to come in and say like, oh, I think my associate guided you the wrong way or gave you the wrong advice and steered you the wrong way. I think that has a, a really dampening effect on the younger generation of family law attorneys and has really seen a lot, as I said, a lot of job switching because the younger generation feels like their voice isn't being recognized, heard, respected. Um, and even again, not even intentionally necessarily by the partners, but in a way where again, they're speaking over them, interrupting them constantly and not giving credence to what they've done on the case and not listening to the preparation that they've done on the case. And Attorney Trowbridge, could you briefly explain your thoughts on how this incivility impacts the way the public as a whole views our legal system and the confidence it has or lack thereof? That's a, a tough question. What I can say, which doesn't exactly answer your question, is that I've found that my clients expect me to be more uncivil. Mm -hmm. that they, I don't know whether it's because of the pandemic, the political environment, social media, um, we're all a little, what I call whittled away at, we're not the same as we were. I, I have this phrase, if, if you were anxious before the pandemic, you have more anxiety. If you were depressed before the pandemic, you're more depressed. If you had anger issues, you're more angry. And what I experience is pressure from my clients mm -hmm. to fight everything like it's a war. And and it's sort of like the, the few clients that had some level of common sense have now lost that. So that's what I think makes it more difficult to practice in family law is that people are more emotional, they're more rational, and they're wanting you to behave uh, more aggressively. Well, hopefully you now agree with us that incivility has a detrimental impact on the legal profession as a whole and the rendering of justice. We're now going to explore some solutions and see how incivility is being addressed in various states and jurisdictions. Let's first start with the rules of professional conduct. Many people are probably surprised to know, but incivility can violate the rules of professional conduct. It can subject lawyers to disciplinary complaints and punishment. In Illinois, these kind of complaints are filed with the Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Commission, otherwise known as the ARDC. Rule 4.4 .4 of the Illinois Rules of Professional Conduct require respect for the rights of third persons. And this would be applicable to what we're talking about today because opposing counsel would constitute a third person to whom a lawyer must show respect and to whom a lawyer cannot seek to intentionally embarrass or burden.
Rule 8.4, which delineates categories of professional misconduct, makes clear that it is misconduct for a lawyer while representing a client to knowingly manifest bias or prejudice on a variety of spectrum of categories. And the caveat in that rule is that it would become misconduct if you do it while representing a client and that it actually delays the administration of justice or prejudices the administration of justice. And so comments that are racist or sexist or designed simply to target and embarrass somebody, those would both be violations of Rule 4.4 and Rule 8.4. But many lawyers are very loath to file complaints with the ARDC for many reasons that we don't have time to go into, but retaliation, fear of being viewed as incapable of handling tough situations, all of those things make lawyers decide, I don't want to go this route. And so there are other strategies that lawyers and judges can use proactively to address this. So incivility between opposing attorneys, as Erica said, is unfortunately very common, especially when it comes to emails and communications that occur after hours outside of court. So we're going to look at a series of exchanges that became the subject of an ARDC complaint in Illinois. Um, And the sheer number of emails that occurred during a relatively short period of time is the first indicator of incivility that occurs in this case. And so the point of kind of looking at this example is I think a lot of people are not able to identify when incivility is occurring. And that's kind of the first trick. Sometimes they're, they think this is just what happens in our profession. And so going through, um, we'll talk, this is an email exchange between the respondent, which is the person who I'm against the complaint was filed, and then attorney Renwick, who is on the receiving end of this incivility. So this might be a little bit difficult to see. So I'll try to go through the timeline here. So the first initial communication was on September 22nd of 2016, where the attorney sent the respondent an email, which among other things asked whether the respondent would be interested in participating in a settlement conference. Very mundane, routine email. Um, And since I have a toddler at home, we're gonna count the number of responses that were sent back starting at 9.29, PM. So response one, read the memo. You need to read instead of talking so bleeping much. And then send another email at 1022 PM, just, just said no. Um, then respondent forwarded the attorney an email invitation to a Halloween party that he had received from Val and Frank Motley. Mr. Motley was a college professor of Ms. Renwick and the Dean of Admissions at her alma mater in, at Indiana University. In the email he sent to Ms. Renwick at 10.22 p.m. that evening, now we're on email three, um, said, you are not invited. Uh, Next, okay. No, you're fine. Uh, So Ms. Renwick replied to respondent's email. This is her only, one and only reply that she had a standing invitation to the Motley's party. Again, very keeping the conversation civil, kind of ignoring the inflammatory rhetoric. Now we're on response four in which the uh, respondent said, uh, Frank Motley told me to treat you like a real lawyer. So I decapitated you. Just the, who the bleep do you think you were patronizing? Certain what, not moi, big mistake. Response five, he said, get to work or be quiet. Response six, uh, he said, uh, in, he stated he could have Miss Renwick disinvited from the Halloween party and that Miss Renwick might find herself disbarred. She also, in that e- same email, inquired as to whether Ms. Renwick would be wearing her weave to the next court day. Response seven, he said um, that you may have met him in law school, but respondent was in disguise. In that email, respondent also told Ms. Renwick, you don't seem to know too much. Response eight, now we're at 11.05 p.m. So this guy's just sitting on his computer, just writing emails back to this attorney at 11 o'clock at night. Um, so he actually now copied the Dean of Admissions at Indiana University and stated she could be disbarred and she doesn't even realize it. Uh, response nine, we've got 11, 10 p.m. The reply, he replied, copied Mr. Motley again and said, Ms. Renwick was out there seriously perpetrating. And finally, uh, at 11, 16 p.m., he again replied, copied Mr. Motley and stated, Ms. Renwick was a trip and she should attend the Motley's Halloween party as herself, a real witch. So our next Slido poll here is how would you handle this email exchange if you were Ms. Renwick? Would you (laughs) ignore it? 
advise the respondent that his emails are acceptable, file a motion to seek sanctions, and or file a complaint with the ARDC. And there isn't really a right answer to this, just to throw that out there. So I'll give you a minute to register your <laughs> your answers on Slido. Is everybody making Slido work for him? Looks like it. Okay. And I just want to mention that uh, Masa Renwick um, appeared before me regularly. She's an excellent lawyer, and you may have picked up on the fact that she's African American. Yeah, so it looks like the well, not even really a majority, but half. Uh, and I think this this talks about you know this is difficult. This is a difficult situation, and there isn't a right way, and it really has to be handled on kind of a case by case basis a lot of the times. So this. Uh, over half of the respondents said, advise the respondents' his email are unacceptable. I think that would probably be the route that I would take in this case. But then again, most likely in this situation, this guy's writing 10 emails between 9.30 and 11 p.m. at night. He probably knows his emails are unacceptable. He probably knows his bad, his bad behavior. And he's probably going to continue to be a bad person. So this, this might not really have much recourse. I think the advising them that the behavior is unacceptable I think would probably be the most effective methodology if it is really like a, you're constantly interrupting me. You may not realize that you're constantly interrupting me. You're constantly over explaining, re explaining a case. Um, and that's uh, making it is an inappropriate way of handling this. The next kind of most common answer is filing a complaint with the ARDC. Again, as Erica had stated, that there is a basis here, but there is a chilling effect on those complaints. And so attorneys feel like they can't do that. They're going to be retaliated against. It's very hard to make that a complaint not completely obvious who is filing that complaint. And you are still in the nature of advocating for your client in the middle of a very hotly contested divorce case. So it's very difficult to kind of file something in the midst of the case I think if this continued and escalated in so far as the representation of the attorney in in reflecting on the a client in the case itself, then I think there would be a higher reasoning to file it on a more immediate basis, say like this came into the courtroom and now this behavior was being actually uh, evidence against the client in court. So I think that would be kind of the time where do we kind of have a ripe for complaint with the ARDC. Um, Next is ignore it. I, frankly, I mean, that's all you can do a lot of the times. As Erica said, a lot of the times this is a tactic to incite a reaction. It's to incite an uh, kind of misstep in the litigation to say, uh, like, oh, here, she now responded with all this other inflammatory rhetoric. So I'm going to uh, I, I'm going to now bring this to the attention of the judge and then play mud fight with each other. And that's not super effective either. So a lot of the times, if it's not super inflammatory um, or to the point where it's to the detriment of your client, ignoring it and just seeing if it'll kind of go away or if it'll keep repeating itself may honestly be an effective, not solution, but an, a, a way to just kind of deal with this uh, case and not add fuel to the fire, so to speak, and give additional validation to this uh, person who's writing these emails. And finally, filing a motion for sanctions. I don't think that's appropriate in this case because there hasn't been anything within the court system itself. Again, if maybe something is brought like within the court system where they're filing something frivolous or defamatory within the court, we've had to file motions for sanctions where, again, a self-represented litigant has called us a lot of names in various court complaints and you could file a motion for sanctions in those cases. But I don't think under these circumstances um, it would rise to that level. Let's look now at how incivility can be driven by your own client, because I think we're familiar with the context of when it's an opposing counsel, but it, when it's your own lawyer who's saying, I'm hiring because you, I want a fighter, I want somebody who's tough, that then draws up additional ethical quandaries. So Attorney Trowbridge, can you walk us through that? Yeah, we have a hypothetical that I think is somewhat common in my experience. You're representing a client in a bitter divorce proceeding and opposing counsel requests a one week extension of time to respond to discovery requests on account of the death and opposing counsel's family. You advise your client of the request and your client insists that you refuse to grant the extension. He said that he refuses to do anything that will make uh, the process easier for his wife. 
When opposing counsel then files a motion seeking the extension, your client insists that you file an objection to the motion and ask you to include in your objection that opposing counsel is acting in bad faith and then request sanctions against opposing counsel. You have advised your client that this violates the norms of courtesy and professionalism that govern your jurisdiction, but your client is unmoved. He said you are here to fight for him, not make his wife's life easier. He suggests you may lack the toughness needed for this battle. So how would you handle that? We go to our next slide. Okay. I'm not seeing them populate. Okay, excellent. I was going to say we can all at this moment go. Well, so it's almost uh, well, it's changing. Yeah. They're still coming in. Some people are, are dealing with the complexities and changing their vote. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can see it correctly, it's what, 36%? 39% would grant the extension. 29% uh, would terminate the attorney-client relationship. 25% uh, would file the objection, but somehow communicate to the judge, the opposing counsel, this is, is your client's choice. And 7% would file the objection. Uh, without further discussion with opposing counsel. So I'm going to put you on the spot, Attorney Trowbridge. What would you do? Uh, depends what day it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, to tell you the truth, my answer would probably be something different. I, I wouldn't feel the need to request my client's permission to grant the extension. Um, I have told clients before, I'm here to advocate for what you're seeking, but you don't get to decide how I behave and you don't get to decide how I respond to opposing counsel. So it probably results in me firing the client and the client fires me. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well done. I'm going to go right back to you, though, because dealing with this incivility, as many people have alluded to, really does create stress and can undermine the well-being of an attorney. What are some tips you would give people, whether it's a judge, a lawyer, or just anybody who's dealing with this kind of incivility to protect their peace and their mental health? Well, I, I should add something else that I intended to say is that on my better days, I would say to my client, um, this may not be the best strategic approach. The, our goal is to get the, the judge to respect you and think you're reasonable. Mm -hmm. And if we file this kind of motion, we're going to be always perceived in this case as being unreasonable. And so like the story of the boy who cried wolf, we make a big deal of this when there really is a big deal, the judge may not see it as such. So, but I'd have to be on uh, really tolerant that day. To get to <laughs> so in terms of strategies, uh, won't be a surprise. One is set limits with clients. Uh, don't let their outrage cause you to lose your reputation with judges. I've had to say to clients many times, I'm not filing that. I'm not saying that because unlike you, I'm going to appear in front of this judge many, many times. And this is Cook County. I can't imagine what it's like in smaller counties where there's one or two judges you appear in front of every day. Um, so I just don't let them drive the train. Um, also, the phrase gets overused, but I, I would say keep self-care in mind, limit clients' access to you. One of my biggest regrets that I can't wait to be rid of when I stop practicing law is getting cell phone calls and texts late at night. I gave out my cell phone during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> mm -hmm. I there's I might as well be 7-Eleven. There are no <laughs> <laughs> they think I'm always uh, available. Um, with regard to opposing counsel, if you get abuse with emails, I would I would do respond, but I'm not going to respond to you and use language like that, much like Judge Walker talked about uh, holding a, treating an attorney like a child. I do the same thing. If you really want a response from me, you don't have to be sweet about it, but you have you can't be belligerent about it. And so I put them on notice. Many of uh, opposing counsel uh, have my cell phone number. They've not abused it. Only one did, and I told her. I, I said, you will, I will not be getting your text because she went into some tirade 
uh, with a bunch of words that I can't say, but I, I just said, this isn't an option anymore. Everything has to be emailed to me so that I can keep a record of this uh, because your behavior is out of control. And the last thing I would say in, is to people, especially younger people, your reputation means everything. Once you get reputation of being unreasonable, it will be very hard to undo that. Those are excellent tips. There's one other organization that I do want to highlight, and that's the Lawyers Assistance Program. It's an Illinois not-for-profit that's dedicated to helping Illinois judges, lawyers, and also importantly, law students get assistance with substance use, addiction, and mental health problems. And their number is 312-726-6607. And the email address is gethelp at illinoislap.org. And I wanted to make sure to include that because so many lawyers are struggling with their mental health right now. I'm sure many of you have read articles about the growing rates of suicide among lawyers. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that there are resources and those resources, they will help you regardless of financial situation or circumstances. And so often these cases of incivility are caused by people who have untreated mental health or untreated substance abuse issues. The email example we showed, the person had an undiagnosed mental health issue and they were actually during a manic episode, they sent all those emails. And so there is a very tight correlation between this, these kind of behaviors. If left untreated, they can spiral and cause issues within our justice system. So I just wanted to make sure to highlight that. We want to talk quickly now how courts, judges, and bar associations are handling incivility in their courtrooms. So some bar associations and states are adopting civility guidelines or rules. So Cook County in Chicago, uh, where Chicago sits is one of those that actually has in their local court rules a uh, rule requiring civility in the courtroom. Now, again, talking about when that's actually used, I have only seen one attorney in my practice actually use the rule of civility and file a motion under the rules of civility. And it was in a very extreme example of bullying um, by the other attorney. Um, but generally, um, although the guidelines often exceed the mandatory rules of professional conduct, um, the, and I think a lot of the times you need to understand they're voluntary, so you can't form the basis of a disciplinary charge or claim of professional conduct, but are still good for guidance. And I think the charge is really for the older attorneys to make sure the younger attorneys read them, are cognizant of them, and are aware of them. So there's two examples we wanted to highlight for you. The first is in Massachusetts. So the Massachusetts Bar Association has specific family law civility guidelines, which include that lawyers shall set a positive example for clients and encourage to set themselves uh, with, uh, with conduct that conduct themselves with dignity and civility, and that domestic relations cases are unique, uh, and a lawyer shall decline a client's request that a lawyer engage in rude offensive conduct towards other counsel parties or others involved in a case. Uh, the State Bar of California, has similar attorney guidelines for civility and professionalism, again, specifically for family law attorneys, because this is such a problem in family law. Um, and first is that in a family law proceeding, an attorney should seek to reduce emotional tension and trauma and encourage parties to interact in a cooperative atmosphere and keep the best interests of the children in mind. So, and then give some examples. First, that attorneys should discourage and not should not abet vindictive conduct. An attorney should treat all participants with courtesy and respect in order to minimize emotional intensity of a family dispute. An attorney representing a parent should consider the welfare of the minor child and seek to minimize the adverse impact of family law proceedings on a child. So again, looking at the reduction of emotional tension, don't add fuel to that fire. If your client is ramped up because the other parent dropped the kid off to basketball five minutes late, that does not warrant a filing of a petition for visitation abuse automatically. That is a relief under the statute. It is option. It, it is an option that is provided for under the statute. It does not mean you have to exercise that option for every little infraction. And again, looking at the best interest of the child because you are still dealing with a real life child in the case. And I think a lot of the times we try to separate ourselves so much from the proceeding 
that we go too far in the other direction and purely try to file on the law without regard to how this will actually impact the children. Judge Walker, can you share a little bit about what's happening right here in Cook County? Yeah, um, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some tips for how judges can handle incivility. Um, so Erica, the main thing is that lawyers don't want us to do nothing. Exactly. Um, our surveys that are done every, they have been done every seven years since the Commission on Professionalism was uh, created, uh, clearly indicate that attorneys want judges to do more. And so I sort of use an incremental approach, um, uh, starting off with an admonishment in open court. And of course, you know, open court has taken on a new meaning with everything being on Zoom. But you still oftentimes do have an audience on Zoom where you're not just talking to that particular lawyer that's out of control, but you're hoping that everybody else is listening as well. Um, so you want to stop the attorney from the offending conduct. You want to identify it. You know, counsel, that was purely based on what you just said to your opponent because she's so young or because she's a woman. Stop it. I'm not going to put up with that in this courtroom. Uh, and then, um, and then of course, admonish them. I don't want to, I don't want you to do that, you know, going forward. Um, that doesn't work. We've already talked about the timeout, right? I put them out in the hallway. I just say, cool off. You know, when you've got yourself together, let me know. I'll come back on the bench. We'll resume our proceedings. Um, then, of course, you know, the next step to me is if, if this is something that I've seen the same offender, the same lawyer kind of continue with these behaviors, I might call them into chambers. Of course, you got to be careful. No ex parte conversation. So nothing about the subject matter of the case. But certainly you can have a conversation with that lawyer about the offensive behavior you continue to observe in your courtroom and how you're not going to stand for it, you know, and that you maybe have been talking to your colleagues and it's not just you're in your courtroom that it's happening, but, you know, warn the lawyer how they can get in trouble if they don't um, get some control over themselves. You know, we can order things like, let's say it's outside of the courtroom, the offensive behavior and lawyers bring it to your attention that these horrible things are happening in depositions. There's name calling, there's abusive behaviors. Um, I can order that the deposition take place in my conference room, in my courtroom. And I'm right there so that if there's this stuff coming up, I can, they can let me know. I'll come in, I'll talk to them. Um, so that's a, a, a tool in our toolbox. Of course, I don't want to go to contempt. I sure as heck don't want to go there very quickly. And I have not had to uh, in my 14 years on the bench. Uh, the only time I've ever found somebody in contempt, it was for failure to pay child support. Usually the steps I've already outlined can handle it. Then we can go to, um, you know, disqualification from a case. I don't even know if lawyers realize this, but so my good friend and a former Winston and Strawn partner uh, now on the appellate court, Ray Mitchell, Judge Mitchell in 2013 disqualified Joel Brodsky and another lawyer from serving as lawyers in his case, the case before him for their deplorable behavior. He said months of courtroom disturbances, name calling to the extent where he had to have like four deputies in the courtroom at once. Well, can you imagine if he's got four, I probably have zero, okay? Because we're <laughs> short staff on deputies, right? So he just disqualified him from the case. Uh, so we can do that. And then let's talk about fines. And let's talk about my good friend on the federal bench, U.S. District Court, Northern District of Illinois, Judge Virginia Kendall, who will be our next chief judge of the federal courts here. In March of 2018, she finds the same lawyer, Joel Brodsky, $50,000 and ordered him to take ethics and anger management classes for his unprofessional, antagonistic behavior and vitriolic emails. So not just something that occurred in her presence, right? Emails. Um, and then unsurprisingly to those of you here and uh, visiting with us remotely, uh, in 2019, Joel Brodsky was suspended indefinitely by the Illinois Supreme Court. And then we can go to our next slide. Another tool in our toolbox in my division of the court here in Cook County anyway, is our rule 13.11. You've heard about the federal rule 11, right? So uh, this is our local rule, Circuit Court of Cook County. And Interestingly, it's only for the domestic relations division. Query, why is that? Do people think that nobody, that everybody else in all the other divisions of the court is civil at all times? But at any rate, we do have this rule. And this rule has been in place since April 1st of 2009. Uh, excerpts of the original rule are on the slide. I'll let you read that. 
But the bottom line is that it's directed to attorneys who are to treat the court, their opponents, and witnesses in a civil and courteous manner at all times, not just in court. And have you ever noticed that the first syllable of courteous is court? I didn't realize it until I was preparing for this. And they're to counsel their clients accordingly. This applies to scheduling and like what Attorney Trowbridge was talking about, requests for extensions, and it governs written and oral discovery. And then next slide. This is like hot off the presses practically because we amended Rule 13.11 in May of this year to include non-discrimination and anti-harassment provisions. This new Section D, it's all about those subjects. And I want to give you just a little bit of information about the genesis of the amendments to Rule 13.11. So those of you who practice in Chicago may have read about an, a divorce attorney and a very frequent GAL, David Pasolka. Uh, David Pasolka has now been charged criminally with sexual abuse of asso female associates. Um, he has been uh, criminally charged and uh, reported to the ARDC for um, basically telling women mothers of children where he was the GAL that, you know, I have ends with the judges of, uh, of the division here in Cook County. And, you know, I'm a frequent GAL and, and I can get the judge to uh, give you custody of your child, but you have to sleep with me. So um, the genesis was David Pasolka's behavior and the female attorneys who started coming out of the woodwork saying that he had sexually abused them, even including in conference rooms at the courthouse where he'd put him up against the wall and grope him. And they were afraid to, to report him, you know, especially younger women attorneys are, are, are frightened of the consequences if they report. And now they're like maybe 10 years down the road and they're realizing that they're feeling guilty that they could have spared his behavior toward a younger attorney. Um, and so that was really the genesis of this new section, but you, you can read it for yourself. It prohibits lawyers. It encourages, but doesn't mandate reporting, um, including to the JIB. So if you ask me, that means it applies to judges as well. Um, so those are just a few of the things I wanted to talk about are Rule 13.11. Um, do we have time for this? Do you think this next one? I think we probably don't because I okay. know that we stand between you and another great speaker and I think lunch and I met the speaker last night and he's phenomenal so we don't want to steal his time, but we do want to allow a little bit of time for audience Q&A and by a little bit I mean three to four minutes. I, I have I have our time limits right here. So I've been checking and trying to chart us along. I think we have three to four minutes if you have Q&A here. Don't disappoint me by asking no questions. That would be so disappointing. Okay. We have to go to the first question to you. Self-confession. Um, you know, despite my apparent youth, I've been practicing for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been guilty of a lot of the things you've talked about today. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to do better. There are a lot of catchwords, though, that I see that I think constitute uh, incivility. Um, I, 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 I see instances as recently as last week where opposing counsels said that the argument, argument does not meet the, the biggest straight face test in the world or suggesting that counsel hasn't read the cases they're citing or, um, or, or even the factual records. Uh, so attacks on opposing counsel's good faith, I see that in court a lot. And then outside of court, in depositions and settlement mediations, uh, emails, um, that's that's when the guardrails go down, uh, in, in my experience. And there you we see, uh, you know, sarcasm, um, just all out assaults on somebody's integrity. Uh, interrupting opposing counsel happens a lot, and I'm certainly guilty of that. But I'm I'm trying to reform. Um, so I see more of the incivility out, outside the courtroom. Um, inside the courtroom, one of my pet peeves was when opposing counsel says, well, as your honor knows, and then they announce some completely spurious legal or factual proposition. <laughs> and I want to, I want to interrupt and say, well, that's a bunch of BS, but I, use, I, I try to bite my tongue, but I, I see that all the time. I see 
uh, opposing counsel, they're uh, they're not uh, they're not addressing the court. They're addressing uh, e each other. Um, and then when I'm in court with my younger lawyers, um, which is almost everybody these days, I am still seeing a bullying of younger lawyers. Yeah, you know, just demeaning their preparation and their knowledge. So those are those are just some anecdotal. And I'm still I still see frequently just refusals to grant simple extensions of time. Somebody's sick, somebody's kid is at home. Um, now there are some extensions of time that you need to get the judge's approval because the judge has put that in a scheduling order, but mm -hmm. that you, you know, you still just stipulate to it. So those are just some observations uh, from the trenches. And I know you touched on a lot of them, but uh, it's, it's an ongoing problem. My last trial, Kimball, um, the lead attorney for the husband, his father died during trial. And I noticed when I took the bench that he wasn't there, but his um, associate was there. And um, I sort of inquired, well, that's what we need to talk to you about, Judge. And a great, I was very grateful that the opponent had right away had been notified before they came to court and said, don't worry, I'll support, obviously, your request for an extension of time. And I said, you better have, you know, <laughs> so, so, sometimes I even trot out in my courtroom, you know, don't go there. I was chair of the Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism for six years. It's not going to happen here. You know, sometimes I trot that out. Well, it's, I mean, it's a good, I think you you hit the nail on the head when you said lawyers want judges to be more active and taking the initiative because when you're sort of putting the burden on the person who is being targeted or being bullied, they are usually the person with the least amount of power. That's why they're often being bullied. The judge has the most amount of power in the courtroom and actually has the tools. Because when you hear we were talking about the different tools that a lawyer could use or a judge, lawyers have certain strategies to navigate. Judges have the power to stop the incivility. You did have another question over here. Oh, yes. In what form are you, are you talking about marriage reconciliation or are you talking about between attorneys, getting attorneys maybe to come in chambers and out sort of outside of the record, talk to them about how to reform their behavior and sort of reconcile? Okay. Um, I don't have clients that reconcile, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an answer to that. Yeah, Stephanie, Matt? <laughs> Practitioner. Yes, you have your comment ready. This is your moment. <laughs> yes. I think that it's really our job before we move ahead with a, a divorce to ask the client, are you sure this is what you want to do? Is reconciliation something you want to pursue? Um, because sometimes they don't know that it's a possibility, right? My wife filed, I have to go through with this. But you know, you don't, but there's a there's something called a reconciliation count. Mm -hmm. in Cook County that allows people to basically put their case on hold for six months while they explore the possibility of reconciliation. It stops all the deadlines, the clock keeps ticking. So reconciliation is a real, it's, it's something that should be explored by this case. And I often order reconciliation um, um, attempts when we have alienation between a parent and a child. Um, so uh, I do order a mental health professional to be involved and to try to um, rehabilitate those relationships. I practice um, both civil litigation and uh, white collar criminal defense. I always found in the white collar world, we're much more civil than actually the civil lawyers. One thing that I did notice over the years, and I would like to kind of get your view on it, um, Judge, is that when you have out-of-town lawyers who don't have the relationship with the bench or the opposing counsel or the U.S. attorney, whoever, they tend to be a little bit more scorched earth. And I think the judges could be um, hold some of the pro hoc, fiche kind of license at, at bay and also the local counsel accountable. And I don't see that happening a lot um, mm -hmm. generally because I think that the local counsel tries to be involved, but generally it's 
the outside counsel is generally handling the client relations and things like that. And yeah. I've, I've seen it rarely when a pro hoc reach a, you know, judge called them in and said, we're going to revoke your pro hoc unless you do something about that. And the fact that Illinois lawyers and Cook County lawyers get along is great, but I think the problem is bigger than that because to Matt's point, a lot of litigators come in and practice in jurisdictions that are normally don't appear. Yeah, that's true. So I don't see that in domestic relations, but I think that'd be something more commonly uh, seen in law and chancery divisions of our court system um, with pro hack Vichay. But you're absolutely right. Judges need to be more proactive in, um, in controlling their courtrooms. We have to set the tone for civility at all times. And um, calling out somebody uh, who is out of control, uh, overly aggressive, uncivil, who's a proact biche, and even to the point where you say, hey, if that behavior doesn't improve, I'm going to I'm gonna um, pull your right to practice before me. I sarcastically call domestic relations courts playgrounds. Um, you have to put the kids in place who are out of place, reward the kids who are behaving. Um, but, you know, it's only the judge can control that. Right. So I'm going to pose my final question, and I want each person to give just a very brief answer because I do want us to end on a positive note. This is this, it's all been positive. Given the growing incivility in society, what is one piece of advice or final takeaway that you would give for helping people cultivate civility, not just in the legal profession, but in their daily lives? Because as I think we all recognize, this isn't just about the legal profession. It's symptomatic of wider societal issues. So your final takeaway, hopeful piece. Um, I want you to reflect back on that Civility in America survey that we presented. Remember that women and minorities are those who are most impacted by incivility and become an ally. All of us can be allies. An ally is simply somebody who's in a greater position of power than the other person. Um, and we can, um, you know, so whatever ecosystem you might be in, like you're absolutely right. In a courtroom, the judge is the person who's imbued with the most power. So how can we be allies? I say things like, an ally can call out inappropriate uh, speech or conduct. An ally gives credit where credit is due. You, you were an ally earlier to your staff, Erica. Um, how many times, um, I know that probably every woman in this room and online has had this experience. You're on a board and you're in a board meeting and there's a question posed about a solution for something. And the woman brings up a wonderful solution and nobody says a word. Five minutes later, the man in the room says pretty much the same dang thing the woman had just said. And everybody's like, oh, that's a great idea, Brad. I, I, I went, you know, and then you're like, so if you're in charge of the room, you say, well, that's what Sharon just said five minutes ago. That's being an ally. OK, and we can all be allies in our daily lives to make things better. Attorney Trowbridge? I would say take a step back, uh, try to recognize when you are too personally involved um, and uh, either withdraw from the case, get uh, help from someone else. But I, I have a very high tolerance for incivility of domestic relations because I think it's got to be one of the worst areas of law to practice in, given the emotions and younger attorneys needing to get the right results so they climb the ladder at their firms or people who have their own law firms who need an outcome or feel the pressure to get an outcome so they get a referral. Uh, it's mm -hmm. your livelihood you know, depends sometimes on your client's satisfaction. But you also have to take care of yourself. Otherwise, there won't there won't be a lawyer practicing. And we're going to give Professor Tang the last word. A lot of pressure. Um, I, I'd say I'm on top of the formal mentorship opportunities. Serve as a role model in your everyday life, and just be an informal mentor. I'm going to call Matt Kirsch out now since he's in the audience. I mean, he has been an informal model throughout my practice in family law as someone who has been very respectful to others, who has always given a voice to uh, the, the younger attorneys and, and built them up. And he's not my formal mentor. We've never had a formal bar association mentorship, but 
uh, being able to see that there are people in the profession that have those values is really inspirational for younger attorneys to say, okay, I had a really bad day with this one attorney, but I, on the whole, I see that our profession has really great ideals that they're valuing and they're really trying to do good work. And I know when I was a GAL in a lot of my cases and being able to serve with him, even when we had one case where we had eight different opposing attorneys who are all terrible and all really mean uh, uh, and, and not civil at all. I think having someone else on that to, to say, yes, I also see this really bad behavior by the opposing attorney and to, and to be that support system is really invaluable. So just keep that in mind that people are watching you, even if you aren't their formal mentor. And Matt Kirsch is also a University of Illinois College of Law. <laughs> well, let's let's give him a round of applause too. Thank you to our panelists for an exceptional discussion. Thank you all for loading Slido and participating. And our contact information is up there. If you didn't get to ask a question, feel free to contact any of us. Thank you so much. Erica, that was a, that was a fabulous panel. Thank you and. Uh, uh, it, I learned a lot, and it also brought back a lot of bad memories um, of my of my own poor behavior. Uh, so, but thank you. Uh, we have another Kirsch here, who's going to be the keynote speaker shortly. We're going to take about five minutes, hopefully, to quickly grab some food. Um, and with apologies to Judge Clark, Kirsch, we're probably going to be clanking a little bit while he is speaking. But we'll resume in, I guess. Um, uh, we'll, we'll say about uh, 20, 20 till um, 20 till one. Um, Judge Kirsch, um, be on your best behavior because not only do you have an audience here in person, there's a large virtual audience as well, and this is being recorded. So uh, let, we'll be right back. Thank you. Which door? Emma, which door is being entered? Okay. Judge Walker. Thank you. 
Have a good weekend. It's nice to see you. Michigan. They're going to get killed. They're going to get killed. I, I didn't play well against Nebraska. Granted. Um, and we should have beat them. Granted, but you never know. I don't think we should have done that. Indiana has played bad in five games. So we'll see.
Okay, let's everyone take a seat and we'll, it uh, looks like um, people have their lunches and we'll um, resume our program here. Um, as I mentioned, we have a, a, our next speaker is uh, another Kirsch, uh, Thomas Kirsch II. Um, Tom started his career uh, in public service and is back to public service. Uh, he started his career, I think, as an assistant U.S. attorney, and then he came to practice at Winston and Strawn, where several of us in the room had the um, pleasure to work with him. Uh, he was with us for about a, a decade, had an enormously successful practice here. I was personally very disappointed to lose him, but he went back into public service when he was asked to become the U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Georgia, and um, I think you did, the, or Indiana, yeah, got Georgia on my mind, I got Georgia on my mind, Indiana, yeah, and um, um, I think, Tom, you did that for three years, maybe, if I have the chronology correct, and then an, an opening uh, appeared in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, and uh, Tom was appointed, um, so I, I, I stay in touch with Tom a lot, and I've been asking him, oh, how's the new job going? And uh, and um, and I think one of the more interesting things he told me, other than how the court was handling COVID and all that, was that um, he has, he. I think these are the words he used, he's now learning new areas of law through a fire hose because he grew up as a criminal prosecutor and a criminal defense lawyer, and now he's um, hearing and deciding cases involving the whole gamut of subject matter that appears before the federal courts, which is very, very broad. So um, he's now an expert on everything, immigration law, antitrust law, uh, tax law, and um, um, I hope he's an expert on judicial ethics, because that's what I asked him to talk about today. So without uh, further ado, uh, our friend Judge Tom Kirsch. Thank you, Kimball. So before I start talking about judicial ethics, I'll tell you, when I started as a judge, Kimball was right. There are so many areas of the law that we deal with on the Seventh Circuit that I had no experience in. And, and every judge is the same way. I was a young, a new judge, and I was sitting with one of my colleagues who had been there for a long time, and we had a railroad case. And I know nothing about railroad law, but we had a railroad case. And the lawyers were arguing the case and talking in all these acronyms, because you know every specialty, Social Security, have all these acronyms. And I thought, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how I'm gonna be able to follow this. And my colleague said, a, a, a lesson for all you lawyers, all the young lawyers, particularly online, said, counsel, stop, stop, stop talking. He said, we are generalist judges. It does you no good to come into the United States Court of Appeals and speak in a random assortment of capital letters. <laughs> I'm glad he said that. You probably know who I'm referring to, but I was glad he said that because I was thinking the exact same thing. So it has been it has been a learning experience uh, for me, and I'm happy to talk about judicial ethics, which is a subject I've come to know actually quite well because of my numerous conflicts as a former United States attorney, which create particular issues and problems for me in the in the conflict realm, which I'll talk a little bit about, but, but just think about the following, uh, which I have to deal with. When I left being U.S. attorney, there were hundreds of ongoing investigations of which I knew nothing. The U.S. attorney doesn't know every time it, the U.S. attorney's officer and assistant U.S. attorney opens a file. But I was actually the lawyer. I am the lawyer that represents the United States of America in that investigation. 
And if an individual is later indicted, maybe a year or two years after I leave the U.S. Attorney's Office, and then is uh, convicted and appeals five years after I've been on the Court of Appeals, I have a conflict of interest. I have an actual conflict of interest because I represented one of the parties in the litigation. Um, but I would not know that unless it was brought to my attention. So we've got a process in place for dealing with that, which is a very complicated process. But the defendant won't even know of the actual conflict because the defendant may not know when the investigation was open. So I've come to learn a lot about conflicts. And I want to talk a little bit about the conflict rules and the applicable canons. And conflicts really, I think, in my mind, boil down to threats to the independence of the judiciary. And I want to I want to give you some things to think about about things that I think are threats to the independence of the judiciary beyond uh, be, beyond conflicts. I'm not going to talk about state court judicial systems. I'm going to focus particularly on the federal judicial systems because elections uh, muck things up too much with respect to conflicts and the independence of the judiciary. Most, most of what I'm going to say applies equally to state court judges, and most states have a system of elections of judges that generally, generally speaking, results in some form of lifetime tenure because it's very difficult. I know in Indiana, there are retention elections every 10 years or so, and I don't know how many judges in Indiana have lost retention election, but I bet it's less than a handful. Um, but I don't want to get into the state election system. So conflict con conflicts questions can be difficult. And when, when I started as a judge, one of the things that I quickly realized is there, there's co-equal obligations. One obligation is to sit on the case when you don't have a conflict. And one obligation is to recuse yourself from the case when you do have a conflict. Judges should not and do not reflective, re reflectively recuse themselves or reflexively recuse themselves if they think they have a conflict. And the conflict rules can be very complicated when it creates an appearance of impropriety. For instance, I teach a law school class at the University of Chicago Law School. So does that mean when the University of Chicago hospital is sued, should I recuse myself? I don't. OK, some judges might. Some judges view it differently. Uh, if their spouse is employed by an institution, does the spouse recuse? Does the judge recuse themselves just because the spouse is is um, employed by that institution? I'll give you an example. Amy Barrett, when she was on the Seventh Circuit, her husband, Jesse Barrett, was a colleague of mine. He was an assistant U.S. attorney in South Bend. So did she recuse from all Department of Justice cases because he worked for the Department of Justice? No, she didn't correctly in my view, but um, that would have been way too overbroad in terms of recusal. So it becomes, it becomes thorny and judges have to proceed deliberately in making these decisions. And it's up to the judge. That's the other thing, you know, I, I get advice, talk about advisory opinions, but a lot of times the general counsel's office will tell me, here's what we can tell you. Okay. And then it's up to you. You have to make the decision do you, do you recuse or do you not? It all starts with a federal statute. 28 U.S.C. 455 is the recusal statute. And the recusal statute broadly, broadly applies and says any judge shall disqualify himself in any proceeding in which his impartiality might reasonably be questioned. It's 455A. That's the big test. May your impartiality be reasonably questioned. And then there are specific examples. Judges shall disqualify in the following circumstances. He has a personal bias or prejudice concerning a party. The courts have interpreted that as actual bias. You have an actual bias, not an appearance, but an actual bias. Personal knowledge of the disputed evidentiary facts. Served as a lawyer on the case. Served in governmental capacity as counsel. Or he, his spouse, or minor children. The, the statutes are written this way. I'm quote, quoting the statute. I'm just referring to her. He, that's other written has a financial interest in the subject matter in controversy or in a party. So there's two general categories for mandatory recusal. You can't sit in a case in which you were a lawyer or a witness. That's what I was describing earlier, which is much more complicated for me as a former United States attorney 
than it is for a lawyer who have may, may have spent their career in academia or in private practice where it's a little bit easier to tell if you have particular conflicts. That's easy. That's very straightforward. You know, it's just you can't sit if you are a lawyer largely for the same reasons that lawyers can't represent both sides to a litigation. You can't represent the plaintiff and a year later think actually the plaintiff doesn't have a real good case. I'm going to switch over and represent the defendant. You can't do that. And judges can't do that either. You can't preside over a case in which you have a financial stake in. That becomes much more difficult. I'm going to spend some time talking about, on that in a few minutes and particularly reflecting on the Wall Street Journal reporting regarding uh, financial conflicts of district judges. You may have all seen that. It resulted in legislation, uh, which may or may not be helpful. Uh, but I want to talk about that Wall Street Journal piece and some of the conflicts that it, what, that, it, that it entailed. Everything else is generally related to appearance. And this is where the decisions become difficult. We recently issued an opinion in the Seventh Circuit in a case called the United States versus Walsh. And I can't say all that much. I don't want to say too much about it because the defendant filed a petition for rehearing in Bonk. There were, there was, I was in the majority uh, with Judge Scudder and Judge Jackson and Cumi recused. But it's a difficult case. In that case, uh, a defendant was being sentenced in front of Judge Feinerman. Judge Feinerman was the district court judge. And before the defendant was sentenced, actually, Judge Feinerman, the facts were that Judge Feinerman told the defendant what he anticipated the defendant's sentence was going to be, and the defendant didn't take too well to that, and said some very nasty things to Judge Feinerman over a long period of transcript pages. And Judge Feinerman then took a break in the sentencing hearing and came back uh, a few weeks later and made some findings of fact and increased what the defendant's sentence was going to be. Um, and the defendant actually received a life sentence. The defendant appealed and said that there, that there was an appearance of impropriety in Judge Feinerman continuing to sit because of the horrible things the defendant had said to him at sentencing. And uh, of course, you can't create conflicts of interest. And so we largely decided the case on the basis of that, uh, on that basis that he had uh, that he, Judge Feinerman had found that he had done this deliberately in an, in an attempt or an effort to get a new judge to sentence him. And so we affirmed the conviction. But Judge Jackson Acumi wrote a very persuasive dissent in which she dis discussed 455A and the appearance of impropriety. Um, so th those can be difficult, difficult cases. Beyond the statute, judges are guided by the canons of judicial ethics. The administrative office of the U.S. courts publishes a code of conduct for judges. There are five canons and rules or comments that were governed by, but they're very, very broad, and I'm going to tell you what they are. Judges have to uphold the integrity and independence of the judiciary, avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety, perform her duties fairly, impartially, and diligently. Judges may engage in judicial activities consistent with her judicial obligations, and judges should refrain from political activity. The, the administrative office issues advisory opinions and advises judges on what to do in these situations. So when I have a question about a potential conflict, and it comes up often, and I'll give you an example, I reach out to the general counsel's office at the administrative office, and they then provide me with guidance, but ultimately it's up to my, it's, it's up to me. But one of the first issues I dealt with as a former United States attorney, there's a national association of former United States attorneys. And I actually wanted to join this organization. I'm sure BJ is a member of this organization and I wanted to join. And it's, it's, it's all former United States attorneys that do conferences and get together and you see your friends. And I called the general counsel's office and I said, can I join this organization? And they politely told me no. Now they said you can because you can do whatever you want. You, you can join the organization, but we advise you not to. And they sent me advisory opinions that had been written as to why not to join. But the advice that I got was it could show favoritism toward the government or towards the prosecution. And my argument that was, well, wait a minute, all these folks are now defense lawyers. They're all, they're, they were United States attorneys, but now they all is all it's a defense bar organization. It's not a I mean, it's not an anti-government organization, right? But it's not a governmental organization or pro-prosecution organization. It, if anything, it's a pro-defense prosecution. 
But their advice to me was that it is, it's too close to the line, that you just shouldn't do it. And we have advised every former United States attorney who has taken the bench not to join the organization. And they said, and by the way, none have. So if you join, you will be the first. Or maybe one did when it was first, when it was, when it was first started. Um, and so I didn't join. So I didn't join the organization, but the GC's office acts as a repository of these sort of best practices. Each circuit has a particular judge assigned, an Article III judge, usually a district judge, who is sort of the ethics counselor for judges. So we can call that person and um, get advice from that from that particular judge, um, or if we ask for a formal advisory opinion, there are judges that are appointed that sit on these commit committees by the AO that will issue formal advisory, but they're just advisory opinions saying this is how it should be handled. And these are these are these are real issues that come up. And it's very interesting, like the conflict issue that I raised earlier about should I recuse myself if the University of Chicago uh, Medical School is sued? Should I recuse myself if the University of Chicago legal clinic is involved in the case on a pro bono basis on behalf of one party or another? And the University of Chicago pays me. And they have all kinds of advisory opinions that say, here's what you should consider. Here are the facts that you should consider. If it's, if it's a small school, you probably should recuse. University of Chicago hospitals is an international organization independent from the law school. So it's totally different. And the appearance, the questioning of the appearance of impropriety is um, totally different. Can judges sit on a board of trustees of a university? The answer is generally yes. If it's a private university, generally no, if it's a public university, because you can't be involved in any state policy making. And of course, a trustee at Indiana University lobbies the Indiana General Assembly. Right. So I should not be a trustee at Indiana University. But if I wanted to be a trustee at Denison University, for instance, that's a whole different kettle of fish. So these questions come up and they're difficult to deal with. But the advisory opinions from the AO are very helpful in this regard. So I want to talk a little bit about financial conflicts and I want to talk about the Wall Street Journal article, which people are very interested in. I think the Wall Street Journal reporting, this is just my view. This is not the view of the courts or any other judge or the circuit or anything like that. And part of this is informed by my years as U.S. attorney um, and how the U.S. attorney's office has held, handled financial conflicts, particularly when U.S. attorneys who come from private practice own stock in individual companies. And the individual company may be a witness or may be a victim. And, and that happens a lot. And it happens a lot more frequently than you would think. Like Microsoft, for instance is a frequent victim. They're victims of hacks or victims of spyware or whatever the case may be. Um, oftentimes, by the time the U.S. Attorney's Office gets around to either determining who did it or investigating or prosecuting it, of course, Microsoft has fixed the problem. Microsoft has disclosed the problem. If there was any even blip in Microsoft's stock price because of the problem, it's long gone. And any particular prosecution, um, in, in the vast majority of cases, there's almost zero chance that it's going to affect the stock price. But should the U.S. Attorney's Office or should the U.S. Attorney be recused in those cases, which is a, a difficult thing. And it's, it's weird. People reflectively think, I think, well, yeah, it's just easier to recuse the U.S. Attorney and have it handled by the first assistant, but not so much. Because in the real world, the first assistant is sitting right next to the U.S. attorney in the office right next door, and the criminal chief is right down the hall. And the first assistant is absolutely the acting U.S. attorney. There's no question about it. There is When I was recused from a case, and I was recused from cases where I actually represented the defendant, on, when I was at Winston Strong, I represented the defendant, then I became the U.S. attorney, and I'm recused. Nobody asked me what I think about the case. Never, ever, ever. That would be so improper that no one even thinks of it. But I read about it. I would read about the case in the newspaper. OK, so, I, oh, I didn't even know that so and so was going to be sentenced, but he was sentenced and he got 30 months. That's interesting. But the newspaper never distinguished. They had no idea that I was conflicted out of the case. Right. So the newspaper would reflect me. 
I was the U.S. attorney. My office sentenced this individual. So there's always this in the in the back of your mind. If things go poorly, it's the U.S. attorney that is ultimately going to face sort of the heat for that. And, and the first assistant knows that and the criminal chief knows that. My point is just there's a good reason for not recusing the United States attorney and not saying, hey, you, the easy thing is to recuse the U.S. attorney and you're done. It's the same principle with a judge. If we had, if all of the judges that taught at the University of Chicago Law School on the Seventh Circuit recused themselves, from every University of Chicago case or every University of Chicago medical school case, it would probably be the same three judges that would be deciding every single University of Chicago medical school case. I'm not, that's certainly not the way it's supposed to work. And would that be fair to the university? Maybe the university would love it. Maybe they wouldn't. Would it be fair to plaintiffs bringing those actions? Maybe they would love it and maybe they wouldn't. But there's a reason we have random assignment of a panels in federal appeals is you don't want to draw the exact same panel every single time with a particular defendant or a particular plaintiff. So the Wall Street Journal article focuses on where judges presided over cases where they had a financial conflict. The, and, and the, the reporting at the time, I had just become a judge when this reporting came out, the way the, the, way the reports were written, it looked terrible. It, it made judges look, judges are ruling on cases in which they had a financial conflict all the time. But if you look in the, in the, in the, into the details of the reporting, it's not what it, that's not what it was. That's not what it was reporting. There, despise, out of all the cases, the wall street journal identified dispositive motions were ruled on in only 21% of those cases. So it's not an insignificant number, but four out of five cases in which they identified they were not dispositive rulings. The other thing they did is they didn't disaggregate cases that were referred to a magistrate judge. So a district judge may have entered no orders in the case because the case was filed, a magistrate judge was assigned, a district judge was assigned, the magistrate judge entered orders on the case, the district judge had a financial conflict and had not yet recused herself or himself from the case. And, um, and that was not accounted for in those proceedings. The other thing is, as, as all of you know, as, as practicing lawyers, a lot of a, a case gets filed in the district court and the judge, the, I don't know any judge at the Seventh Circuit or at any circuit or at any at any district court that thinks, oh, let me see what was filed today. Let me see what was assigned to me today. We don't do that. OK, so district judges, they they're, they're, they rule when they need to rule. So there may be orders that are being entered, routine orders that are even being entered by the clerk's office on cases under the judge's name before the judge has an opportunity to consider whether or not there's a financial conflict in the case. It may be that the judge has a subsidiary holding that creates a conflict that the judge was unaware of at the time it was filed. That happens all the time, by the way, with us. You just don't know it because we don't publish our panels in advance. So the way it works for me is I have a financial recusal list. So every company in which I own stock or my kids or my wife is on a list. The clerk's office has that list. So when a case gets filed, they run it for conflicts. And then they, of course, they don't recuse me. They just identify the potential conflict for me. And then my secretary will tell me I have a conflict or not. Um, she has the list. So she checks all the cases to ensure there's no financial conflict. My law clerks all have the list. So any case that they work on, they check that list and they check the subsidiaries. And then of course, inside the briefs, we have the disclosures. We have, we have the disclosures. So I check it. So when I get down to sit and work on the case, I check it and to see if I have a financial conflict. So it's, it's very sophisticated in the manner in which we determine whether there are financial conflicts. One thing that, um, but they do slip through and they, they sometimes slip through with subsidiaries, a subsidiary of a particular company that will not be on the list. Now, I'll own AT&T, for instance. And AT&T may have a subsidiary that is not on the list, but if it's a wholly owned subsidiary of AT&T, I would have a conflict. 
But sometimes I, when I was my first term, I caught that the night before oral argument, the night before. And so a judge, a different judge sat for me on that particular case that particular day. But that happens from time to time. But they're 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 caught. So the Congress passes a new law, Courthouse, Courthouse Ethics and Transparency Act. And I don't want to bore you on the details but with this, but it basically brings the judiciary in line with the disclosure requirements for other branches of government, like I had when I was U.S. attorney. And the big change, we have financial disclosure obligations as judges to begin with. But the bigger change, which may be helpful, is requires uh, the tra- requires reporting of transactions within 45 days of the transaction. Mutual funds are excluded. So it's just stock. Um, but the, but the problem is, is, um, spinoffs, you know, that you don't always catch. So if you own, let's say you own a bunch of Hewlett Packard and Hewlett Packard spins off a subsidiary. And so now you own a hundred shares of some subsidiary that you don't even know exists. That's a reportable transaction. So it will require judges to look at their financial holdings and financial statements on a regular basis. If a judge just decides to buy a thousand shares of Microsoft, it's obvious that that needs to be reported. The more difficult stuff is when things are happening in financial accounts of which you're unaware. And it also makes it easier to obtain these reports online. It used to be that a party or an individual who wanted a financial disclosure report of the judge had to make the request. And then the judge was made aware of the request. And that was always for finance, for, for security reasons. Okay. We get a lot of sort of filings in the, in the court that are borderline threatening. And of course, me being U.S. attorney, I see, I get a lot of threats still, and we get threats. I'm going to kill the United States attorney and the marshals. They don't know if that means the current U.S. attorney that, that was it the U.S. attorney that prosecuted the guy, or is it the assistant U.S. attorney? Does the, does the, there's a person making the threat even know the difference? But of course, they have to take them seriously. We get filings like that in the courts, not that I'm going to kill the judges, but there are very, very anti-government or anti-judicial system. So this this process was in place in part to assure the safety of these judges. Now that is gone. So folks can obtain these things without disclosing who's requesting it. One, One thing where I think this might be helpful is for parties to bring to the attention of a district court judge. You can't do this in the Seventh Circuit because we don't disclose our panels. But now attorneys will be able to bring bring to the attention of the district court judge. Judge, you 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 have a financial conflict here. You we are actually we wholly own this particular subsidiary that, according to your financial disclosures, your wife owns stock in, and you have a financial disclosure, and you need to recuse. So that's. Um, so, so, so that's very interesting. Now, the other thing is the financial conflict. One thing the Wall Street Journal doesn't talk about is the financial conflict and the overwhelming majority of these cases where judges ruling, where judges are ruling, there will be absolutely no effect on the stock price or on the share price, which is the purpose of the financial conflict. But there's no effect or could be no effect on the stock price. Then, of course, it boils down to the appearance of impartiality, right? Which is kind of where we started. But if it's an undisclosed conflict and nobody knows of it, how could it affect the appearance of impartiality? It can't, nobody knows. Um, so I want to I want to talk about, I want to, I want to finish, and I just want to give you two things, two thoughts that I have that are threats, in my view, that are threats to the independence of the judiciary that probably don't receive as much attention and probably should be receive a little bit more attention. Um, maybe from, I think, more serious academics than just p- pundits. One is the effect of the filibuster on judicial confirmations and the nomination process. In 2014, the filibuster was absolved for uh, district judges and circuit judges. And then in 2017, it was got done away with for Supreme Court justices. So the result is that you can now, a judge can be confirmed with 51 votes, including, of course, we know the vote of the vice president. So there's no longer a need for bipartisan support for confirmation. It used to be that a judge who wanted to be on the Court of Appeals and was a district court judge or a bankruptcy judge, 
they had to have a great reputation in the community, right? When they were, when the senators of the White House was calling around saying, who should we nominate for the Sixth Circuit in Ohio? They were not going to nominate a district court judge who had, who couldn't get confirmed. They wanted folks that could get confirmed. But I'm wondering how that will change and what effect this will have on nominating or appointing judges that are moderate or could garner bar bipartisan support. You think you know the, the president, whether it's Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter, is political. Senators are political. And you know, there are probably not a ton of them. There's probably not a lot of Republican senators out there that say, well, here's what I really want to do. I want to nominate a moderate who is going to get 80 votes in the Senate. The Democrats are probably not going to say, I want to vote, vote, uh, nominate a moderate who can get 80 votes in the Senate. I mean, if there are 54 Democratic senators and a Democratic president, the president is probably going to say, I want to appoint someone who sees the world the way I do. And I just wonder what effect that will have long term on the appointment of judges. I also wonder what effect it will have on the long term, uh, how judges are promoted, either from the bankruptcy court or the magistrate court to the district court or from the district court to the circuit court. And will the absence of the, the, the filibuster and the need for bipartisan support affect how judges are selected and uh, nominated and appointed? And I think that's an interesting issue that has not received a ton of attention. The other thing that I think this is an, that is an interesting issue that doesn't receive a lot of attention is judicial salaries. And I mentioned this, I, I want to start out by saying, I just want to spend two minutes on this, but I'm, I'm going to come at this from a different perspective. Judges make a lot of money. Okay. I mean, relative to the American people, judges make a lot of money uh, and judges are paid for the rest of their life, which is important because if you're insured of a salary for the rest of your life, you don't have to worry about leaving the bench, right? That's, that's the idea. That's why judges are paid for the rest of their life. But I'm sort of lucky and I'm, I'm a little bit of an outlier, but I spent 10 years at Winston Strawn and Winston Strawn treated me very well. OK, so but not every judge has spent 10 years at Winston Strawn. Not every judge lives in Indiana. Okay, I live in Sherryville, Indiana. Some of you may know where that is. It's right across the border. It's a suburb. But if, for those of you that live in Illinois, my property taxes are way less than yours. OK, my state income taxes are way less than yours. So and if you live in I make the exact same amount of money as a circuit judge on the Second Circuit that lives in New York City. and. The issue is not with the amount of money that judges make, but it's is the amount of money and not keeping up with sort of where median salaries have gone. Is it going to cause judges, particularly younger judges? We see this when we've seen this now for 20 years, younger and younger judges being appointed, judges in their 30s being appointed to the district court. In 20 years, are they going to monetize the position and say, look, I'm going to leave? And if if that's the case, like, you don't want that, right? We don't want that in the federal judiciary. We don't want judges on the bench thinking, boy, you know, I might want to do this in the future. And if I want to do this, how does that affect how I might rule on particular cases or how I might rule with, with respect to particular, not cases, but Boy, I, I, you know, I want to go, I'm just going to make this up. I'd love to go work for Major League Baseball. Okay? I'd love to go work for Major League Baseball. But in every union case, if I rule for the union, what is the Players Association going to say if I am under consideration to work for Major League Baseball? Like that, that's the issue. And the statistics, one of my law clerks very helpfully Grab, grab some very helpful data for me, which I'll which I'll give you. That since 2000, district judges' salaries not adjusted for inflation have increased by 54 percent since 2000. Let me give you some other statistics since then. Since 2000, the median median household income has increased by 68 percent. The median home price has increased by 155 percent. Okay, so this is where it gets real interesting. First year compensation for associates at the AMLAW 100 firms has increased by 88%. Fourth year total compensation, 118%. Eighth year total compensation, 136%. And equity profits per partner, 236%. So district judge salary increases aren't even keeping up with 
the median household income increases. Um, and like I said, I, I'm not saying this to complain about the amount of money that judges make. Uh, first of all, because I'm fairly lucky, okay? I mean, like I said, I, I'm a little bit of an outlier in the fact that I spent 10 years at this firm and then the fact that I live in a, in a very low cost of living state, but not every judge does that. And I'm also 48 years old. I'm not 35. So I, I don't, I don't worry about that. My kids are going to be in college, but they're, they're essentially grown. They're not little kids that I'm, you know, worried about that stuff anymore. But I just wonder what, what, how this could affect or what impact this could have on the independence of the judiciary if we are continuing to appoint younger and younger judges and judges think about, you know, am I going to leave the bench and event and monetize this position? That makes me nervous with respect to how does that reflect on or how does that impact the independence of the judiciary? So those are my thoughts. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I, I try to keep this to a half hour. I'm a little bit over, but I, yes, Kimball. I'm fine, but you know, with apologies to that panel that kept taking a few questions. I have one. You, uh, you talked about the federal judicial, the code of judicial conduct for federal judges. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it does not apply to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, should it? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. I don't know if it applies. I know 455A applies. I don't know whether the code of conduct applies to the Supreme Court or not. It, it's just not, I just don't know. Okay. Yes, Scott. You mentioned as far as the conflicts coming in with the, uh, the U.S. Attorney for the North Division. And you said that you did conflict it out potentially because as far as the pending investigation, you said hundreds of them. Is it only those regarding your district or is it the entire country that theoretically you could be conflicted? That's a good question. Only my district, only my district. And what I did when I started, um, I don't know if this is public or not. It doesn't matter. But when I started as, as, as a judge, I had, I had a blanket two year recusal from all cases from the Northern district of, of Indiana in a blanket two year recusal from all cases in which Winston and strong was involved. No, that's what I did. And, and that's what they suggested. And so I recused myself from all Winston Strawn cases and all U.S. attorney cases for two years. So that means if a case, and there are plenty of them, case was indicted last year while I was a judge, the defendant pled guilty and has appealed. I'm not conflicted off of that case based on the statute, but because of my two-year window, I'm conflicted off. And the same thing with Winston Strawn, you know, when we get, there are lawyers, many of you know, that I would never sit on an appeal if they filed an appearance in the case. Never, even if they were in the district court. Um, but there are other lawyers at Winston Strong. I don't even know. You know, I never. I, we we see cases with Winston Strong lawyers from California and New York and Washington D.C. I don't know who these folks are, and they may not have been at Winston and Strong even when I was here as a partner. So that that will expire in December, um, and I'll hear those cases. But for some lawyers, I'll never hear them. Yes, B.J. Yeah, what about personal? Where's the line? Like, what's close enough for you to say goes to the parents? I need to speak for myself. Boy, that's a great question, and I really struggle with that. Okay, because because and I'll to tell you honestly, there are a lot of cases in which um, I worked as when I was at Winston Strong. I worked as a defense lawyer, and I worked very closely with other defense lawyers who routinely practice in the federal courts in Chicago. And they may file an appearance in, on, you know, in favor of the, um, they may file an appearance and in, in argue on behalf of the defendant. And I typically don't recuse myself from those cases unless I'm a very close personal friend of the individual. It's a little bit easier, you know, John Laos, John Laos, you were in Chicago and John Laos and I have been friends since the days we were in private practice. And he and I, we were, we were U.S. attorneys. We worked on a lot of the same cases together because of the proximity between the Northern and Northern District of Illinois and Northern District of Indiana. But I don't recuse from those cases, even though he's the lawyer that is, you know, at least nominally representing the United States. I say that, you know what I mean by that? I mean, he is the lawyer representing the United States, but he's not the lawyer in there arguing the case. 
Uh, but to me, that so much doesn't matter. The fact that he's not there, it's still his case, right? So that that becomes much more difficult. I think if it if it was a lawyer uh, that that I I mean I give you an example. There was a there was a case involving Lake County politics, and the lawyers involved in the case, or or some of the lawyers that were involved in the case, I'm very close friends with. I mean, personal friends, play golf with, go on vacation with. I recuse myself from that case. I just don't think it's proper to have that type of relationship. But I do know so many prosecutors and lawyers, like you said, especially in Chicago, that it would be difficult to recuse in all of those cases. And then you get into a situation, what if every judge does that? You know, are you drawing the same? You know, if, if every criminal case was decided by the same three judges, that would be probably unfair to one party or the other. Yes. Without making it localized to you, are there any judges that, even though they come to the conclusion that they're not going to disqualify or accuse themselves, that they still go and tell the other side just to let you know I've had this other case or the same case with another, you know, or a different case with this attorney years ago, just to put it on the public record so there's no blowback at some later point? Yes, that happens all the time on the district court, but not on the circuit court. There's just no process for that. The district court, that would happen all the time. Even, even when, when I was U.S. attorney, a judge may say, look, the U.S. attorney has entered his personal appearance in this case, and he's going to prosecute this case, just so the defendant knows. I know him very well. I mean, he and I are friends. We work together in the U.S. attorney's office. It's not going to cause me any prejudice. And usually the defense lawyer, who is probably someone that is relatively local or practices in court, says, oh, judge, of course, we waive any conflict and we don't see any we don't see any potential conflict, but they do put it on. They do put it on the record because there's really no, there's no, there's no ability to do that. There's no ability to ask for a waiver. It's, it's an interesting thing with conflicts, by the way. The Seventh Circuit is the only circuit that does not disclose panels in advance. I think every other circuit discloses panels in advance, which would allow for parties to say you have a conflict, which would make it far easier for me particularly dealing with the U.S. Attorney's Office, because we wouldn't have to do it through the clerk's office, which is what we're doing through the clerk's office in Northern Indiana and the clerk's office for the Seventh Circuit, identifying any potential conflicts that I might have. But it would be easier if the U.S. Attorney's Office could just file a motion, at least for me. You know, we published the panel, U.S. Attorney's Office files a motion, says Kirsch is recused, and that'd be the I'd be out. Yes. So that so that's very interesting. They can tell you. I so in, in it's a it's a weird thing. If you've clerked for a judge, um, you know it's an extremely intimate relationship in chambers. I mean, you 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 have to be able to speak freely with your clerks. You have to be able to be wrong with your clerks. You have to be able to say things to your clerks that if you are going to say in mixed company, someone might look at it and think, "Oh, this is what? Why would he or she say that?" So it's a very intimate relationship. Uh, there's also confidentiality within the chambers. So the clerks do not disclose to anybody else what I'm thinking. But in the Seventh Circuit, most of the judges, including me, we actually have very good relationships among the other judges. And my clerks will talk to other judges' clerks about cases, for, you know, judges that are on the panel. But the way they do it is I'm happy for them to talk to the other judges' clerks about what they're thinking. Um, but not about what I'm thinking. So they'll say, I think there might be a jurisdictional problem here. What do you think? Well, did you go back and look at this case? It's very helpful because we want to get to the right result. Uh, but I don't, they don't disclose what I'm thinking. And what was the second part of your question? I oh, for, for, so with respect to the employment. Uh, oh, yes. Stop, yes. I, I let them do that. So some judges do not. So, some judges have strict policies. They do not want their clerks to uh, uh, commit to a particular employer before their clerkship is over. I don't do that. I allow the clerks to accept employment, um, but then they're recused. So I tell them, but but their, their conflicts are not imputed to me, okay? So I have a law clerk that accepts a job at Sidley, let's say. I mean, one of my law clerks last year went to Sidley. He was a summer associate at Sidley, accepted the job at Sidley, and he went to Sidley. He does not work on Sidley matters, but I do. And even if he was to work on a Sidley matter, his potential conflict would not be imputed to me. 
And so he just doesn't work on them. And it's the same with other judges. You know, I, I have many clerks that have clerked for other judges, for district court judges. They don't work on the stuff that the d- district court judge had, had ruled on. But I let them do whatever they want. Now, I do tell them, I give them advice, which is that at the end of their clerkship or toward the end of their clerkship, they're going to have a lot more opportunities than they probably had coming into the clerkship. So, you know, I tell them, you, you accept a job if you want, but you certainly don't have to. And it will very almost certainly be waiting for you if you accept it toward the end of your clerkship and you may decide you want to move around. It's a weird thing, this clerkship thing. I just tell you, I hire these clerks so far in advance. I've actually hired a clerk to start in 2024 already. She starts in the fall of 2024. And by the time she gets to the fall of 2025, okay, I have no idea what her life is going to be like. She could be married. She might not be married. She could have a child. They could move. They could want to move to California. So I always tell them, it's you. You so if you're going to accept a job to start in, it, you're going to, in 2022. You're going to accept a job to start in 2025. I think 2024 is a long way off. 2025 to me seems like a long time away. But if they do, they do. Anything else? Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Insight in the inner workings of the court when it comes to handling conflicts and ethics. So, thank you for sharing that with us. You're very welcome. Happy to do it. Thank you all. You ready to go? Okay. So it's going to be. Is that my... It's taking a second to load up. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> there we are. Okay. Uh, slides two. Uh, two yeah, eleven fifty three is the. Okay. I think he's gonna stand. Oh, fair enough. Okay. You want to start with the presentation? Uh, sure. Yeah, you can get get it up on the yeah. screen. Okay. At, uh, and we do have a slight slight answer for you. I am. Yes. I know too. Okay, so we're back on we're back on the record, so to speak. Um, and thank you again, uh, Judge Kirsch and and his clerks. Uh, we really appreciate that. So next, and as our final panel on ethical considerations for criminal lawyers, the panel will be led by uh, uh, Professor Andrew Leopold. But you can see from your materials that he's uh, a distinguished professor of law at the University of Illinois, and I noticed he's wearing his orange University of Illinois College of Law tie, so um, very, very, very sharp looking today. He's the author of, uh, I think, was a leading treatise on federal practice, uh, pr- uh, criminal practice procedure. He's on a bunch of U.S. Supreme Court commissions and really one of the leading national authorities in this area, so we're just delighted to have him. I'm going to um, turn it over to uh, Professor Leopold now and let him introduce his panel. Thank you, Kimball, and, th- and thank you and Karen for all that you've done to bring this about, to make this day possible. Um, this is uh, a panel about the distinctive nature of criminal decision making and the ethical obligations that attach to it. Uh, in civil law, uh, as you all know, uh, the role of an advocate can be a little more streamlined, a little more clear. You're an advocate for your client. You have to stay within the rules of professional responsibility and the bounds of ethics, but you're an advocate for your client. And 
I don't want to say that's it, but that's it. Criminal cases are different in part because the roles of the lawyers is more qualified. Prosecutors, as we all know, have the role of being both an advocate for the people of their jurisdiction and as a minister of justice. We're all familiar with the dual hats that uh, prosecutors have to uh, wear when they prosecute cases. Defense counsel is also an advocate, but they have special constitutional backing to them. The Fifth Amendment can limit what defense counsel is obligated can do. Uh, is obligated to do, limits that don't apply in any other setting other than the criminal uh, context. So there are different challenges, different questions that come up in the criminal context. And fortunately, we have a terrific panel of people to help us uh, think through some of these things. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time introducing them. Their uh, bios are in the program, and Kim will introduce them this morning. Uh, but we have Irene Joe. Uh, in the middle there. She's a professor at the University of California, Davis, a nationally recognized scholar in criminal law, criminal procedure, and professional responsibility. Uh, to the far uh, left of me is Stacy Ludwig, who is the Director of Professional Responsibility Advisory Office at the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, and almost certainly knows more about professional responsibility uh, in this setting than anybody else. Um, and then to my immediate left, we have uh, B.J. Pack, who is a partner at Alston and Bird in Atlanta. He's a former U.S. attorney in the Unsung Heroes Division from the Northern District of Atlanta. Uh, and before that, he was a Georgia legislator. legislator. <laughs> so I thought what we do today to uh, maybe make things a mix things up a little bit is instead of having each of our three panelists present for a few minutes. Instead, I thought we'd run through a series of hypothetical cases of things that can arise in the criminal context. And then I'll invite each of our panelists to speak about that and talk about some how they would think about some of these issues. As I like to tell the students, uh, people aren't going to bring you easy questions. They're no fun and no one wants to pay you to answer easy questions. So instead we're going to do what I hope are a little bit more difficult questions. I hope uh, people online can see them. Uh, they'll, they'll be on the screen here. They're very, very short uh, hypothetical cases. But before we start, I'd also like to invite people either online or in the audience, if you have questions, comments, you want clarification, you think what we're saying is incorrect, please join in. This can be a little bit more of a discussion um, uh, given the setup. And I know all of our panelists would welcome that. So let's get started. Three areas I thought it might be useful to talk about. One is the distinctive issues that arise in the, in the uh, setting of charging decisions that prosecutors have to make and defense counsel have to respond to. The second, uh, Brady obligations. As I'm sure all of you know or uh, remember from law school, uh, Brady is the Supreme Court case that says prosecutors and only prosecutors have a constitutional obligation to turn over to the defense material, favorable information, whether discovery requires it or not, whether anything else requires it or not. You got to turn it over. Brady is, as I think most prosecutors would say, one of their most challenging areas when it comes to the boundaries between professional responsibility and their role as an advocate. And then talk a little bit about plea bargaining, some of the hard things that can come up in the context of plea bargaining, things that, uh, may, once again, call into question this relationship between advocacy and your professional responsibility. So that's what we're going to do. I encourage participation. Let's start. So we're going to start with a question for our panelists. Which of the following should influence a prosecutor's decision whether or not to bring charges in a case? Now, let me fill in the free space on the bingo card and say strength of the evidence and reason to believe that you can prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. That ought to be true in all cases. But let's put that aside and now ask, what else should we take into account? First question, what about public pressure? Should prosecutors be responsive to public pressure 
in deciding whether or not to bring criminal charges in a case or not. Um, and BJ, since you're the closest one to me, let me start with you. I think in reality, uh, um, that factors in a lot of things, particularly the uh, elected officials like the district attorney's office. I think they have much more pressure than the Department of Justice. So the Department of Justice, the pressure really comes from the administration's priority. For example, if they want to get back to um, drug enforcement to reduce the number of fentanyl you know, related over overdose deaths, you're going to have lots of pressure from the public and also from the department to make sure that we prosecute any kind of fentanyl case. I think what generally ends up happening in that situation is you you end up having maybe you're taking on a lot more smaller cases to fit the kind of you know, fit the need, so to speak, uh, than uh, devoting some resources to other bigger, more priority areas. But I do think that public pressure does factor into whether or not they're going to devote a limited amount of resources your office has to prosecuting that case. Even at the federal level, you think that where or in, juris in the few jurisdictions that it don't elect prosecutors. And at the federal level, you think that's equally true? I, I think it's pretty, it is pretty true. Um, when you read about, for example, I mean, I was reading news and I think everybody understands like homicides are up in every major city. Every prosecutor is focusing on reducing violent crime. And if you don't focus on that, and rather you're focusing on something like white collar crime instead, you are gonna get some heat. You may get a call from the White House. You may get a call from, um, you know, your your uh, political consultant saying, what are you doing? <laughs> You're running for re-election. You got to focus on these type of things. So there, it does factor. Okay. Professor Joe. <laughs> thank you so much. If I could take just a moment to, to thank you all for having me here. And then also I've heard a few questions about my middle name. And so I do want to <laughs> take a moment to tell you all it's Oisha Wayan me is how you say it. I was born in Nigeria. It's a very popular name in Nigeria. So if you have Nigerian friends here, or if you've ever been to Nigeria, I'm sure you've heard it. It's, 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 um, uh, uh, it means God is behind me. So it's sort of like a prayer and things like that. So uh, just to answer all of your questions. And so to answer this question, you know, when I see something like this, my immediate reaction is uh, a little bit of concern about the use of the, the, the term public pressure. Like who counts as the public, right? Who gets to be the legitimate voice, right? That gets a say in what's being said. I remember I was doing a, 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 a seminar, a symposium in Boston at some point, and I spoke with um, the lead prosecutor there and they admitted, you know, there's certain phone calls they get from certain neighborhoods and certain you know uh, housing uh, communities in certain neighborhoods that get a bit more attention <laughs> when it comes to what they need to prioritize uh, and, and so if we if our call or if our call to arms so to speak if our um, if our goal with this system is to, for it to be one of integrity any at any point where we're open to the idea of public pressure input from outside sources we have to ask ourselves whether or not we exist in a society where there's certain voices that have been marginalized and minimized, and are we really okay with continuing going forward? So I would say no, right? Unless we're gonna confront what we mean by public pressure and be honest about it. Stacy, and, and I too wanna to say thank you for having me here today. It's, it's a pleasure. And many of my responses will really be looking at it through the lens of the rules of professional conduct, because what I do is I advise the Department of Justice attorneys, my office, on the rules of professional conduct and what they do. And the goal, of course, is that they always do their job in the context and comply with the rules of professional conduct. So I, I always start these questions looking at the lens and I go back to the rules and I'll talk about the model rules <coughs> because those are the rules that are basis for um, every jurisdiction's rules. And I guess I, when I looked at this question, I thought about, well, first of all, something that I don't think a lot of people necessarily know is that prosecutors also have clients. It's debatable who that client <laughs> is. Some people say the client is the public. Um, others will say it's the particular entity for which the prosecutor works, say, for example, for the United States, for Department of Justice prosecutors, there's an Office of Legal Education, or rather an Office of Legal Counsel opinion that says the client is the United States, so that we represent the interests of the United States as a whole, and maybe a state prosecutor who represents the interest of the state as a whole. So in terms of thinking about the pressure, are they thinking about sort of, they're looking at it holistically, sort of what's in the best interest of the United States? And I think what's important about that is because the prosecutor has a 
client, there are certain individuals, and this dovetails with what BJ said, certain individuals speak for the client. So I think the extent to which any individual prosecutor can make any of these decisions is not necessarily always going to be up to the individual prosecutor. Now, if you were BJ, you're the US attorney, of course you can make that decision, but all of the individual prosecutors, they have to follow the directives of their client. There's actually a rule that says you follow the directives of your client. So to the extent you have certain policies that you know your client wants you to follow, then I think you need to think about that in the context of any decision that, that you make or consult with your, your supervisors, the individuals who stand, who stand in the shoes of the client. Okay, let's continue with this idea of uh, who's pressure and who are they pressuring you to do. Uh, and since you uh, first raised it, uh, Professor Jill, let me start with you. No, it was really great uh, timing yeah. because I actually, the, the Boston conference I spoke about, I, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, can yeah. You, if you could check and make sure that your microphones are on, I think that would I think be. Is that better? Be, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Be helpful. Um, I was going to say it was perfect timing for um, me to speak after this because the conference. I, I spoke at in Boston, it was uh, about a piece that I had written called the prosecutor's client problem and how are we thinking about defining the prosecutor's client and then we're not being as expansive as we should be. Um, some of the things, you know, we certainly discussed some of those elements or ideas about who the prosecutor's client might be. There was some discussion in the piece about how to some extent, of course, even the defendant is their client as well when you think about them being a minister of justice and, and being part of this system that's supposed to operate in a way that's professional and ethical and, and ethically sound. Um, another, you know, a number of clients that we talked about was, you know, even thinking about the third parties that are affected by um, the decisions that are made in the courtroom with regards to the defendant, right? Whether or not it's victims and how they how they have to, you know, present themselves publicly, but also, you know, family members and other members of the community that might be related or impacted by what ends up happening to the defendant, right? If this is a, uh, a parent or a sibling or somebody and they're incarcerated for a amount of time, what does that mean in terms of the family's growth and advancements going forward? For them individually, uh, if this is someone that now because of the con this particular conviction, they're not gonna be able to avail themselves of certain you know, government benefits that could help improve their quality of life, what does that do to the community as large, right? If we say that the prosecutor's there to, to maintain the health of the community. So to what extent did you think about the collateral consequences for this defendant who's going to be released at some point, what that's going to do for the community going forward? Um, so again, you know, it's just, you know, the, I think we can all sort of recognize that we live in a world just individually as human beings where we tend to listen to certain voices, right? No matter who we are, there are certain voices that are going to appear louder to us, more legitimate to us. Um, and if that's human nature, <laughs> to what extent can we get rid of that in a system? And if we're going to acknowledge that we can't, to what extent can we account for that, acknowledge that, and um, be accountable about that? You know, I think at the very least, that's something we could consider. Say, a <clears throat> person who is uh, prominent in the community, I think this comes up a lot in public integrity prosecutions. And um, the DOJ policy generally is that it, it's treated more sensitively. Uh, I think the ultimate issue is whether or not there's evidence of a, a federal crime that's been committed. But ultimately, how do you do it and when you do it, generally, you take, you take a closer look at that. I think it does matter because if in elected officials who have an official governmental function, you also have to think about the interruption that it may bring. Because any kind of investigation or any kind of prosecution may, uh, may interrupt the critical functioning of the governmental entity that, that he or she is head of to make sure that that's not interrupted because that might be doing harm to the public. So it is a factor in deciding uh, you know, to prosecute more likely when to prosecute uh, versus uh, whether or not to do it because ultimately the evidence will drive that. But in the Department of Justice, I'm sure Stacy will tell you, is highly, highly um, scrutinized to make sure that it's not done in a haphazard way. And I think there's another function here a lot of people who like to go after prominent people for the purpose of political reasons. And I think that we get closer to the more um, ethical issues that we'll probably talk about, but it does matter uh, when you do it. And, and, and matters whether it's a government official or the president of a private corporation whose business will be disrupted, you give the same kind of uh, scrutiny to how to do it there. 
Yes, that's true. And if you remember, even talking about white collar crime back in the Enron days, we ended up having uh, the government indicted Arthur Anderson, right? Without really thinking through what that would do to the entire business. And of course, ultimately they were exonerated, but uh, because of different technical issues, but Arthur Anderson no longer exists because of that. And as a result of that policy, department policy changed in terms of hmm. charging like corporations or something that's prominent that's going to impact the larger community. Stacey, anything? Uh... I really don't have anything to add other than that I will say um, is, you know, in terms of thinking of all these issues and being very thoughtful about them, my experience has been we we get many questions in our office. In any given year, we may have two to 3,000 people who call us, maybe closer to the 2,000s. But I think that prosecutors like BJ, they're trying to really think about so many of the issues that are of concern. And there are so, so many of them. Um, but I do think, at least what I have seen from the Department of Justice is that they are very thoughtful in the decisions the decisions that they make. And when they are uncertain, that's when they are going to, to reach out, particularly to our office, to discuss some of these very, very thorny issues. Stacy, do they ever reach out on our next uh, example? Uh, is there concern that, uh, that obviously, no, no big news to say that not all crimes uh, have the same demographic uh, makeup in terms of who they're enforced against and uh, which crimes you prioritize within uh, the prosecuting function. Is it appropriate to think about the sort of larger social implications of enforcing this crime rather than that crime? Is that a prosecutor's job or is that for the president and the uh, attorney general to worry about? Well, I think that would, again, get back to who is the client and who, who are the individuals who are making the decisions on behalf of the client. So, and, and I would think that any individual who is making these decisions would want to ensure that their decisions are consistent with those of, of the client, say, and the people who speak for the client. And I think BJ, perhaps, having actually been in that position, can address that specifically. One of the big issues uh, when these three hypotheticals, you see that playing out today, for example. I mean, I don't know the insides, but. In particular, when you have elected officials, there's a tremendous amount of pressure. That's the next slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, the, the main one I see in the public pressure of recent memory, those those of you who practice in the criminal law area, was the Duplo Cross case, Mike Nifon case, with a tremendous amount of pressure to do something about it because there was some racial um, uh, racial division in the the area, and on top of that, we had this. A wealth gap type of thing where you have Duke students who are who are viewed this as this is the Duke lacrosse yeah. case that he's referring to. And then so he he I I think ultimately what was finally he jumped the gun. He jumped the gun. He charged without really doing due diligence investigation, something that dates back to the first kind of panel that we had. Didn't do his due diligence, obviously, then he was he was actually disbarred and prosecuted for the crime. So for a former prosecutor, these type of things do matter. Uh, in the in the sense that when you're exercising your prosecutorial discretion, um, the line between what is perceived as something politically motivated or something other than the evidence is a very thin one, particularly in these type of scenarios. And the, the type of crime that has been overwhelmingly enforced against a particular group reminds me of a lot of prosecutors deciding to exercise their prosecutorial discretion and not enforce, for example, marijuana laws. Um, I think it's a very common one that you see these days. But it does raise a question in, in my mind when you swear and take the oath to uphold the law, and you're directly contravening what the legislative body is passing. There's a question whether or not that's ethical. Uh, your job, your job is to enforce the law as it's written. Um, but this gray area of prosecutor discretion is something that you have to exercise carefully. Uh, otherwise, you're going to lose confidence, I think, and the public will lose confidence one side or the other. Uh, whether or not you are faithfully executing the laws like your oath is doing, and number two, or not you're doing it for political reasons, not necessarily for uh, the right reasons. 
Yeah, I'll just jump in here real quick. Um, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying a lot of my conversations and comments are going to be more about the local and state level of criminal process. That's my past experience. That's usually where my research focuses on. Um, you know, one of the discussions I have with with my students that I'd also love to hear your, your, your views on is uh, whether or not prosecutorial discretion is a good thing or a bad thing, right? The charging decision, as we talk about, usually at the end of about two or three days of intense debate. <laughs> Students sort of decide that having prosecutor discretion is the right move. You don't want mandatory um, decisions in that way. And we talk about some of the history of that. Um, but, you know, we talk about how we could we could make it a little bit better by just thinking about the definitions that we use uh, and expanding them. Right. So even here, when we talk about um, a prominent member of the community, I think each of us, if we think into our individual lives, the person who's prominent for us might not be the elected official, right? Especially as a child, right? So we think about all the, the parents or the sibling, older siblings that are um, charged with offenses and are looking at significant time. You know, we think you know, if we think back to our own lives. If there was a, a parent or an older sibling that was taken away from us um, uh, for a long period of time, how might our lives have been different, right? You can see the ripple effects of that, right? And so it's interesting that we now recognize it when it comes, the ripple effects in the corporate context, right? But we're not seeing it or really, you know, uh, responding to it in the in the sort of personal local level context. And and I think that could be a great addition to how we think about prosecutorial discretion and the charging decision. Good, thank you. All right, we've been sort of moving around it. Let's talk about in the political context and what role prosecutors should play. So two examples here. One is after the election, the losing candidate says that the winning candidate broke the law to get elected. This is all hypothetical, of course. Of course, of course. Um, <laughs> and wants an investigation. Different case, it's during the election process where someone, and make this a local race, right? The incumbent is raiding the till to fund their campaign. Prosecutor, I want you to do something about it. If you're a prosecutor, what do you do about one, the other, both, or neither uh, of these? Anyone want to start? <laughs> Yes, I know all the pressures on you. <laughs> well, um, my experience has been when there's elections going on, particularly from the state level, um, you get a lot of calls and letters. Mm -hmm. As the U.S. attorney, I got a lot of calls and letters. Like, oh, and you know. Um, so it, it's part of this kind of the political maneuvering, I guess a lot of people do, like, please open an investigation. Uh, number one, to point out, the department policy, there's not a written policy per se, part of the justice manual, but there's an unwritten policy that's, all, that's been unofficial that you generally, what you're, you cannot do overt investigative acts when you think that that's going to impact, potentially impact the outcome of the investigation or uh, outcome of the election. So I think there was a lot of discussion about this, um, particularly in recent days, uh, recent years about it. But there's nothing that prevents you from doing it. You can actually start an investigation, bring your indictment, because if you think about it now, everything's an election cycle. Everything is politicized. There's really no way to get around that. But there's general rule that you should not be the investigation not become a factor in whether or not you should go back and, and, and back and forth. And I think that's true for any way. When you are a Department of Justice official, mm -hmm. uh, you have to appear completely nonpartisan, even though that you are, in fact, a appointee of a political process. But I think institutionally, um, I think Department of Justice has adopted this policy of not being a factor in that. And that's why there's federal statute that says an, an agent with a gun cannot go into an active polling place. Can you imagine that, right? So there's these laws and also policies related to that. Now, after a bitter political race, when is after the election, when you get an investigation, request for an investigation and they demand it, I think it's really driven by the facts of the case. And one mistake I think many people have is they think that the federal government, Department of Justice, has a lot more jurisdiction over an actual state election than people do. Um, and it's also true for civil rights cases as well, but what is a police officer who, shoot, who shot and killed an unarmed person? Um, we have limited statutes that apply, generally criminal in nature. So in a case like that, you have to kind of rely on the facts of the case. Um, 
there's no ethical obligation to even consider someone demanding an investigation. Um, although we do have some practical effects that Professor Joe has mentioned that if it's a prominent person in the community, you may actually listen to a little bit further. Now, during a, during a political race, absolutely not. I, I would say that it's just, if you think about it, logically think about it, it's not a good idea to start an investigation during a middle of a, a political race because you are injecting yourself in the middle of an actual partisan race. Yeah. <laughs> Who's responsible for this rule? Sure. Yeah, so the unwritten rules actually is written by a bureaucrat. Um, <laughs> so within the Department of Justice, there is the, um, the voting rights section and the, under the civil rights section and, and the civil rights section that talks about these type of issues, right? And so when you have, uh, when you have elections, they say, well, I don't think it's a good idea for the Department of Justice to start an investigation. It doesn't prevent you from doing that. It's just a memo it's generally written saying that you should not do that. You should, you should not do any overt activity that may be recently seen as impacting the election. And so every attorney general, going back to, I think, probably the 70s, I believe, um, issues, every time the election comes around, they'll remind you that this is what you should do. Yeah, every election, there'll, there'll be a little memo that goes out to all the U.S. attorney's office and all the other prosecutors. That a couple of things you have to that you have to dedicate a district election officer, an AUSA, or multiple AUSAs, where the complaints can come in, and then also to remind her that we are entering this sensitive time. That you cannot be, you know, if you have any investigation you're going to do, you should avoid any overt things. You need to raise that issue up all the way to the highest ranks of the attorney, you know, the Department of Justice. Now that being said, your attorney general, he or she could say, "We're just going to go do it." And so you'll see, if you look at the history of the Department of Justice and some of the biggest scandals that, that went on, you'll see that there's a tension between the people who are political appointees um, and also people who are what, what we call um, the, the civil servants who've been around for a while that have, have policy. But I will say that the reason you have any kind of unofficial or actual written policy is because somebody screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> Always the case. Somebody screwed up or someone got too close to the line and you saw that um, uh, just most recently about political activities of uh, U.S. attorneys, whether or not they could attend a campaign event. Uh, although the First Amendment allows them to do that, uh, department policies that you can't, you can, you should not, you should avoid doing that. And recently, there was a U.S. attorney uh, that actually went to a, a a fundraiser attended by one of the White House, um, actually the First Lady, and and as a result, although had clearance and everything. Then after that happened, there was there was media frenzy over that. Then um, Attorney General actually issued a memo, which is on official policy, right? That you should not attend any kind of fundraiser as, as a political appointee, um, although it's a limitation on First Amendment. Someone could probably challenge that and win, but, <laughs> but ultimately, the the department's conduct is governed not just by professional responsibility rules, but the uh, the Attorney General uh, he or she could issue uh, a directive. That flows through, and they're generally rooted on the integrity of kind of the or and the reputation of the department as being completely non-political. But a lot of those unofficial policies are written by civil servants because someone screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> we really focus on the rules, the rules of professional conduct, but as a general matter when the department is going to promulgate policies, um, our office may be brought in to ensure that any new policies that we have, that they're considering all the potential um, rules of professional conduct and those ramifications. I will also add that in addition to the rules of professional conduct, which do apply to federal attorneys, even though they're promulgated by the states, there's actually a federal statute that clearly says 
that the the state and jurisdictions bar rules do apply to government attorneys there's also what's known as the federal ethics rules and they apply to anybody who works for the federal government and it covers a variety of um, different ethical issues it may be conflicts of interest there's a whole provision called the hatch act um, and there are particular provisions and BJ was alluding to them, but having gotten approval, but there are particular provisions that outline specific things that federal employees can and can't do. And depending on your particular position, you might be even more restricted. If for example, you're a political appointee or you're in the senior executive service. And then there are, so there are a huge variety of other issues that they may not be under the rules of professional conduct, but they may be covered by the standards of conduct, which might apply to a prosecutor. There's sort of a general provision about avoiding appearance of impropriety, and that's obviously a very nebulous term, but something that um, might govern a particular situation where we can't point to a particular rule, and we can't say that you violated the rule, but this is something, sometimes we say, there's just an icky feeling um, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. It, it, a very sophisticated term, but. Uh, yeah, Kimball. I, I, I just had a question about something you said earlier, Stacey, about who's the client. So, I, you know, United States uh, Department of Justice attorneys represent employees of the United States in civil actions, I think, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but there might be a civil action where the United States is sued and an employee of federal and maybe an FBI agent or an immigration agent or a postal employee. And then do the DOJ, DOJ attorneys represent that individual? And in that case, who's the client? And what do you do with the conflict of interest between the individual's interests and the, and the United States of America? Well, it depends, it depends on the situation. There are often times when, for example, there may be a, an employment discrimination case that is filed <laughs> Um, against the head of an agency, we would say that's against that person in their individual capacity, or rather their official capacity. So it's really a suit against the United States. So even in the civil context, it is against the United States, even if technically the United States is not named in a party. There are situations, however, where an individual federal employee may violate what's known as a clearly established constitutional right, it's known as a Bivens action. So that those would actually be, and it's one of the um, more unusual situations where a Department of Justice employee would not represent the United States, but would represent an individual. And you're right that in those situations, they represent an individual. They may not represent the United States in that particular case, although the United States is always their client. And certainly that is a situation then when we would have to evaluate just as a private liar, private lawyer would, what are potential conflicts of interest between my two clients, which ordinarily the Department of Justice doesn't have two clients. Yeah, as, some, as a student of ethics and the former general counsel of Winston Thrawn, I would see that there would be a material limitation conflict there when you're called upon to represent an employee of the federal government who may have acted contrary to the interests of the federal government. But I suppose that's exactly what you're focusing on. Well, it is not every situation where the United States may decide to represent the individual. There's a whole process for determining whether or not this person should be represented by the United States. So as you point out, if their interests would be completely contrary to the interests of the, the United States, that may be a situation where the United States doesn't authorize representation. Um, on behalf of the Department of Justice to that individual. So is, is that a call that your office makes? No, that's it's a separate office. Okay. Um, that and the office focuses primarily on cases involving uh, suits brought against individual lawyers. Now we may cons that we may work with that office, but it's another office that would make that determination with respect to whether or not the United mm -hmm. States is going to authorize a Department of Justice employee to represent an individual. I see. So it's on a case by case basis. So to follow up what Stacy said, generally what happens, um, the U.S. attorney represents all federal government agencies. So, for example, in your scenario where you have a postal employee getting a car wreck, right, delivering mail, they're acting within the scope, like in the employment vicarious liability context, and the U.S. attorney would have to make a determination whether or not they're acting in the scope of the employment 
And uh, if that's so, then we do assume the, um, the representation the Department of Justice does. And to Stacy's point, there are situations, particularly in criminal cases, where it's clear that they're not acting within the scope or, or the bounds of kind of in the Bivens action, that they're acting contrary to what's clearly established constitutional law that would be completely outside. In that situation, that we since the U.S. attorney represents the government agency, so for example, in a police shooting in a federal agency, we will rep represent the FBI. But that particular FBI agent who acted outside the scope, we will now represent them, and they would have to get a separate counsel. Um, so that's kind of how we, like you were a general counsel, the the conflict rules related to organizations uh, applies equally to the federal government. Yeah. Well, thank you. And while while you're on the hot seat there, I was watching Must See TV a couple of months ago. I'm talking about the televised January 6 hearings, and I saw you testify um, about um, a request that you received to to investigate fraud. Uh, I found your testimony fascinating, and I suspect others who might have missed it w would be interested in hearing your summary of what you said publicly. <laughs> Um, the, the public testimony related to a particular night um, in in Fulton County after the election, the polls were closed, and they they took all the ballots to a centralized location. In this case, at the State Farm Arena, which is uh, where the um, Atlanta Hawks play the basketball. And so they started counting, and uh, what ended up happening was that that night there was um, an apparent um, error. Um, called by the county official, election official, that they were done for the night. It was around, I want to say, 11, 30, 11, late at night. And they, each party, like Republican and Democrat and Libertarian Party, had a representative watching the processing of ballots in Fulton County. And so they announced that they're going to stop counting for the night. So the election workers packed up the ballots into secured boxes and put them underneath the tables where, um, where they were supposed to be kept. And then they realized the Secretary of State's office, which Ryan is calling now, but they're like, what are you doing? You gotta continue counting. They called the county officials and they know you gotta, you gotta continue counting. The Secretary of State's office was at the State Farm Arena. And so they went ahead and pulled the boxes back out and started processing the ballots again. But the partisan processing watchers from each party were sent home. They didn't know. So what happened was uh, Rudy Giuliani comes down on, I think, December 3rd, if my memory serves me correct, and testifies in front of a state, state Senate subcommittee looking into the election integrity and takes a snippet of that security video from State Farm Arena showing the worker which, who's identified as um, Ruby Friedman, which is a result of another lawsuit that came out. She testified as well on the, the, the subcommittee. Um, anyway, so... Um, pulls the box back out and starts processing again. Uh, but Giuliani had characterized that as a suitcase full of fake ballots and they were processing and double counting. And so that set off a kind of a frenzy. Um, and um, I was asked to look into a fraud because that was an allegation of fraud. Let's took a, take a look at the video. And so my testimony related to I, we fully investigated that, including doing FBI interviews found out that there was a mixed characterization of actual what the video showed. If you watched the video, you could clearly see them putting it back in, pulling it back out. And uh, there was no double counting. There was, and uh, we talked to the individual poll workers working that night, confirmed all that. And then we reported back, there was not, absolutely nothing there. And so that was, that was the only uh, aspect they asked me about. There were other powers that I probably won't be able to tell you right now, but uh, the fact of the matter is um, there was nothing to substantiate the allegations uh, that, that were made by the several people who were testifying from the state subcommittee. Um, so as a lawyer and, and as a, a um, politically expedient thing to do would be either to say nothing or to insinuate that there's some kind of investigation going on, but obviously that's not what you're supposed to do. So if you look at, you probably did not know that there was any investigation or checking going on because there was no overt activity because we actually had a special election, Senate election, that's going to happen January 6th. We're in that kind of a window of time. So we didn't do anything overt for people to know kind of what's going on. So uh, so people didn't find out about our, our checking on back and forth. But it was reported back up. And then I think rest is kind of in public because the news kind of broke it um, in terms of what that message did not get through to some of the people in the higher up. Yeah. Six 
Well, I, I think it's been a while now because the policy has changed now, but the general rule is that you shouldn't do anything within 60 days of, 60 days of kind of election. Well, I mean, we're talking about, it, listen, if you're waiting until the statute of limitations run out to start an investigation. No, no, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Well, that, that issue probably wouldn't come up because you could actually indict under seal and seal not them. let the public know that that's, that's on there. But what you don't want to do is, is, you know, unseal it <laughs> in the middle of that. Which will definitely impact, and then you'll see these things all the time. When I was a U.S. attorney, we did a lot of investigation to um, Atlanta City Hall corruption, and we prosecuted, brought charges, and and got lots and lots of convictions. Uh, ultimately, what what ended up happening was the the election cycle kind of came to a close, and then um, it no longer mattered because you have a new candidate and things like that. Then you can go ahead and do that, despite the fact that it's one side one side party that was being investigated. But being a political appointee from another the other party, you're always going to get this accusation that it was politically motivated. And you see that every single day. Which, um, on the flip side, of course, and I know we're going to talk about this, is that I really do think that ethically, prosecutors should try to limit kind of extrajudicial statements. Um, that you can make. And a lot of times we get away with the speaking indictment concept where we put a lot of facts in there in the indictment and you can refer to that. And there's some strategy going on with that. But if you look at the ethical rules on extrajudicial, and I know Stacy could tell us a lot more about that, is that, you know, you have to be, you have to be very careful of that. And I think just the way the First Amendment law has developed, a lot of lawyers to like Matt Morgan and, and the prior panel's point is, they use the litigation for other purpose than winning, which is they put out facts on there to protect themselves from defamation lawsuits, or at least try to, um, to kind of use it for political advantage. Okay. Um, all right, let's move on from charging uh, and talk about Brady. What the prosecutor has to disclose and when she or he has to disclose it, um, is a tricky uh, situation. And it was made more tricky by a US Supreme Court decision that said mostly sort of kind of in large part, prosecutors don't have to disclose so-called Brady information, the information that's good for the defense before taking a plea deal, before allowing the defendant to plead guilty. Now, I think there's the Supreme Court didn't say that exactly, but it said it close enough that most courts, maybe all courts, have said no obligation to turn over favorable information prior to accepting a guilty plea. So the question is, uh, you've got a client and the client says, boy, you know, there's stuff there I know that is helpful to me. You want it as a defense lawyer but the prosecutor is not obligated to turn it over. Now, maybe the prosecutor says, oh, you know, I haven't looked. I haven't, you know, gone through the process of reviewing uh, the material in this case to figure out what Brady material I have in my possession. Uh, but maybe they do know. What should we do here? What's what, Stacy? what's the obligation of a prosecutor who is not legally bound to turn over information and I'll leave it ambiguous for the moment, whether the prosecutor even knows or suspects or thinks maybe they might have this information. Law says no. Should there be some obligation on them to turn it over? Well, I certainly can, can talk about what obligations there are under, uh, under the rules. And, and I think one thing that I wanna say that you know we often think about too, is you wanna think about what is, what should prosecutors or any lawyer for that matter be held professionally accountable for? Meaning this is something in action that they take that they could be disbarred or, or they, they could be suspended. And what do we wanna advocate as, as best practices or what someone, someone should do? Uh, 
And in terms of this, the Brady obligation, there actually is a rule of professional conduct, um, which if I would say there's sort of any rule that's had a lot of debate um, over the last 10 years, it's been this rule. Um, every jurisdiction has it, and it specifically governs a prosecutor's ethical duty of disclosure. It's rule 3.8D. And the language in the rule is different than the Brady obligation. The rule says you have to uh, produce information that tends to negate guilt or mitigate the offense. But that's not defined anywhere. And so the issue is, is that it's unclear um, whether or not the ethical obligation is the same or broader than the obligation under substantive law. Now, some jurisdictions have answered this. This is one of the uh, issues where the states really vary. There are some jurisdictions that said, no, it's unfair to hold prosecutors to a standard that's different than substantive law, that a prosecutor could be professionally disciplined if the prosecutor's not violating the law. And then there are other jurisdictions that say, no, we, we think that prosecutors should be held to a, a higher standard or a different standard than the substantive law, that you have to do more than the substantive law. And so that even if you comply with the substantive law, you still could be professionally disciplined. And the jurisdictions have really um, debated this both at two levels. One, in terms of what information should be disclosed, what is the breadth of the disclosure? And then secondly, the timing of the disclosure. There's been much more jurisprudence regarding what information should be disclosed as opposed to when the information should be disclosed. Uh, there is actually one Supreme Court, the Tennessee Supreme Court, the only court to my knowledge that has come out definitively and said that a prosecutor's ethical obligation in terms of timing um, is the same as under substantive law, so that a prosecutor would follow the substantive law in terms of when to disclose um, information, when to disclose mitigating information. A prosecutor doesn't violate the rule unless the prosecutor violates the law. There have been some other opinions, um, ethics opinions, um, one by the American Bar Association, which came out in 2009, which I think sort of started some of this debate on this issue, that could be interpreted to suggest that the ethical obligation to disclose um, should be done sooner than under substantive law. It suggests that perhaps even as early as arraignment, which certainly raises the question that sometime at that early stage in a proceeding, the prosecutor doesn't know much about the case. They don't know what information might even be relevant. They don't know the defendants, what the defendant's case is about. So the prosecutor may not even know what information in fact tends to negate guilt or, or mitigate the offense. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Irene and BJ in terms of a more practical response, but from sort of the professional responsibility, that perspective, that's, that's the landscape we're dealing with. Thank you for that, that was great to hear. Uh, whenever I think of Brady obligations or hypothetical scenarios like this, I like to, you know, in addition to the formal rules and uh, that are required when it comes to Brady obligations, I think there's two other things to consider when you're making decisions about what to do in a situation like this. And the first is the, the, the you know, so the personal aspect of it, right? So with my students, I make a point of ensuring that they know the story behind the Brady versus Maryland decision, that they know about John Brady, that they know was a it was a love story gone horribly wrong where a friend of his ended up killed, right? And 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 you know his time, you know, uh, you know, incarcerated facing the death penalty and and that whole story because I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that there are very real people that are going to suffer real consequences that some of us would consider inhumane when you keep information um, private like this, right? Um, the second thing I like them to look at is that legal historians, when they look at the Brady decision and the evolution of it and, the, and the arguments and everything, you know, for Douglas to come out with this opinion sort of out of nowhere, as some of them would describe it, like it wasn't even briefed or argued, right, uh, was because his goal, um, as some would say, as some historians would say, was to try to make the system a bit more inquisitorial, more, less adversarial, right, and more of both sides 
working together for a common good, right? And the good he would define as, as the truth, right? <laughs> um, and we're not seeing that happen, right? In some ways, the Brady decision, especially if you say now that you don't have to provide it before a plea offer, when we know that the vast majority of criminal cases are resolved via plea, uh, is in a way, you know, become more adversarial. Um, I'll just, you know, sort of share real quickly um, an anecdotal story. So, you know, before I became an academic, I was a, I did death penalty work in Alabama and I was a public defender in Louisiana. And I always, um, the, the story, uh, the hypothetical I give to my students was a, a client that I represented. He was what we call a triple lifer. He had been convicted twice before for burglary and he was facing a burglary charge. Um, you know, he spoke very honestly with me about how he hadn't done it <laughs> and that um, he had seen somebody else bust into the house and knocked on the front door to alert the homeowner. Um, you know, it looked really bad. He had two prior burglaries. Uh, and he said, look, when I was in prison the last time, my, my mother passed away. And so all I have left is my sister. And I told her, I'm never going to do something like this again. Uh, and I said, you know, I understand, but it looks really bad because the homeowner, you know, says that, you know, they have your name and they said, this is the person who did it. Uh, and um, how else do they have your name? All these things. The case just looked really bad. And the prosecutor kept offering you know, four years, right? Which is kind of remarkable for what's considered a triple life for Louisiana. He was looking at a life sentence of convicted. And I, I saw that and I heard that and I was like, you know, you should think about taking this. But he kept insisting, I can't do it just because I promised my sister I wouldn't. And it means something to me, for my sister to know that I meant it. Um, and so they kept offering the plea deal. I kept agreeing to continuances because you know, at least there was, I didn't know what I was gonna argue for the case, you know? <laughs> and at least that's not a conviction yet. And so finally, the judge in the case said, y'all need to go to trial at the next court date. Like, this isn't going to be continued anymore. The night before the trial, I remember I'm a person of faith, so I was in a lot of prayer, like, what am I going to do here? Uh, the prosecutor called me and said, oh, I need to let you know now. The homeowner let me know that, you know, he had actually left his card because he was he did odd jobs around the neighborhood um, to say that he would help fix the window that he'd seen being broken into. And so I just believe that he's the one that broke it so that he could fix it. And so I called the police and made up that story. <laughs> and so she let me know this the night before. She said, you know what? Um, I, so I had to let you know this now. And I said, my client has been in prison for all these years. And not even that he's, you know, he's had to have these conversations with his sister, which, you know, it just really, it, it meant a lot to their dynamic. You know, it's so the two of them left, you know, a short, long story short, the next day, um, he, uh, for a number of reasons, ended up pleading guilty to trespass. So he served, it was 30 days time, credit for time served uh, and they didn't revoke his parole or anything like that. And he, and he told, I said, you know, I want you to, I want you to file charges against the prosecutor here. They, they knew this, they expect you to take this plea deal. And he said, you know, it's easy for you to say, <laughs> you're not the one that has to deal with this. <laughs> and I do, and I just want this to go away. Um, and a couple of years later, that prosecutor then ran for judge. And, and I was sort of, I was a little perplexed with what my position should be in that situation. Um, because technically, you know, she had done what the law required of her. She let us know um, the night before the trial. Um, but she had certainly for the previous two years been trying to get a plea deal without giving that bit of information. And that I think only happens if you don't recognize the personal involved, right? And if it's an adversarial focus and not something that's geared towards a common dynamic of ensuring a, a world, a society, a system of good, right? Irene. Yes. So I haven't seen anything in my research it wouldn't surprise me, again, so much of criminal law is very localized. And so it wouldn't surprise me if there's something in certain jurisdictions in certain states where there might be some something where you could pull something from that. But I don't think there's anything sort of overarching. Um, I'm not aware of one either, but if you put it in the context of what kind of happened, you're probably wondering, it's, it's obvious if the yeah. person shows innocence, why don't they turn it over? A couple of things, at least in the federal system, that that's at interplay, which governs the timing of the disclosure of, of Brady material. One is uh, there's a statute called the Jenks Act in the federal practice where you don't have to turn over statements or memorialization of witness statements up until after that witness testified, after they're direct, meaning like you could wait until, technically you could wait until after they take the stand on direct examination, then you turn over the statement. But in, pract in practice, you certainly don't want to do that. 
you have a situation where a witness or eyewitness or whatnot would testify that yes, defendant X did it, but you find out later that person has a drug addiction. Clearly something that falls under the progeny of Brady that you impeach the witness with, that falls under Brady, uh, Giglio actually is the case. Um, so the question is, the, re the reason the Jenks Act is done like that, because a lot of times during these mob prosecutions, you turn over a witness list and they would die. And so there was a careful balancing of that so the ethical rules and substantive law, as Stacy pointed out, it is what it is. But I think what's more important is now we get into the professionalism side. Most ethical and professional prosecutors, who are very good prosecutors, will turn over the information in a reasonable advancement of the time that they could, the defense lawyer could use it. And that's the standard that the Department of Justice and in its manual has adopted. In practice, it does vary by local jurisdiction. Um, in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Atlanta, we always made it a point to turn over Jenks material earlier. What I found that is that if you turn over the strength of your case, it's look, you can do your investigation. That actually facilitated a the actual plea yeah. because the, the, and now as a defense lawyer, trust me, if you turn over your best evidence, I could take that to the client, talk to him or her about it. Look, this is what they have against you. And here's my investigation. This is what we could do. So now here's, here's the decision. They're telling you to accept that they have a plea offer. I think it's fair. You should think about taking it. If you don't want, that's fine. We'll, we'll go litigate that. So the professionalism has, it has to rise higher than what's kind of in the rules right now. Mm -hmm. And also Brady and all the case law related to it comes after the fact somebody was convicted or, you know, and, and that something was discovered later. And then you try to justify the behavior by applying rules after the fact. So as a result, I think the rules are a little bit more favor towards the prosecutor than the actual kind of reality of it. And because of these balancing interests, the department, there was a big push back in, um, back in the 2000s when Deputy Attorney General uh, Paul McNulty was in, that Congress wanted to push a specific disclosure law yeah. for the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice really lobbied hard against it because of these com competing interests. And that's the law today in terms of there's still no clear deadline when you need to turn Brady material over. Well, while we're uh, talking about Brady and timing, let's consider these last two cases in the Brady area. In the first one, you're the prosecutor and you're prosecuting Larry. And Larry says, Mo committed an earlier crime. Well, you convicted Curly of that crime five years earlier. Now what? Second case. You're the defense counsel. You represent Larry. And Larry says, I committed the earlier crime, but Curly was the one convicted of it. What are your obligations here as a prosecutor? What are your obligations here as a defense lawyer? I think, I think the second one's easy. Right? <laughs> well, easier. Um, I think as a lawyer, it, it, the rules require that you cannot do something um, that's um, adversarial or against your client and not to mention there's client confidences that you can't you know for a past crime so i as so far too as bad know, for curly yes i don't think that you could disclose that one way or the other but maybe uh my co panel disagree with me because i think that's an easy one you can't do it i'm sorry i was trying to find it i was looking on google there's a case i talk about and i think it was based out of chicago right where he was um, a man, he served 12 years on a, a, cap, uh, it wasn't a capital case, it was a, a life sentence case for a homicide. And then a, two attorneys, two public defenders, they knew he hadn't committed it because their client had uh, admitted that he had, right? And I think it was, I was trying to find, I couldn't find his name. Um, but, but they were, you know, they were beholden to the rules on client confidentiality and privilege. And the only reason we found out after the fact is because one of them had thought to have his client agree and sign a, 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 a statement that once he passed away, they could let everybody know that he had admitted to, that to it, all right? And, um, you know, whenever I, so I talk about that case with my students, but then also um, I, I, I taught um, legal ethics in China, actually in Beijing a couple of years ago, a week-long course. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot, there's always a lot of anger about that. Like, how could they keep it a secret when they knew 12 years uh, that person was in prison? And, and usually our discussion sort of focuses on how important is it for defendants to be able to feel like they can trust their lawyer, right? Like everybody else in the world can be against them, 
but they have this lawyer that supports them. They can talk to and they can be open and honest with. And and um, I think that is just, of course, maybe it's just my back, defense attorney background or research interest, but I think that's just such, it's such a fundamental piece of our criminal process. And it's so important that I think we just, uh, we unfortunately sometimes have difficult situations and painful situations like that where somebody might be convicted of serving sentence for something that somebody else knows via the attorney-client relationship. And I'll say, of course, because I'm always talking about the rules, that that is actually often a subject of debate, that the ABA, every 20 years, they'll look at all of the rules and determine if some should be changed. And the duty of confidentiality is one that they're always debating, should there be more exceptions to the duty of confidentiality, for example, to address a situation like this one, and maybe a, a narrow a narrow exception where it wouldn't be requiring a defense counsel to disclose, except in a situation, for example, if that person were facing the death penalty, you know, then in that situation where you're really letting someone die um, who is innocent of the crime, and then of course there's that delicate balance: is that person's life, that person's life, versus maintaining the the confidentiality of the attorney client, the attorney client relationship, and you know obviously really really um, diff difficult issues. One of the attorneys was actually at the courthouse when the person who was not guilty was convicted, and he said he was waiting to hear if a jury did um, issue the death penalty because then he felt like maybe he could speak up because there is a death. You know, it's to avoid somebody else's death, and then. Um, but uh, they, do y'all know any hands? Do y'all remember who it was? I think his name was Alton, right? Yes. Yes, Alton. But I can't remember his last yeah. name. And after the guy died, they did. Yeah, so, they did. And you know that Joel Brodsky that I mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> he was the defense attorney for Drew Peterson, and he just recently, within within the last several months, threatened to disclose what he knew that Peterson had told him about the deaths of his wife. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yes, Peterson oh, is in jail no. for Kathleen Santio's death, but not, they've never found the late Peterson, the last fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Professor Leopold, that sounds like, you know, this this lawyer should be like a separate course. In your yeah, it sounds <laughs> like it. Yeah. As far as the first scenario, as a prosecutor, I think that's an easy one as well. Meaning but, like, but if I could interrupt sure. you, it's an easy one you're required or it's an easy one you should? I think it's more of you should. I don't think there's anything that requires. I think the rules speak to this, that, you know, you are an officer of the court. And you want to make sure this as 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 a prosecutor, you don't have the confidentiality problem there. Uh, and you want to make sure the administrative justice is correct and let the process play out. Um, now, from a moral standpoint, you should. I mean, it's just completely clear there's no other. Well, 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 if I could interrupt you again, should what? Because the, there's possibilities here, right? I mean, you, and I'm a, we all know this as lawyers, right? You hear stuff and people tell you stuff. You, some of it sounds true. Some of it doesn't. Some of it, you might have a little bit of confirming information. But let's, let's suppose that you that mo um you know yeah he could have committed the crime but you don't know that what are you supposed to do do you uh, first thing i would do is call stacy that's what trail is for that's exactly what you're supposed to do i, th I think we can all agree that calling stacy should be the first step in any of these and one thing you know when i i saw this hypothetical one of the questions that i had is what about larry's credibility what if you know that larry is an inveterate liar you know, that it's so, so that you have this information. I mean, it's certainly right. something you would want to look into, but I think that there will be a number of factors you, you of would course. consider. Of course, but do you do it as a prosecutor or do you try to find Curly's old lawyer? In, in other words, this is sort of Brady five years down the road when, of course, there is no Brady obligation, I'm assuming. Nobody thinks uh, that the law requires that the constitution requires the prosecutor to do anything here, but there's also a practical problem of what would you do if you were a prosecutor and you got information that God, some guy prosecuted five years ago, maybe didn't do it. Maybe he's a liar. Maybe he's telling the truth to what would you do? I mean, what recourse would you have? A situation like this actually occurred when I was U S attorney. And one thing I did was I assigned a, a brand new prosecutor to look at it from independent 
but not you could corroborate what Larry was saying. So I think there are some civil liability issues that you could think about if you don't do anything um, as a prosecutor because you are an officer of the court. And constitutionally, I think you should you should not just perpetuate a fraud if you knew that person was innocent. But at the, at the very least, you should track it down. That's what I think. And if you, if it could be corroborated, that's when you I think you decide either letting the defense lawyer for Curly know and let he or she take additional actions to try to bring that back into the um, the, the post conviction process yeah. and try to get a new trial. And there actually is um, in about half the states there is um, a post conviction disclosure rule. Um, the ABA um, promulgated the rule. I'm going to say approximately 10 years ago, and now about half the states have it. And it generally says that when a prosecutor learns of information that is new material and credible, um, that the prosecutor, uh, new material and credible, that the defendant did not commit the crime for which the defendant was convicted, that the prosecutor has certain obligations. And the jurisdictions vary on those obligations, but one certainly is a disclosure. <laughs> Um, disclosure to uh, might be the court to the defendant, the defendant's counsel, if the defendant has counsel under the ABA rule, there's also um, requirements to uh, ensure an investigation and also uh, to take remedial, remedial measures. So to some extent, there are actually sort of both, there's both requirements and then above and beyond those requirements, there's, as you said, the should, what should a prosecutor, what yeah. should a prosecutor do? Yeah. It, Illinois is one of those states. And, okay. Um, we've got 20 minutes left. Let's talk a little bit about plea bargaining. So I'm going to start with Professor Joe on this one because I need help. <laughs> because this issue is one that I think all of our students who have applied to prosecutors' offices always get asked. And then they come back and they ask me, what should I have said in that case? And I say, well, now I'm going to say, you should ask Stacy. But the second thing I'm going to say is, what? How would you answer this question when a student <laughs> comes to you and says, God, I just had a state's attorney uh, interview and I got this question? <laughs> I mean, usually the way I would answer for a student is I would say, you know, unfortunately, the rules as they're written right now, they don't provide very clear guidance for what you're required to do. But some of the, the unclear guidance, like how we sort of task a prosecutor with being a minister of justice and having a duty to maintain the integrity of the legal profession would suggest a particular type of response to this, right? And, and um, one, of the, one of my areas of research focuses on what the prosecutor's role should be in helping a public defender manage their caseload, right? Um, because the idea is that, you know, one of our fundamental rules is that one lawyer shouldn't engage in behavior that would make another lawyer violate ethical rules, right? And so by my mind, you know, prosecutors that bring so many cases that the public defender is overwhelmed is, you know, is, is creating a situation where a public defender is violating the duty of competency, the duty of loyalty, the duty of, uh, 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 you know, so many duties because they're overwhelmed with cases. Right, so here you have a situation where you'd be putting another attorney in a position of representing somebody in what we might define as incompetent fashion, right? And so you as a lawyer with your own obligations and sense of integrity and self um, would, shouldn't want to do that, right? And, and hopefully, but I also say that I recognize that your willingness to do that, right? Because every lawyer sort of has three sort of obligations, right? They're, they have a they're an officer of the court, right? So they have duty to the court. They're, um, you know, to the extent that prosecutors have clients, like I think they do, and then public, uh, defense attorneys have clients, they have a duty to their client. Um, but they also have a duty themselves, right? And sometimes what you have for yourself is I need to get paid so I can pay these bills. I need to, you know, do these things. But hopefully within that, your sense of self also includes, you just want to be able to say that you're proud of the work that you've done um, and that you you use this awesome responsibility and all this education you've got to do something good for the world. And so to the extent that whatever decisions you make when you're faced with um, sort of situations like that, with, with this without clear rules, uh, if you can answer it in a way that you'd be proud to, to detail it going forward, I think that's usually gonna be the right move. 
Yeah, but before I turn to our other panels, I should have. I know that these screens are sometimes hard to read. the The case is you've got a case ready to go to trial. You're the prosecutor. Let's say a witness dies, or evidence disappears, or something happens to your case that was unexpected and makes it really, really hard for you to prove the case. Defense counsel doesn't know this yet. Calls you up and says, "I'll plead guilty. My client will plead guilty." For a favorable sentencing recommendation, but they're doing it blind. They don't realize that you either can't prove the case or will have a really hard time proving the case. And the question is, do you let them plead guilty in ignorance? Yeah, I, I remember. I'll just say, and this is kind of embarrassing to admit. When I was first a public defender in New Orleans, my caseload was about 400, 450 at a time, right? And I just remember one time going into court, and you know, my client had wanted to plead. He brought some drugs, and he's like, "I want to plead guilty." Just see what they'll do. And so I went and I said, uh, the, and the the prosecutor had given me the the drug testing, the report, and I was holding it. I was like, my client says he wants to plead guilty. Would he get, did you give him an act of probation? I'd ask for something. And the prosecutor just looked at me and said, uh, look at the report. And I looked at it and it, it was a false, po like it, was, it, was, it wasn't drugs. Like whoever it sold us in was, it was fake drugs, right? Like, uh, so my client hadn't known, I didn't know because this was one of 450 people and my client said, and so I will always be so grateful to that prosecutor for pointing it out. Cause that was me like, scratch that. Like, <laughs> I don't think we're gonna be pleading guilty today. I think the prosecutor said, okay, you plead the attempt. <laughs> yeah, I, now, you know, I just really, and I thought like, that is a great, I mean, that would be the kind of system you wanna be a part of, obviously. You know, I was overwhelmed. I'm sure they were overwhelmed as well, too. But between the two of us, really just him, <laughs> caught that this was not something that the person should be having. Well, but, but, but we might distinguish your case, right, by saying, look, there was no crime. You, you can make an attempt yeah. case, right? But there, there was no crime as compared to I'm calling you. I'm the defense lawyer. I'm calling you up because my guy did do a crime. I'm just trying to get the best result. And so as I sometimes pose it in class, is there anything unfair about the prosecutor letting my guy plead guilty in ignorance of the fact that he couldn't prove it, but he's really guilty? I mean, he is factually guilty, as opposed to your client, who's perhaps just a knucklehead, but not not a drug-buying knucklehead. Yeah, you're right. So, yeah, yeah, a defrauded consumer or whatever the... <laughs> One thing I'd ask, there, there is sort of a catch-all rule that asks, is this conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice, which applies to all lawyers. And so I think to the extent we're talking about some gray areas where we can't point to a rule that would say there is a violation of that rule, is some of this type of behavior, is it conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice where, and if someone is pleading and you know that if you go to trial, perhaps you wouldn't, you couldn't prove your case. Now, if that's the case, you cannot prosecute a case for which you don't have probable cause. So, I mean, if you really think that you cannot obtain a conviction, then I think going forward, and I think BJ would agree, I mean, that that to me is, is rising to the level of conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. Even if I'm the one that called you and said, my guy will plead, just give me a good sentencing recommendation. In other words, you you weren't proceeding with the case. You found out on Tuesday and on Wednesday morning, I called you and said, my guy will plead guilty and allocute. Same thing? Uh, or? Well, you're not going to trial, you mean? Or, or, in other words, you we might distinguish a case where you kept going with the case sort of bluffing me all the way around and finally offered me a sweet deal to get a guilty plea, knowing the full time you couldn't prove your case, as compared to you got the drug report that said, oops. And then at the same time, I call you up and say, my guy will plead guilty. Mm -hmm. are, are you differently situated there as a prosecutor? Or if you're stringing someone along? As compared to stringing someone along, yeah. I sort of see the stringing along. Yeah. You know, if you, if you don't have a case, if you can't prosecute the case, it seems, you know, that there's a right. point at which that you should, you should move forward. If you're running a scam, right, that's one thing. But, but that's not the question that our students get asked at these interviews in the prosecutor's office. So when I used to interview young age, we used to throw ethical problems like this. And um, the rule that I generally apply to the office, and I think it might be a little bit better, one is, Remember I told you about this, you know, someone screwed up and there's a policy. 
if you look at a situation <laughs> like this and there's litigation afterwards that you have to kind of testify and explain exactly what you did and it just gives you that little icky feeling probably that there's going to be a written policy unofficial or not coming out of it if that's the case probably the better thing to do is disclose it the other thing is um, i think in general as prosecutors as administrator of justice I, I used to tell young prosecutors when they come into the office, I said, look, I want you, you also serve not just the victims and the general public, but you also serve the defendant, meaning like you should prosecute a case like you would treat, like, like you would want your family member being prosecuted the way that's happened. Fairness is one important thing. When you apply that test, it's not necessarily an ethics rule, but you'll kind of get away from this gray area of, of in this situation, I think when they call, it's a much closer call. I had a situation where I could prove otherwise, it wasn't a critical witness, but I did have a witness die. And the question was, do I need to disclose that before the plea or after the plea, or do I need to disclose it at all? And I, did, I determined that I didn't need to because I could prove the case without the witness. It would hurt, but I could certainly do it. Yeah. But if they call me, I think it's a much tougher case. Yeah. That, uh, that seems like a good place to uh, to break and see if there are questions uh, for anyone in the room for our distinguished panelists. Um, I'm certainly doing my best to get what I can from them while I've got them here. So, uh, any questions or comments or uh, thoughts that people have on uh, on this? Yeah. Well, it, uh, the, the Andersons are to be thanked uh, a great deal for not only uh, providing the support for the Anderson Center, but, the, uh, but being gracious hosts here. And uh, so I join you. So thank you. Anything else for the good of the order? Yeah. yeah. Right. Make a difference to whom? Make a difference to the prosecutor in this closing because there's all kinds of reasons people plead guilty. Um, I don't know. It, it, somehow it seems okay, but justifiably. Listen, somebody sitting there here and they say you plead guilty, we'll let you out today. They say, you know, instead of going to trial, Time served. Yeah. And that put, yeah. One thing you have to kind of be careful about to your point is as a prosecutor, during a plea colloquy, you actually represent to the court what you intend to prove at trial. And that's part of the factual basis for the acceptance of the plea because the judge has to make a determination there's sufficient evidence that a, a jury or, or trial or fact could find guilty. So if you don't have a main witness and you represent the wrong way, I think that could get in, you could get in some trouble there. But in, in, in general, I think most prosecutors don't want to risk. Uh, I think their desire to win is probably outweighed by kind of doing the right thing because they have other cases as well. The only critical factor is how if in a particular crime when it's a victim who's been, you know, really, really victimized. And that makes it really, really tough. And so I think there's a, there's a, um, a movement right now to kind of um, elevate the role of crime victims in the prosecutorial process which that also requires a very careful balancing from a prosecutor's perspective. But in general, I think prosecutors, I hope your students will follow and say, you know, all things being equal, I'll probably disclose. Good. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Tony, do you want me to turn it back to you to wrap things up or uh, Kimball? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Well, that's a wrap. The sun came up uh, out and uh, we learned a lot today. And thank you to all of our very esteemed uh, panelists. Um, CLE credit is available. And um, although I had nothing to do with it, I highly recommend that you try to pick up on your way out one of the cookies from our um, kitchen. They are excellent. Thank you all for coming. They yeah, they got to sign. You got to sign out on the CLE, but. Uh, Thank you again, everyone.